Prologue Her hand curled around his. Once strong and full of life, the thing that was her husband's hand, now set crooked and withered, a cold, dying thing in her grasp. I can't do it, she said, too exhausted to cry. She wanted to gag at the smell of the place, even though she'd gone to great lengths to mask the throat-drying candy scent of hospital antiseptic. Yes, you can, he said, his voice racked. We've planned everything. She wished he would say more. That he'd go on talking and talking like the old days. The old days. What she wouldn't give to have those back. But he was in pain, and so much of it. She could only imagine what well of strength he tapped into every time he whispered a single word. What if the plans... He cut her off with a wincing shake of his head. My handsome husband, she wanted to say. He had indeed been so handsome, not in the traditional way, but in a way that belonged to her own aesthetics, like it had been ordained in heaven the very day she came into the world. Hers forever, her soul taken. You've got this, just like when we met, he said. When they'd met. If only she could cast them back to that day, that desperate moment in time. Two lost souls unknowingly on course for a new beginning. I love you, she said, wishing there was a better way to tell him what he meant to her. But how do you begrudge a dying man taking a piece of you with him? I love you too, he said. They stared into one another's eyes, two beings interlocked in the love of a millennium. Until the monitors stopped beeping, and his soul left her, alone. Only her, and his mission. Chapter One Jack Moses Another screw slipped from his hand and fell the twelve feet to the sand below. Damn it, he muttered. What the hell was wrong with him today? You need another, Pedro said, six feet away on a ladder just as high. I promise not to ask for another, Jack said, rolling his eyes on apology. One, two, three screws, tossed and caught. Why don't you go home, said Pedro. I can finish. It was a kind gesture, and one Jack would have obliged if he could afford it. The sad fact was that he couldn't. His business, a toddling five years old, couldn't seem to find its sea legs, even though the Emerald Coast was experiencing a vacation rental boom. I don't have anything better to do, Jack said, tightening each of three screws to secure the stubborn gutter that disliked anything more than a ten-mile-per-hour gust of wind. I was going to suggest you go on home. Your envelope's on the kitchen counter. Pedro descended the ladder without a word, smiling and nodding his head as if affirming every step. The man didn't press. He never pressed. And for that, Jack and his wallet were grateful. Pedro was ten times the handyman that Jack would ever be. In his own country, Pedro would be the one giving the orders instead of taking them. But the man was illegal, and that meant minimum wage and whatever else Jack could scrape together for the kind soul. The money he doled out daily either quelled or intensified his own guilt. It all depended on the amount. Jack waved to Pedro as his friend drove away. He was probably heading straight to Walmart to wire half the day's earning to his family back home. Good man, Jack said shifting his old Ford Bronco into drive and taking a left onto 30A. He went the long way tonight, away from Seacrest, through Alice Beach at its sparkling white houses, winding his way past Water Sound, Seagrove, and finally through Seaside. Instead of passing the town by, Jack turned right, dodging high school and college students as they crossed the main drag and went around the Seaside Square. Children were running up and down the amphitheater green in all manner of play. Footballs flew from large, hairy hands into smaller, eager ones. He managed to find a parking spot, even though the place was packed. 
music was pumping out of the Great Southern restaurant, seemingly commensurate with the stinging aroma of smokehouse char. A group of bachelorettes squawked with hands raised toward the clear blue sky. A couple of them turned their heads as Jack walked by. There'd been a time when those girls would have been targets in Jack's adolescent sights. Not tonight. Tonight, he was living in memories. His parents. Happy. Alive. Together. His father, a contractor, had helped build Seaside. His lofty status as foreman had earned him a bit part in The Truman Show, which had been filmed in the small beach town. The locals called him Big Jack. That made Jack Little Jack, the heir apparent. Only, the kingdom had never come. He made his way to the post office, having bypassed Monica Market. The key lime pie would have been the main draw there, but they knew him in town, and tonight he didn't want to be known. His box was packed with the usual stack of junk mail. He flipped through it listlessly, sullenly entertaining the false hope that he might come across something fun for a change. He was about to toss the whole pile when his eyes alighted on one piece that didn't look like a coupon from Target or a much premature offer from AARP. A yellow envelope with his name handprinted on the front. Jack Moses. The return address read, Lone Peak Ranch, Big Sky, Montana. Jack didn't know anyone in Big Sky. He'd only been there once as a kid and barely remembered the place. He had retained a faint image in his head, a living Polaroid of a rocky river, of Big Jack taking a wrong step across and tumbling into the frigid water, surfacing moments later and roaring like a grizzly solely for the benefit of his wife and child. He slipped a dirty fingernail under the lip of the envelope and sloppily tore it open. There was a typed letter inside, short, but what caught his eye was the check. It was made out to his company, and it was for $20,000. As was the case with any moment of unexpected luck, Jack couldn't help but look left and right, thinking for sure he was being punked. He looked at the check again. $20,000. Dear Mr. Moses, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Olivia Northcutt, and I'm in charge of a project in need of your services. Our mutual acquaintance, Mark Worthing, ought to be able to vouch for my sincerity, as he recently completed some work for me on another project. As to your specific services, you come recommended by a different source, one I consider impeccable, and our project cannot get off the ground without your help. Consider the enclosed check a retainer. Unfortunately, due to a professional courtesy, I must keep some daylight between you and this person. I completely understand if you have any hesitation due to this fact and the suddenness of this whole thing. I assure you, it's legitimate. As to said funds, you do not have to accept the job to accept the enclosed check, but we do request that you visit our offices at your earliest convenience. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to call. Sincerely, Olivia Northcutt, Project Manager, Lone Peak Ranch. He dropped the letter to his side and stared at the row of mailboxes before him. He hadn't spoken to Mark Worthing in, what, four years? Mark was a stand-up guy, and that was all well and good, but why the hell would anyone recommend his meddling construction skills to an organization he'd never heard of in Montana? The whole thing was more than a little bizarre. But $20,000 was $20,000. He turned to the check over in his hands a couple of times. The bank was two doors down. He could have it authenticated, but it looked real enough for him. His heart began to rev with excitement. If all this was indeed legit, and that damn check cleared, holy crap, $20,000. He decided he would make the quick trip across the country, turn down this Olivia Northcutt, and keep the cash. There were too many problems in Jack Moses' life to spend more than a couple of days away from the Florida panhandle. 20000 would take care of some of the more needling ones. Now, to tell Pedro that he'd be gone for a day, two max, and that Christmas had come early. Chapter 2 
Sadie Crawford. Fresh air, and so much of it. She sucked it in carefully, one lungful at a time, as if it were a life elixir. This is it, she said to the peaks lining the horizon. I found heaven. Miss, where do you want the orange couch? Sadie swept her gaze back to the mover. He was dollying the ugly thing, Thanksgiving orange, but perfect for taking naps, and readying his chin to point it in whichever direction she gave. In the living room would be great, she said. The parade of sweaty college boys with boxes and dollies of boxes only served as a reminder that it cost her an arm and a leg to move from California to Montana. At least she had given most of her things away, realizing, as her therapist had recommended, that a fresh start was exactly what she needed. Though Sadie wondered if the learned woman had indeed meant the advice to be taken literally. If so, how would she feel about Sadie staging the event in Big Sky of all places? For the rest of the day, while the two movers unloaded all her earthly belongings into her modest little one-bedroom cabin, Sadie sifted through boxes, too pulled by the outdoors to do much of anything constructive. With the final box unloaded, and the movers tipped and on their way, Sadie sat on the front step and took in the green-dotted lowlands leading up to their snow-capped peaks. She marveled at this lark of epic calculation, for she had never been much of a risk-taker, unless she was in the ring. Then she rode like she'd been born to charge into battle. A sparrow perched itself on the wood railing, looking down at Sadie with inquisitive twitches. I know. What the hell was I thinking, right? The bird shuffled from foot to foot. You're not the only one. My family thinks I'm crazy. She laughed. And look at me now, talking to a bird. She'd gotten used to the accusation. Crazy, for Sadie Crawford's family, merely meant behavior that wasn't in perfect lockstep with one's surroundings. With such a low bar for crazy, Sadie had spent her formative years as loopy as a bulldog chewing a wasp. But now her surroundings were beautiful and serene, and she had no choice but to act beautiful and serene. It was a perfect match, ergo no crazy here. For the first time in years, she felt like she belonged. All this despite having sunk every penny she had, including the little inheritance her grandmother had left, into buying this 25-acre ranch, barely a postage stamp compared to the expanse of land that surrounded her. However, in time, she figured she might put a deposit down with a local horse broker. But that would have to wait. Moss was slowly taking over one side of the cabin, and the fences were rotted, and the path that led down to the gurgling creek was overgrown and tangled. Sadie hopped to her feet, spooking the bird on its way. Have a wonderful day, Sadie called out to the bird. I know I will. And she did, relishing every morsel of the wonderful freedom that was now her life. Psst! If you're enjoying this book and want more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 3 Jack. He was the first one off the plane. Stepping out ahead of the throng was sweet enough, but seeing a guy holding a piece of paper with his name on it made him feel like some sort of dignitary. That is, if it weren't for the fact that his chauffeur was wearing a cowboy hat and looked like he'd just come off ranch hand duty. I'm Jack Moses. The man tipped his hat. Right this way, Mr. Moses. Mr. Moses is fine and dandy, but I'm used to going by Jack. The cowboy didn't reply. He was all trail dust and swagger. And given his rugged attire, Jack expected a matching pickup truck with long horns on the grill and a rusted license plate on back. Wrong on all counts. It was a black-on-black -black Cadillac Escalade that was as smooth as onyx. I'll take your bag, Mr. Moses, the cowboy said pulling the carry-on from Jack's hands. Thanks, Jack murmured, opening the door to a plush leather interior that smelled like a new belt. There was even a bar on the far side, adorned with what Jack assumed was the expensive stuff. Better lay off the sauce, he told himself. 
No sense being ripped when he said no to this Olivia Northcutt. And no sense being ripped with 20000 in his pocket. His cowboy escort slid into the front seat and looked to the back. Comfortable, sir? Yes, very. Thank you. It'll be about 45 minutes to Big Sky. I can stop and grab you some lunch if you'd like. No, thanks. Hey, you didn't tell me your name. Call me Buster. Nice to meet you, Buster. He would have started in on the man's history, where the cowboy was from, if he was married, the usual. But something about how the man's mouth twitched when he offered something as personal as his name gave Jack an inkling that Buster wasn't much for any kind of talk, small or large. They weaved their way out of the languid airport traffic. That was when Jack caught his first glance of elevation. Hills loomed ahead, hazy and purple against an open sky. As they drove along, Buster sang nothing, the soft melodies of country's finest crooning from the radio. Jack's mind ricocheted off the events of the past few hours. First, there'd been a ticket waiting for him at the Panama City Beach Airport. Not only that, but he was the first one to board. It had all been prearranged. He felt like a celebrity, unsure for a moment if it was his suddenly inflated ego or whether they were treating him like royalty. And there was something about this deluxe treatment that made him keen to throw off all concern about where he was going and why he was going there. If he was going to get the royal treatment and get $20,000 out of it, he might as well sit back and love it up. Then came the notion that this was all too easy. Easy was never in the cards for Jack Moses. That plain fact lay beneath everything, giving off noxious hints of its presence like a subterranean swamp. He emerged from his thoughts and realized they'd hit the foothills and were beginning their ascent through the mountain pass. A river came into view, winding and tumbling and dotted with white rocks, cutting its way through vibrant trees. It looked like the label on a bottle of spring water. What's that river there? It's the Gallatin. Good fishing? Depends. On what? Whether or not you know what you're doing. You do much? Buster took a deep breath and nodded his answer. With Buster as a complete and utter lost cause for meaningful conversation, Jack turned his attention back to the water. He saw a fly fisherman, then a couple of more, then one at every turnoff. He himself was a bass guy and had never picked up a fly rod in his life, but he certainly understood the peace of the lone fisherman's toil. It called to him. Maybe he'd stay one night, splurge on a guide, and do it right. That way he wouldn't have to buy the gear and he'd have a story to tell Pedro when he got home. Maybe he'd even catch something. Something about this place was causing him to consider the future with an unexpected simplicity. Buster piloted their large vehicle with extreme expertise, never once flinching as long-bed semis and dump trucks rumbled their way past, ostensibly heading back toward Bozeman for more supplies. An endless line of trucks, Big Sky might harbor possibility after all. Commerce meant growth, and growth meant opportunity. They made a ride off U.S. Highway 191 and onto Lone Mountain Trail. Welcome to Big Sky, the cowboy said. They passed a golf course where most of the patrons seemed to be lugging or pushing their bags instead of taking a golf cart. They hit another pocket of civilization, a couple of shopping centers, a large grocery, the wood architecture was right up Jack's alley. The mountain look. Clean. Serviceable build. He bet those buildings could withstand a glacial winter. They left the main drag, passed a pizza place, a sushi restaurant, and gaggled of spruced-up ladies walking down Main Street. Money, Jack thought. The place stank of it. Buster pulled the Cadillac onto a dirt road, through an old fence that was in dire need of mending, and down into some pine trails. The place had a strange effect on Jack's whole being. He felt as a man in a trance, lulled by the scent of pine, the breath of trees, and a hint of something like salt wafting down onto them. 
Buster paused their travels to let a family of six elk cross the road. The animals were massive, more prehistoric than the deer Jack was used to seeing. You get a lot of those around here? Elk, sure. Bear, deer, you name it, we've got it. It was pride in Buster's voice now. Then, as if the place couldn't get more picturesque, a pair of bald eagles swooped in from overhead, casting through the gap in the trees. Here we are, Buster said. And that's when Jack saw the building. Wood beams at all the right angles, colors to match the surrounding terrain and all its beauty. Two stories of massive welcome. They pulled right up to the front of the place. Then Buster turned to Jack and with a glint of something otherworldly in his eyes said, I figured I should be the first to tell you. This place is made of magic. Chapter 4 Jack Jack searched Buster's face for a smirk, a wink, anything indicating that he was joking. Denying him any such confirmation, Buster leapt out the door, and by the time Jack caught him to grab his bag, a woman had walked around to the front of the place and onto the porch. Raven black hair, straight and over one shoulder, a tire matching her surroundings. Every square inch of clothing cut to perfection to fit her body. She was dressed as if for a twenty-mile hike through the woods. Jack surmised she could probably accomplish it with no trouble at all. She had the figure for it. Mr. Moses, she said. She had the type of voice that could cut through a room of a thousand. Something about her made him nervous. Women had always made Jack Moses nervous. He loved them, but he didn't get them. His track record was pure evidence of that. Please, it's Jack, he said, noting that a trickle ran down his spine and that his palms suddenly were wet. He stumbled for words. Let me grab my bag and I'll join you. Buster will take care of your bag. Come on, I've got lunch ready. Lunch sounded good, and to see the inside of this magnificent building would be even better. Fifteen perfectly laid stone steps led up to where this beautiful woman stood. She stuck out her hand. Welcome to Big Sky, Montana, Jack. My name is Olivia Northcutt. Her grip was tight. There was fire in this woman. Jack once again stumbled for words. Uh, can I call you Miss Northcutt, Mrs. Northcutt, Professor? She smiled luckily, deviating him from any further awkwardness. Call me Olivia. She led him into the building, which Jack now realized was more of an oversized lodge than a home. Huge photographs covered every wall, a grizzly catching a fish in its mouth, elk braying to the sky, a bald eagle with a snake in its talons. Beautiful, he said, gaping at them. Thank you, Olivia replied. And in that thank you, Jack realized that she was the photographer. She led him through the huge foyer, past an enormous sitting room that drew the eye toward a fireplace with a stubby spitting fire. Nothing about the place felt stuffy or old, even though by its strong and rustic look it appeared to have stood for centuries. Jack wanted to know who built it, how long it had taken, how many man-hours, how much money they had poured into the place. It looked bedrock solid. Down a long hallway, more pictures adorned the walls. Ivory wildflowers against brown grass, a raging stream with edges tinged in white snow. A strange feeling of self-consciousness brought on by his own admitted ignorance of art suddenly seized him in her presence. Along the hallway, they passed room after room. Bedrooms. The place was set up like an inn. Olivia walked through the door at the very end of the hall. Inside were more pictures of what looked like the same place, with high mountain peaks taken from different angles, different seasons. There was a desk on one end of the room, but Olivia ignored it and took a seat in one of the leather chairs. She motioned to the leather seat across from her. Between them was a table covered in cuts of meat, cheese, and bread. 
I took the liberty of picking up a few things. I hope you don't mind, she said with a wink to her voice. Jack took a seat and inhaled, sucking in the aroma of the fresh-baked bread. He was ravenous. Maybe it was the fresh air, or the excitement of this beautiful structure, which now felt like a mountain church. For here was an interesting parody of the Holy Communion before him. But he couldn't help reaching for the sumptuous fare before the words, I don't mind at all, left his mouth. The sourdough bread he selected was perfect just enough tang. He topped it with some manchego cheese and a couple of slices of what looked like prosciutto. He took a bite and corrected himself. No, Montana's version of country ham. Wonderful, perfectly salty. He grabbed the bottle of water by the small plate and cracked it open. I can have someone bring you a bottle of beer if you'd like. Water is fine, thanks. Jack pointed to the photos all around the room. The mountain in all these photos. It's the same one, right? Olivia nodded. You have a good eye. Most people think it's a collection of pretty peaks, but you're right, it's just one. This is... She paused. Well, this is my peak. Lone peak, to be precise. It's not far away. You probably saw it on the drive-in. Lone peak like the name of this place, Lone Peak Ranch. He hadn't heard of it. He turned back to the platter and noticed that Olivia hadn't eaten any of the food. Look at me playing the pig, he said. You better join me before I start to feel like I'm wearing out my welcome. She smiled, picked up a piece of cheese, and took a small nibble from the corner. He could see she wasn't into it. She was being polite. He was about to say that he didn't really care about manners, and that a pretty girl like her didn't have to care about them either, but she put the cheese down on a napkin and spoke before he had the chance. You've probably got a thousand questions. I can promise you that at some point you'll have them all answered. But how about I start with the basics? Jack nodded, grabbing the other piece of bread and making a little sandwich. He was never one to press, and he had time. Soon enough, they'd get to the money talk. This land, she said, the very place where we sit, has a deep history. During World War II, the National Park Service opened its gates to returning veterans so they could enjoy R&R and even medical rehabilitation. I didn't know that, Jack said. Most people don't, Olivia said. That little detail of history has been lost to time. But soldiers did come here. They needed a place where they could reacquaint themselves with the country that had sent them off to war. And you want to revive that mission? Our benefactor envisioned this place to be a haven. Have you ever read the book Tribe by Sebastian Younger, Jack? I haven't, though I've read some of Younger's other work. Pretty sharp guy. Olivia smiled. Sharp guy indeed. In this book, he talks about why there seems to be a higher incidence of PTSD, depression, and suicide today than in other conflicts. Jack's stomach turned. This was hitting close to home. He tried not to fidget in his seat. We want you to help us build it again. With your experience and your history, our benefactor thought you would be a perfect fit. He held another slice of bread in his hand for a moment, turned it around, then placed it on his plate, having lost his appetite. Can I ask who this mysterious benefactor might be? He wishes to remain anonymous, Olivia said, rising from her chair. She made her way over to the desk and returned with a piece of paper and a pen. This is a non-disclosure agreement, pretty standard. Read it if you'd like. It says that you can't tell anyone what you're doing here. Nothing we discuss... None of the work that you do can be released to the public until you are given notice. He didn't like the sound of this one bit, but there was money burning a hole in his pocket, and he needed more. Rather than run from the place, he gritted his teeth. Can I have the night to think about it? Of course, she said, then cocked her head. But I'm curious about something. We thought this would have been right up your alley, Jack. Why the hesitation? He wasn't about to tell her the truth. He didn't know this woman. 
I've got a lot of work back down in Florida. My assistant, he's handling things for now, but I can't be gone for long. I'm sure Pedro will be fine, she said. As if reading his bewildered expression, her thin smile cut off his next question. We know a lot about you, Jack Moses. Trust me when I say we've done our homework. None of our investigations into your past will be used with malicious intent. Shivers ran up his back. You looked into my past? Olivia shrugged. When you're about to give a stranger as much money as we're willing to give you, you have to do your homework. The money usurped all the other thoughts in his head. How much are we talking about? He was merely asking out of curiosity, for he was ready right then and there to blow her off and head back to the airport. Then Olivia told him how much money. Then he gulped once and said, I need the night to think about it. Chapter 5 Ricky Lovejoy, 1943 The bus came to a chugging halt. Half of its occupants were fishing out packets of cigarettes. The doors opened, and a swarthy Navy chief stepped on board. Lovejoy, Richard L., he said, reading off a clipboard. Everyone looked around. A little bit louder now. Sergeant Lovejoy, Richard L., Six rows back, an army private nudged the man next to him. Ain't that you? Ricky Lovejoy's eyes peeled open. I'm Sergeant Lovejoy, the Marine said, raising a hand. Follow me, the chief said, waddling off the bus. The private got up from his seat and wished the Marine farewell. They'd gotten to know very little of one another on the bumpy four-hour drive. Between bouts of nausea, the occasional pit stops, and the Marines' own need for privacy. Sergeant Ricky Lovejoy had kept his eyes closed for most of the journey. The chief was waiting next to a jeep. The damn thing looked brand new. Could he use that on the canal? He whisked the thought away. Better to forget, he told himself. Hop in the back, the chief said, without further explanation. By now... Three years into his enlistment, Lovejoy knew better than to ask. And no sooner had he taken his new seat than the chief took his own on the passenger side, grunting something to the pockmarked seaman driving the smaller transport. Lovejoy took a quick look around, out of habit. Mountain peaks in every direction. The old Lovejoy would have asked the chief where they were going, why he wasn't still on the bus with the others. He hadn't wanted to come to this place anyway. A month's recuperation in San Diego had been hard enough on him. It didn't matter how many pretty nurses they paraded down the hall with their sweet smiles and sweeter perfumes. Lovejoy wanted back with his unit. They were his men, his marines, his family. But he'd been picked off some random list by some random bureaucrat, probably of the Pentagon. Lovejoy didn't know how such things worked. He was just a sergeant in the Marine Corps who was happy to have bullets, band-aids, and beans. But now, as the jeep chugged along another long dirt trail, the jostling put him to sleep, which was exactly what he needed. Blissful sleep. Lovejoy! The Marine snapped awake. We're here. The first thing he noticed were the trees all around them. Aspens, he thought. A fairy tale land. He half expected to see elves hopping from tree to tree. This is your stop, the chief said, then pointed up ahead. Check in is right there. They'll give you all the gear you need. Lovejoy wasn't sure, but he thought he detected a measure of compassion in the chief's voice. Confirmed when the chief reached into the back and patted Lovejoy on the shoulder. I want to thank you for what you boys did on Guadalcanal. Had a brother on the USS Arizona, and, well, I wanted to say thank you. Lovejoy nodded and muttered, Sure, Chief. Unsure of the proper response to give the man. He jumped out of the Jeep before there could be further discussion, and he was pretty sure the hell was going to freeze over when that Chief turned to him and offered him a salute. Lovejoy was no officer, but the motion had been ingrained in him since boot camp. 
He saluted back smartly, and then the jeep was gone. All he had was the khaki uniform on his body, fresh out of storage when it had been given to him in San Diego, and a small overnight duffel that carried an extra uniform and some toiletries. He had had less on the canal. As the jeep receded into the distance, Lovejoy noticed the absolute quiet all around him, closing in. The pain in his side flared. Two holes where the surgeon had said he'd been one lucky son of a bitch. He winced through it and proceeded down the dirt road, a pair of twin cabins up ahead coming into view. Both had neat tin roofs that still gleamed with factory freshness. No one was waiting when he got to the cabins, although military precision was immediately apparent. One sign on the left said barracks. The one on the right said office. Lovejoy slipped the orders from his pocket and unfolded them as best he could. But the office cabin was empty. A main room with two neat rows of desks, only one of which had anything on it, and then two bunk rooms in the back, both labeled ladies only. He repocketed his orders and walked across to the barracks. It was set up pretty much like any barracks Lovejoy had been in, from Paris Island to San Diego. Rows of bunk beds on either side, and the head at the very end of the building. He chose a bunk halfway down on the left. Every bed was made, though the blankets weren't the olive drab wool he was used to seeing. They looked like handmade quilts. The door behind him banged open, and he swung around faster than he intended. A woman marched in wearing what looked like ranger gear, all tan with a cap perched on dark curly hair that cascaded down to her shoulders. Sergeant Lovejoy, she asked. She looked giddy, like she was trying to suppress a smile. I'm Lovejoy, the Marine said. He once again took his orders from his pocket and handed them to her. He was surprised when he didn't smell perfume drifting over from her, just good clean soap. For some reason, that made him smile. I'm sorry I missed you. I was with the horses when you came by the office, the woman said. In another life, Ricky Lovejoy would have asked this girl out, maybe taken her to the movies, bought popcorn, sipped on the same bottle of Coca-Cola. But that was before. He replaced his smile with Marine Grimm. Is this bunk okay? he said. I didn't want to take one that was reserved. The woman shook her head. Her momentary surprise revealed that she was younger than she looked, younger than her uniform was trying to make her. You can choose any bunk you like. When are the others getting here? he asked. He figured if they had hot water in this place, he'd better get it before the rest of the pathetic invalids arrived. You're the only one, at least for now. They didn't tell you? Miss, all I knew was we were headed to Yellowstone Park. The bus stopped somewhere. A Navy chief got on board, called me off, and drove me here. She shook her head. Well, sorry about that. I guess they're still figuring it out. Government programs and all that. Lovejoy thought that there was probably never going to be a time that the government would figure it out. They were always flying by the seat of their pants and trying to put band-aids on their gaping bullet holes. They stood there for a few moments and Sergeant Lovejoy could see she was trying to figure out the official spiel to give him, something to make him feel at home. Little did she know that he would never feel at home. Not here. There was only one place that he would ever feel at home again, and that place was long gone. He'd never see it again. What do I call you, miss? Well, for starters, don't call me miss. I'm Betsy. And do you work for Yellowstone Park? Not really. I guess you could say it's one of those government programs they're still trying to figure out. She smiled. They're still trying to figure me out. He found her amusing and heard the strange sound of his own laughter. His first laugh in... How long had it been? Do you like steak? She blurted. He was obviously making her uncomfortable. Sure. Steak, eggs, bacon, whatever you got. I'm not very picky. He was trying to put her at ease. The girl was only doing her job. He had nothing against her. Oh, great. They just brought in a whole lot of food. 
I don't know who they think is going to eat it, but when the government gives you something, you hold on to it with both hands, am I right? You sound like my... Well, you sound like a Marine. Something passed between them now. Something like a shared memory, or shared pain. Ricky Lovejoy sensed that she understood him, but that was impossible. Only other Marines that had been in his position would understand him. He was damn sure of that. What time is dinner? he asked. Eighteen hundred, unless you'd like to eat sooner or later. Eighteen hundred is fine, he said. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to get cleaned up, maybe take a nap. Oh, sure. I'll be in the office or in the back with the horses if you need anything. He went to the far end of the building, and she back the other way. He didn't look back, for sadness in her eyes might have crushed him a bit, so it was a good thing that she went on her way. More sadness was not what Ricky Lovejoy needed. Psst! If you want more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 6 Betsy Karamati, 1943 she closed the door behind her and leaned back against it, heart thudding. Her first charge was here, a year of work, a year of toil. She came from a large family, Italian and thick as thieves. Her six brothers had all gone off to war, five of them in the army and one in the navy. They were doing their duty all over the world. And that left Betsy, the youngest of the brood, the twinkle in her father's eye, the sweet girl her mother always wanted. But Betsy always wanted to be like her brothers. She tagged along when they went to play stickball out on Long Island, hopping onto the train heading out to the east end of Queens. She tagged along when they snuck into movie theaters. She'd even had her first puff of a cigarette at the age of six, all to be like her older brothers. And they never treated her any differently. Sure, she had to wear girly clothes but she got them dirty, and her mother was quick to clean them, after a good scolding, of course. The Karamati family was solidly lower middle class, but they always had food on the table and plenty of friends, and they were happy. Her father hung an American flag in every room that his wife would let him. The old man preached from the first day that Betsy could remember that being an American was important, that yes, they were Italian, but that was merely where their family had originated, where they lived, where they laughed, loved, and died, was in America. They would work hard, become something. And so they all had. Her father opened a produce store which blossomed into a small chain. There were good years and lean years. The entire family chipped in. Little Betsy was four years old when she first swept the grocery store floor, mimicking her oldest brother Joseph's long strides and the big band numbers he whistled while he did it. He was her favorite, mostly because he never picked on her and protected her against the others sometimes. So naturally, it had been Joseph who enlisted first, leading the way, taking the Karamati name into the American Armed Forces. Their father had been so proud. The others followed, and Betsy had assumed that she would have been allowed to go, too. She had been twenty at the time, plenty old enough to go, but her parents wanted her to finish college. Betsy had other plans, so she went to every recruiter, Navy, Army, even the Marine Corps. They took her application, took her measurements, and even got her checked out by the medical board. But in the end, they all said no. Betsy found out through a family friend that it had been her father who'd stepped in. She was plenty smart and could have easily been a nurse or maybe even gone into some form of intelligence. She had heard that there were women code breakers. That sounded fascinating to her. She knew mathematics up and down and all around, and she'd been doing puzzles for what seemed like her entire life. She confronted her father. At first, he hadn't admitted to the truth, but then he confirmed that he'd gone to every councilman he knew. The Karamati name was beginning to mean something. They'd managed to block Betsy from enlisting. But what her parents had not planned for was the tenacity of their youngest child. Betsy took her father's answers, 
didn't sass back like some other twenty-year-olds might do. No, she went quiet. For a week, then two, still completing her schoolwork, still chipping in at the grocery store. But all the while, she did her digging. She drove to Washington, D.C., and found an out-of-state congressman, one sympathetic to the plight of women who wanted to serve. He told her about a new program, a partnership between the War Department and the National Park Service. It will revolutionize the way we take care of our veterans, and you would be perfect for it. The paperwork was submitted and processed in record time, all thanks to the congressman. He believed in the mission of these rehabilitation programs, that empathy was the subtle force that would bring wounded warriors home. Betsy had gone home to see her parents, the contracts signed in one hand and the picture with the congressman in the other. Her mother left the house. Her father had not been pleased, but the old man was at least wise enough to know that this was not the worst thing that could happen. Betsy laid it out calmly, told him about the important mission to take care of heroes coming home, proud Americans who'd done their duty. She pressed every button she knew her father had, and she was happy to see that after her little dissertation, her father's chest puffed with pride. She was sure there was something about making a better America in that pride. But mostly, Betsy figured that he was proud of his daughter, that she was doing the right thing and with his blessing and a warning from her mother that she'd better not get married without their consent, she had made the trek to Montana. Yellowstone was her first stop, and by her orders, she figured she'd stay there maybe for the duration of the war. And though she'd never been to the wilderness, she completely fell in love with it. The open air, the clear sky, not a soul for miles and miles. For two months, they'd trained her on how to deal with the soldiers, sailors, and marines who would be coming. They taught her all about rank structure, and they brought in old-timers who had spent miserable years on the front lines during World War I. They told the young students all about the horrors of war and how these young people should be welcomed home with open arms. There had also been the outdoor training, a lot of hiking, learning to ride horses, even some shooting. Of the ten men and women in her class, she had graduated at the top on every count. Then the fateful day had come when the man in charge of the operation, a Mr. Miles, who had lost his left leg in the first war, called her into his office. How do you like Yellowstone, Ms. Karamati? I like it very much, thank you, Mr. Miles. I'm honored to have the opportunity to serve. He nodded and tapped down the tobacco in his pipe. You're leaving tomorrow. Where am I going? Betsy asked for a moment, her heart beginning to race with anxiety. They couldn't be sending her home. She was one of the best they had. Were they defunding the program? What would her parents say? There's a small place a couple hours' drive from here. It won't be comfortable, but you'll have all the resources you need. Betsy shook her head. I don't understand. Mr. Miles looked at her then with the same compassion she'd seen him use with wounded soldiers. I've been watching you, Betsy, and I wouldn't trust this with anyone else. It's a special case. It won't be easy, but then again, I think you can handle it. Yes, sir, she said, feeling her anxiety replaced by calm fortitude. I can do anything that you need for the men. Good. He handed her a set of orders and that was that. The next day she had hitched a ride in a pickup truck to a place called Big Sky, Montana. There were buildings scattered here and there, but for the most part it looked like the mountain version of the Wild West. But when they had finally driven down what she now thought of as the Aspen Drive, and she had seen the two new buildings, it felt like coming home. Now, standing outside the barracks, the responsibility felt very real. Sergeant Richard Lovejoy, welcome home, she thought. She nearly skipped off the front porch, but thought better of it. You're 21 now, Betsy, and you're in charge of helping this Marine. She didn't care if there was to be one or fifty. She wouldn't sleep until each one of them would be heard, helped, and administered her own special brand of healing. She felt it the first time she'd set foot in this place. 
She felt it all day, every day, during the two weeks she had been here. It was in the way the breeze blew and the birds sang. There was magic in this place. And Betsy Karamati intended to use it, and use it well. Chapter 7 Sadie, Present Day It had been a long day of packing and unpacking, moving and hauling, and supervising the movers and telling them where to put each piece. And before that, she'd gotten up before the sun to scrub the place from top to bottom. And now, with her work complete and only a couple of boxes left to be opened, Sadie wanted to celebrate. If there was beer in the fridge, she would have cracked open a cold one before turning in for the night. But shopping for groceries hadn't made it onto her task list. She drove the short way into town and managed to find a small local joint that looked like it might have some cheap beer and even cheaper food. She was on a budget, after all. She found a perfect table in the corner all to herself, settled in, and was soon greeted by the owner, who, it turned out, was also playing server, bartender, and busboy. I'll take a beer and a burger with fries, Sadie said, handing the menu back to the man. It's happy hour, he said. Two for one beers if you'd like. Sadie thought about it and said, Sure, why not? What few patrons there were in the place seemed to be keeping to themselves. A couple of gentlemen at the bar, a couple at a table across the room, and a few scattered loners who were either checking out their phones or meditating over solitary drinks. The first beer appeared not long after, followed five minutes later by the burger and fries. She tore into the food like some starving beast. She polished off the burger and sucked down the beer. Another cold one appeared right on cue, and she went on to demolishing what was left of the fries. She was perfectly content sitting by herself, mulling over her next day. Tomorrow, she'd unload those last two boxes and go check out her horses. She had an order in for three with an option to buy two more. Buying five horses total would come close to going over budget. But if her research proved to be right, and if word of mouth spread quickly, she knew she could rely on the couple of tricks she had stashed up her sleeve. She realized she ought to be able to keep the horses on a steady rotation. Trail rides with tourists, mainly from New York and California, but mainly from all over the rest of the states, and probably overseas as well. She couldn't wait to get her hands on horses again. It had been way too long. In fact, probably the longest she had ever been without a horse since the age of ten. She always thought back to that first day, that first introduction, when she had fallen in love with a horse named Sweet Pea. Sweet Pea hadn't been the prettiest of animals. In fact, her father had told her to buy the black one, a sleek monstrosity that looked like he could clobber poor ten-year-old Sadie with one hoof. But she had stood resolute, one of the few times in her life that she had with the old man. They bought Sweet Pea and boarded her for the next ten years. And in that time, Sadie had become quite the accomplished rider. When she wasn't going to school, she was riding. When she wasn't doing homework, she was riding. That had been her life for ten years. And then, at the age of twenty, right after she won the biggest prize of her life, her mother and father set her down in the living room and told her they were getting a divorce. Sadie had known that her parents didn't get along, that they were no longer in love, if they ever had been. All through high school, her mother had spent less and less time at home. Although she used that time wisely, building up an impressive clientele in Southern California real estate, she'd been away from home so frequently that her heart eventually forgot the way back. And with the divorce came big change. Sadie's mother announced that she was moving to Hawaii and wanted to take Sadie with her. Sadie decided to stay in Los Angeles because of the horses and the few friends that she had, but mostly because she wanted to stay with her father. He was a top defense attorney making millions over millions. They lived well, and she'd grown into a great writer under his roof. As a twenty-year-old would-be adult, able to sort the different grades of value to be found in life, she thought that was the right decision. 
There were a handful of visits when they frolicked in Pacific waters, shared stories over Hawaiian cocktails, and got to know each other. And Sadie had seen the real person her mother had once been, so free, so alive. It was then that she realized she and her mother were strangers only because of physical distance. And then, the accident. Sadie took a sip of her beer and tried to shake away the thoughts. She loved her mother more than anything. Her death had only increased the animosity between Sadie and her father. He wanted her to go back to law school to take over when he retired. But in Sadie's opinion, he would never retire. He loved the power too much. He wielded it like Excalibur. Here's to life choices, she murmured, taking another sip of beer. Two would be her limit. She was already feeling the buzz. Can I have this dance? She heard a voice say, and looked up to find a hulking man with cut-off sleeves looking down at her. I don't hear any music. She had been taken by surprise, or else she'd have something smarter to say back. She was used to getting hit on, and there was usually a handy phrase whipped from a holster she could deploy to brush someone off. How about I sing something for you then, the man said. Then he started humming an unintelligible song. Sadie looked around for the owner. The man was busy behind the bar. Her collar shifted so that she was now out of the owner's direct line of sight. I can tell you're new, he said. How about I show you around? I'll even buy your dinner. I'm good, thanks, she said, pulling a twenty out of her pocket. She thought about her budget. Fifteen dollars was really the most she ought to be spending. She laid the twenty on the table instead, needing to get out of the place as quickly as she could. I said I'll buy your dinner, the man announced. Sadie didn't like the way his voice had turned, just cold enough for her to see how serious he was. I have to go. I've got an early morning. Thanks for the offer, though, really. Maybe next time. She got up from the table and made a quick beeline toward the door when he stepped in front of her. She screeched to a stop. Where's the fire, little darling? He said, smiling, as if the smile would ease the tension that was now taking over every centimeter of her body. Her mind went through a million excuses. Tell him you've been working all day. Tell him you're engaged or married or gay, anything. The words wouldn't come. Her father would be so disappointed. That's when the goon grabbed her at the shoulder, jamming his thumb into the socket. One dance, he said. This time, her knee did the talking, angled in just the right way that her defense instructor had shown her so many times. While he was on the way to falling to one knee, the grip on her shoulder released. The man spun around. Leave the lady alone, another voice said. Sadie couldn't see who was talking, shielded as she was by the dance king. Why don't you mind your own? Sadie heard a solid sound like pounding meat. The dance king's head snapped right, and the rest of him fell like cordwood to the ground. Sadie looked up, thinking that the owner of the restaurant had come to her rescue. But it wasn't the owner. She realized the Lone Ranger here was one of the guys that had been sitting at the bar. Besting her by about a foot, lanky, and with a week's worth of stubble on his face, he looked like a drip-dried truck driver. He looked at her with dark, focused eyes. Are you okay? I think maybe you should go, she said, pointing at the man on the ground. Right, said her rescuer, letting go of her hand. He fished a twenty from his pocket and laid it on her table. Before she could tell him that she had already paid, he left. Leaving her own twenty on the table, Sadie was not far behind. Psst! Give this author some love by clicking subscribe. Chapter 8 Jack Someone must have been a whiz with the cops on speed dial for Jack hadn't made it halfway to the truck he'd borrowed from Buster when they appeared. Great. The last thing he needed was to be arrested for punching out some moron who'd been hitting on a girl. How did he always find himself in these situations? Try to do the right thing, 
and you get wrangled in, or worse, handcuffed. He raised an arm and waved to the cops, who took their time parking when the owner of the restaurant came out. He's inside, boys, he said to the cops, jerking a thumb toward the door. The police officer nudged his chin toward Jack. What about this guy? He was defending the young lady. That young lady was standing behind the owner, looking more than a little embarrassed. I'm happy to go down to the station with you, if that would help. You had anything to drink? The cop asked. A couple, Jack said. No point in lying to the police. Good thing he was only two beers in. Nah, it's okay, the cop said. We've dealt with this guy three times this month alone. Comes in, gets hammered, hits on women. Real slick ladies, man. With that, the cops went inside. They came back a minute later, dragging the confused drunkard. Once he was stashed in the back of the police car, and they were driving away, Jack breathed a sigh of relief. How about another beer, the owner said. It's on me. No thanks. I should probably get going. You new here? Just passing through. The owner nodded, wiped his hand on his pants, then offered it to Jack. Well, friend, it was a pleasure seeing that guy get dropped. Finally. Jack shook the man's hand, who then sauntered back into the bar. He turned to the woman. I'm sorry if that, you know, scared you. She was walking toward him now, her ponytail tucked beneath her cowboy hat. She was pretty all right, and pretty was the last thing that Jack needed. You're apologizing for scaring me? I, uh, she laughed. Well, thank you for, um, saving me? She laughed again at the awkwardness of the phrase. How's your hand? Jack raised it and moved it left and right. I may never play the violin again, but I'll survive. He smiled and let the silence linger for a moment, and then said, I really should be going. You said you were passing through, she said. Passing through to where? Come on, lady, I don't need the third degree right now. He turned his gaze toward the highway. I'm doing some work up the road and stopped in for a beer or two. What about you? He kicked himself for his stupid habit of prolonging conversation out of politeness. I just moved here from California and didn't have any food or beer at home, so she motioned to the little dive restaurant. Better than saltines and tap water. She looked at him like he was some sort of curiosity, a statue in an old creaky museum that she was half expecting to jump to life. Well, he said, Good luck with your life here. I'll... You sure I can't buy you a beer? He smiled. I'm sure. She held up a hand. Bye, then. She gave him one more look and then turned on her heel and headed to her car. Nothing wrong with her from this angle, either. But what Jack needed to figure out was not who this girl was, who any girl was. What he needed to figure out was how to get out of Montana with even a slice of the money that Olivia Northcutt had promised. Because the last thing he wanted to be part of was a veteran's cause. He had had enough pity for one lifetime, maybe two, and he didn't want to be party to any of it again. He got in the truck to head to another bar. Maybe he'd find his answers at the bottom of a bottle. Chapter 9 Betsy, 1943. It had been a week since the arrival of her first and only charge, and Betsy was getting more than a little impatient. She'd come here to help, damn it! And how could you help when the man you wanted to help wouldn't accept it? Betsy tried everything they taught her. Good food, recommending a long hike, show him how to ride a horse, or simply sit outside and do nothing. But the only time Sergeant Lovejoy left his barracks was when it was time to eat. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, he was always waiting, though by the little amount that he ate, Betsy wondered why he even made the short walk. She tried talking with him, taking the risk that she might appear as some sort of chatterbox. She had even gone so far one night as to flirt with him. He'd been completely unfazed, stabbing methodically at the peas on his plate, gulping them down. 
So here she was, stomping around the horse barn, trying to find something to do. She'd mucked the stalls. She'd copied and recopied the menu for the next day. She'd written a letter to her parents. She'd even said her prayers, and it wasn't even bedtime. She thought about calling Mr. Miles in Yellowstone. Maybe he'd have some tips. Maybe he could tell her what she was doing wrong. But she didn't want to make that call, telling herself that she had all the tools to help this man. More than anything, she wanted him to open his eyes, really breathe, and embrace this magical, magical place. But he didn't even seem to notice. And that was a shame, because while she didn't know where he was going next, she assumed it would be back to the Pacific. She knew that much. This was a brief respite for this solemn marine. Every so often she would catch something in his eye, recognition and response to something she'd say at the dinner table, or a little twinkle over hot cakes and sausage at breakfast, like he wanted to say something smart back. But he never fully jumped into the conversation. He was polite, almost to a fault, or perhaps he was doing it to get her off his back. And as the days passed, she tried not to be a pest, but she was getting desperate. Other than the soft-spoken cook who came three times a day, her only other company was Sergeant Lovejoy and the caretaker, a sullen older gentleman who preferred silence as he fixed things that needed fixing, trimmed things that needed trimming, and then went with the wind. So it was all Betsy, who would have given her whole life's savings simply to talk to someone. She exhaled and put her hand softly on the horse's mane. The one pleasant surprise of this whole ordeal was the horses. Sure, she had seen cops trotting down the road on their horses or their carriages around Central Park, but she had never ridden one. Now she found that there was a certain majesty to be seated on top of such a magnificent beast. There were times when she felt one with the animal, wanting to scream at the top of her lungs for the horse to run as fast as it could, off, away, gone from everything. When Sergeant Lovejoy wouldn't speak to her, when her challenges to best him in a game of badminton or a round of pinochle fell on deaf ears, she came here to the horses. She groomed them, fed them, and rode them. She got to know them, and they got to know her. With animals, she realized, companionship was always on offer, and more to the point, it was on offer for free. Hearing a cough from somewhere behind her, she spun around in surprise to see Sergeant Lovejoy ambling up the path toward her. I'm sorry to scare you, Miss Caramati. I told you. Call me Betsy, please. Right, sure, miss. Her blood boiled a bit at his stubbornness. I was wondering if I could get another roll of, um, you know. She cocked her head at him. He shifted in place. Uh, toilet paper, you know, for the bathroom. I know what toilet paper is, Betsy said, barely biting off her exasperation. Maybe she should call Mr. Miles and tell him she quit. She'd be better off working as a janitor at the local high school. At least then, maybe the children would talk to her. Sergeant Lovejoy was looking at her now with curiosity. What is it? she snapped. His eyebrows furrowed. You're angry. I'm not angry. But her hands went to her hips and just as quickly went back to dangling at each side. I am not angry. I'm just... She paused. Busy. Sergeant Lovejoy looked all around, then nodded. I bet those horses take up quite a bit of your time. What would you know of it? She nearly barked. She regained her composure. Sergeant Lovejoy, at least I try to do something. What do you do all day? Lie in bed when all I want to do, what we want to do, what your country wants to do, is help you. But you won't allow that. No, you have your stupid marine pride or whatever it is. Well, you can feel a nice sense of entitled relief because I won't bother you any more. You know what time meals are. If you'd like to sit alone, I'd be happy to oblige. I can always eat later. At some point during her little outburst, his eyes had changed, hardened. I didn't ask to come here. Betsy matched his look. Oh, poor you. 
They made you come to this beautiful place. They made you eat three squares a day. They made you... You don't know what you're talking about, he said. Somehow his voice had changed. It was deeper, huskier, full of command, and laced with contempt. Then tell me, she said, her voice softening into full contrast with his. Please, I want to help. There's nothing you or anybody else can do to help me, unless you have a one-way ticket back to the Pacific and back to my men. But you've got this time, she said. You've got this chance to... To what? To let more of my Marines die? To let them down again? Do you even know why I'm here? I assumed that you'd been wounded. He laughed at that. Wounded, yeah. Up here. He tapped his head with his forefinger. You go out on patrol with 26 men, and when you come back, half are walking and the other half are dead bodies. Yeah. I should have been one of them, too, but I let them down. I got lazy. I don't believe that, Betsy said. Believe what you want. All I know is... Until I get back to my unit, I don't care about you. I don't care about this place. And I sure as hell don't give a damn about my country. Not right now. So why don't you leave me alone? I'm sure you'll have some other poor bastard to take care of very soon. And then he turned and went back to the barracks, leaving Betsy to realize that she finally understood, even if it was in some tiny degree, what these men and their country would soon face a crisis of loss, and a crisis of self. And despite the overwhelming need to cry, Betsy gritted her teeth and took this as the gauntlet thrown. She would help Sergeant Lovejoy, even if she had to drag him punching and spitting. Chapter 10 Ricky, 1943 he closed the door to his solo barracks and let out a pained sigh. Well, Sergeant Lovejoy, you are 37 bags of crap all rolled into a Marine Corps khaki uniform. His little outburst on Betsy had been provoked, for sure. He didn't know what was up her tail, but assumed she was only trying to do her job, so he told the truth. The first time he told the truth to anyone. He told half-truths all along the way when asked, How are you feeling, Sergeant? Just fine, thank you, sir. Any lingering effects from your time on Guadalcanal, Sergeant? No lingering effects, sir. Just fine, sir. Lovejoy didn't know about other Marines, but he sure as hell knew about himself. If they had wanted him to talk about his feelings, they would have taught him that at Paris Island. They taught you how to be tough, kicking the crap out of you when needed, teaching you every swear word in the mother tongue for good measure. So no, talking about emotions wasn't in Sergeant Ricky Lovejoy's repertoire. Betsy was tenacious, he had to give her that. She probably would have made a pretty good Marine. He exhaled again, thinking he should go back and apologize to her. But instead of walking the short distance across the way and apologizing, he did what had become a time-honored tradition in the United States Marine Corps. He walked to his bunk, lifted the pillow, and pulled out the bottle he had bought before coming to Montana. There'd been a little bit of trouble in Pearl before going to the canal, and then a little dust-up in Australia, so he'd tried to lay off the sauce, thinking it was better for his career. He'd seen more than his share of Marines get thrown in the can because of it. But at this moment... His career was the farthest thing from his mind. If it was the sauce that he needed, it was the sauce that he would take. It took him just over an hour to reach oblivion, and when he got there, all he found were the same dreams, the same bloody faces, even the screams. For some reason, he could hear the screams. He had never before in his life been able to hear anything in his dreams. They were like silent films playing across his mind. But now, he heard it all. He even smelled it. Cordite, swamp, and burning flesh. Down the familiar memory he swam. The night ambush, his marines fighting like lions. All around him, the screams of the dying and wounded. The high-pitched shriek of the bonsai charge at the end. He lay there in the mud, 
chest heaving, hands scorched and blistered from the barrel of the Browning automatic. Then there was nothing. The thumping arose his senses. Lovejoy's awareness slowly rose to the surface. The thumps, sounds of mortars, but rising in pitch like a tightening conga drum. Sergeant Lovejoy? A female voice. He opened his mouth to respond, but found it dry and liquor caked. Sergeant Lovejoy, can I come in? The name came to him. Betsy. The lights in the barracks room were still on, and he squinted painfully at them. The bottle of Johnny Red had given up the ghost at some point and laid down to sleep beside him. He couldn't tell if he was happy or upset to see that he had finished the entire thing. He stowed it back under the pillow as quickly as his body would allow. Then came the hard part, getting to his feet. There was no light coming in through the window, he thought. It must be night. He was still drunk. His head swam as he got to his feet. I was just getting to bed, he called out, voice croaking in protest. There's someone here to see you, Sergeant Lovejoy. Great. That was the last thing he needed. Probably some canker mechanic coming to poke and prod him, talk about his feelings. Well, hell with that. Tell them I'm indisposed. The liquor in him made him chuckle to himself. He'd never used the word indisposed in his life. Again, the knocking, and then Betsy's voice. Sergeant Lovejoy, it's a Navy captain that would like to see you. Oh, shit, he said under his breath. Can you give me five minutes to get some clothes on? Yes, we'll be across the way, Betsy said. He heard her hollow footsteps recede off the porch. Like a Marine recruit getting called for a surprise inspection, Lovejoy rushed to the bathroom, brushed his teeth, combed his hair, and brushed his teeth again. He noticed a fine mat of stubble on his face, so he shaved, too. Then he put on the cleanest uniform he could find. It wasn't perfect, and it wasn't perfectly ironed, not to his standards, but he put it on anyway. Oh, boy, how his head swam when he tried to stand at the position of attention. And there was nothing he could do about the bloodshot eyes that blearily squinted back at him in the bathroom mirror. A Navy captain? Why the hell a Navy captain? One thing a Marine did not do, even a Marine well in his counts, was leave an officer with eagles on his collars waiting. So, true to his word, not more than five minutes after telling Betsy he would come, he was across the way. Just inside, he found Betsy talking to a lanky and ruddy-faced Navy captain in perfectly tailored whites. They both turned when he entered, and Sergeant Ricky Lovejoy came to attention. Sergeant Lovejoy reporting as ordered, sir. Stand at ease, Sergeant. Sergeant Lovejoy had never met a Navy captain. Sure, he had seen some at the hospital and passing through Pearl. This one looked Lovejoy up and down like he was on the inspection team. He settled on Lovejoy's eyes, and the Marine sergeant thought he detected a faint smile on the captain's face. I'm sorry to have disturbed your night, Sergeant. Not at all, sir. I'm at your disposal. Lovejoy wasn't sure if the word disposal had come out straight or slurred. Damn the booze. I'm on my way to the Pacific, but I have some family up in Montana. I'm from here, you know, the captain said. He pulled the folder from his side. And now, as they taught me, as I'm sure they taught you at Paris Island, Sergeant, Ms. Karamati, if you please, attention to orders. The captain flipped the file folder open. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> the President of the United States takes pleasure to present the Navy Cross to Richard L. Lovejoy, Sergeant, United States Marine Corps, for extraordinary heroism and devotion to duty while serving with... Sergeant Lovejoy listened in wonder. The Navy Cross? What the hell? About halfway through the award citation, Lovejoy made his next mistake. He had locked his knees, and now his knees gave out. Every dumb boot recruit knew better. He swayed once, twice, and to his credit almost caught himself. Then his eyes went back in their sockets, and down went Sergeant Richard L. Lovejoy 
Navy Cross Recipient, 1943. Chapter 11 Jack He never found another place to get a drink, but what he did find was the will to give everything back, every last penny, even pay back the flight. He would put the return flight on his credit card and add it to the rest of his debts. He didn't want to be anywhere near this place. He didn't want to be attached to whatever this Olivia Northcutt was a part of. This mysterious benefactor could be damned. What the scene in the bar had once again proven was that every time Jack Moses tried to do something right, he got bit in the ass. So, he had every intention of quitting when he arrived at Lone Peak Ranch. Olivia wasn't in her office. True, it was late, and when he asked Buster for Olivia's phone number, the cowboy played dumb, or at least that's what Jack thought. Fine, I'll talk to her in the morning, Jack said. Sleep came at last. When he did dream, it was of mother and father and of seaside, and then a laundry list of every mistake he had ever made, about par for the course. He was showered, shaved, dressed, and packed when dawn came, and he was waiting impatiently with his bag outside of Olivia's office, only she never came. He went looking for Buster, who was out front doing some surveying with the latest GPS gear. He was tapping in a metal stake when Jack sidled up next to him. Any idea when Ms. Northcutt is coming back? Buster hammered in the stake, took a moment to inspect it from a new angle, then said, Probably about midday. Midday? Jack asked in a huff. Fine. I'm going for a walk. A good long walk would clear his head. He went past the lodge and began a slow trek across the flowing fields, the beauty of which he'd been pining for all day. He'd never seen these colors. Grays on top of greens, on top of yellows. A smattering of perfect precision. It was hard not to let it seep into his aching soul. By the time he returned, Olivia would be back. Then he would say everything he wanted to say or maybe nothing at all. Maybe he'd return the money and get on with his life. He made the decision somewhere between making his bed and brushing his teeth that a mediocre life was fine for him. Sure, there was a mountain of debt that would probably swallow him whole, but he'd keep chipping away one handyman job at a time. It was the decent thing to do, the right thing to do, and the least Jack could do was try to do the right thing however middling the attempt. He hit a creek and followed it as it meandered along through the Montana backcountry. Not a soul in sight. Occasionally, a bird would call out from overhead or within a copse of trees, but Jack wasn't hearing it. About a half hour into his meandering, his blood pressure started to subside. He thought about the check again. He'd be stupid to give it back. It had been a gift, really. Besides, he promised Pedro a bonus, a bonus the man dearly deserved. Hell, if he wanted to do the right thing, he should give the whole thing to Pedro. But there were bills that had to be paid. As he marched along, Jack made the decision. He would pay off what bills he could and give Pedro the rest. That way, he wouldn't have to taste even a bit of the money. That would make him feel better, at least for a time. He'd still quit this stupid job. His was a solitary life. If solitary included a more capable version of himself named Pedro, then solitary it was. He wasn't very good at being a friend, that's all. He was so lost in planning his speech for Olivia that he didn't notice the creek had gotten wider. It was now spilling into a larger pond circled by a thick line of trees. He marched on. He'd put the final period on the speech when a rustle from up ahead caught his attention. He looked up. A bunch of brown horses? Jack stopped. His eyes went wide. A grizzly turned to face him on all fours. It reared up on its hind legs. Man and beast stared at each other for a long, long moment. Then Jack reached down to his hip, slowly, to where a gun would have been. 
Only, there was no gun. No bear spray. Stupid. How stupid of him. The signs had been everywhere. Jack started backing away slowly, and the bear took that time to sniff the air, as if trying to decide how delicious Jack Moses could be. How about a Jack Moses sandwich, he thought. Or how about Jack Moses ribs? Slather that with a little bit of barbecue sauce and how mm -mm tasty that would be for a big old grizzly. For some reason, Jack wanted to laugh out loud. How utterly ridiculous his thoughts were in this of all moments. The grizzly wasn't moving. Its midnight eyes stared at Jack with a solemn promise of pursuit when, just as Jack was going to turn heel and run, the huge beast let out a roar that seemed to shake the trees. In the blink of an eye, the damned thing was bounding after him. And all Jack could do was run. Psst! If you're enjoying this story and want to support more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 12 Sadie. She had arrived at the horse broker's an hour before dawn. The old man asked if she'd like some breakfast, maybe a cup of coffee, before she left. Sadie had other plans, thanked him, dropped off the final check, and loaded the three horses into her trailer. It was a quick fifteen-minute ride back to her humble little ranch. She was happy to see that the horses easily took to their new home. She left two in the stable, and grabbed the chestnut mare to take for a ride. Dawn was her favorite time to ride. Sadie figured it would probably be her favorite thing to do here in Montana. Saddle on, and off they went. Sadie and her new horse, Peanut, were both equally enjoying the morning ride. they just crested a ridge when the sun came into view, splashing the far horizon. It was as beautiful as she had dreamed. On top of her horse, Surrounded by the land that felt like America, she breathed in the air of her new home. Before her ran a miracle landscape of nature, oranges and yellows all mixed to form a color that was completely indescribable. She didn't need a camera. The image was forever imprinted on her mind where they sat, woman and horse, silent, while the world around them awakened. What she really wanted to do was capture the feeling bottle it, take it out, and swig from it if she ever found herself forgetting the bliss of this moment. Thank you for sharing this with me, Sadie said to the horse, stroking its neck, admiring the fact that with her own money and her own hard work had purchased this fine animal. In the past, it had been her father's money. Now, everything she had, she earned. And even if she died penniless, if she had no debts left to pay, she'd be happy. This was her life. Endless sunrises of the soul, impossible to replicate on film or canvas. This is what she'd always dreamed about, and now she had it. For the next hour, she and Peanut traipsed along, always keeping the sun in their sights. Every manner of animal skittered across the trail or flew overhead, as if welcoming her accepting her as one of them. Along they went, Sadie saying her thanks with every step. Reluctantly, she made the decision to turn back. The others would need to be ridden today, and there was plenty else to do, including some meetings with the vacation home agents who'd hopefully send her some business. The roar from up ahead stopped Peanut cold. It sounded like it was a way off, probably nothing of concern, but she pulled a shotgun from her side saddle just in case. Grizzlies were another part of life here in Big Sky. Then she heard something calling back, then another roar, and then a yell, a human yell. She kicked Peanut into a canter without thinking. Those were angry roars. Sadie and Peanut began galloping down the slope. She saw a man break from a line of trees up ahead, and not long after a grizzly in chase. Sadie waved, but the man didn't see her. She made a beeline, running over bushes and around stumps. Peanut proved her worth, tearing like a tornado over ground. Sadie held on with one hand, the other cradling the shotgun. 
She raised the weapon and fired one shot straight in the air. That got both man and beast's attention. The man broke to the left. The grizzly could not be dissuaded. Peanut made the move before Sadie could even think it and cut the grizzly off. The running man had lengthened his lead. This gave Sadie enough time to cut off right in the middle of the fifty yards between the chaser and the chased. Peanut skidded to a halt, and so did the bear. Then it reared up on its back feet and roared once again. Go home, Sadie yelled, waving her arms, trying to appear bigger than her adversary. It was illegal to shoot a bear unless absolutely necessary. She fired one more shot, aimed to the right, but the bear didn't budge. She'd saved the day, only to be trapped in a no-win position. Her hand slowly moved down to her saddlebags, found the canister inside, and pulled it out. She couldn't shoot the bear, but she sure as hell could spray it. She had practiced the move before. She slipped the shotgun back in its holster and held up her spray canister so the bear could see. Maybe it would be scared off by that. Don't make me do it, big boy, she said. The grizzly snarled and took another step closer. Peanut pulled backward while Sadie held on with expert legs. This was it. This was the moment. And she was ready. Only the moment didn't come. The bear gave one last sniff and then turned and ambled away. Sadie sat there, feeling Peanut's lungs rising and falling beneath her. She didn't move until the bear was out of sight. Then she turned to see that the man had returned, and it was a familiar face. Guy from the bar, she said breathlessly. I'll be damned. He was breathing heavily, but didn't look to be panicked, despite what he had gone through. It looks like I owe you now. Sadie stared at him. What are the odds? I never got your name last night. My name's Sadie. He coughed into his hand. Jack. Jack Moses. She took him in. He was good-looking, probably a good hand over six feet. Good thing she was on her horse or he'd be towering over her. Then, for no reason that she could fathom, unless, of course, it was the adrenaline pumping through her own veins right now, Sadie said, How about dinner? Your treat. That's when Jack Moses smiled a true, genuine smile. It's the least I can do for keeping me from being Jack Rumproast. Chapter 13 Betsy, 1943 She sat on the ground, plucking strands of grass one at a time and flicking them into the waiting wind. What an absolute mess, she thought. First, her complete inability to help Sergeant Lovejoy, and then her complete and utter ignorance when the Navy captain had shown up and told Betsy that he wanted to surprise Sergeant Lovejoy. This was very much not how the Department of the Navy did business. But it was wartime, after all, and he'd been in the area, and the Navy and the Marine Corps needed someone to award Sergeant Lovejoy his much-deserved recognition, and so Betsy had been more than excited. This was their chance as a country to tell the Marine how much he meant to them. She had seen it as the way to unbar the locked door, to finally get inside the place that she'd been trying so hard to penetrate. When Sergeant Lovejoy had reported to the Navy captain, freshly shaved and showered, and clicked his heels together, Betsy was pretty sure that she had stood even straighter than the Marine. And as the words came out of the Navy captain's mouth, she savored every single one. And then the unthinkable happened. At first, she didn't know what was happening. Lovejoy swayed back and forth and was down like he'd been blown over. And Betsy just stood there like a slack-jawed fool. The Navy captain had been the quicker. He'd gotten to Sergeant Lovejoy, caught him, and eased him to the ground. Then the captain took a sniff and grinned. I'd say this heroic Marine sergeant has taken a deep dive, may I add a much-deserved deep dive, into the bottle. He's drunk? I prefer brined to the gills myself. 
the captain raised Sergeant Lovejoy's feet so that he could regain consciousness. Betsy shook her head and snorted at the absurdity of the scene. But then something about it had shifted before her eyes and became something else. She watched the captain and thought she recognized love, or something like love, guiding his hands as he offered the now awakening sergeant some water. When they'd made sure Sergeant Lovejoy was safely in bed, they stepped outside. You know, the captain said in a stage whisper, when I was in the Corps, I wasn't good enough to be a sergeant. You don't say, said Betsy. I only made it to corporal. He tapped the eagle on his shoulder. That's why I had to come into the Navy. Take care of Sergeant Lovejoy, Miss Caramati, will you? A grateful nation must do better for its boys. Betsy set the night in a silent vigil, watching Sergeant Lovejoy's chest rise and fall. Part of the reason she sat there was that she worried he might die. It was an irrational thought, but one she couldn't shake. What if he stopped breathing? What if he had some medical condition? No, that was stupid. He was drunk. But there was no way she could sleep now. Too many thoughts going through her head. Too many worries too many concerns. Now it was morning, and still Lovejoy slept. Betsy sat outside, plucking one blade of grass at a time, listening for the phone to ring, a call from Mr. Miles. Good try, Miss Carlmati, but we're sending you home, she said. Her voice deepened comically. You're an absolute failure to the United States of America, the United States Army, the United States Navy, the United States Marine Corps. Pack your bags. You don't even warrant a bus home. I hope you've got comfortable shoes. She tore a clump of grass out of the earth and threw it, hitting the side of the barracks. Damn it, I was such a fool. Why did I think I could do this? Good morning. She was so surprised that when she tried to get to her feet, she fell back onto her behind. Face blazing with embarrassment, she righted herself and tried to look proper as she brushed the dirt off her backside. You're awake. Lovejoy nodded. His hair had been combed, but there was still a tuft of it in the back that was slightly sticking up. Please tell me that I was dreaming and that a Navy captain didn't come here to give me a medal. I left the citation and the medal on the bunk next to you. I know. I saw it. And I read it. Twice. There was a long, awkward silence where Betsy couldn't think of a single word to say. Luckily, neither could Lovejoy, and it seemed they'd both been holding their breath because they both let out a nervous chuckle. Lovejoy put one hand to his forehead and one to his stomach. Any chance you've got some coffee and maybe something greasy we can cook up? I need to soak up some of this booze. Betsy wanted to tell him how much he had fouled up, how being drunk and passing out in front of a Navy captain was, well, not what a Marine should do. But then she remembered the captain's words. Her job was to take care of this man, not to scold him. And at this moment, her job was to make coffee and see that the cook had made some food for breakfast. How does bacon and eggs and a side of toast sound? Right now, it sounds like heaven. Betsy walked to the second building. Hey, Betsy. She turned around. I'm, uh, I'm sorry for embarrassing you or embarrassing myself or just, you know, acting a fool. I hope you didn't get in trouble. She didn't know yet if she was getting in trouble. No call from Mr. Miles, but it could come any second now. But that was her problem, not his. The captain was quite the gentleman. He said he was a corporal in the Marine Corps. He said he went into the Navy because he never would have made sergeant. Lovejoy's eyes brightened. Well, what do you know? I'll be over in a minute. I can at least help with the coffee. He was gone then, and for some unknown reason, Betsy got the tickling feeling that something had just happened. Some barriers had been knocked away. Had she made a connection? No, it was too soon to grab onto that hope. Mr. Miles would probably be calling within the hour. She would take whatever punishment was coming her way. 
Her father and her brothers had not raised a woman that would let her chin slip. No, she would hold her head high until they told her to leave, and she would do best by remembering the Navy captain's words. And right now, the best thing she could do was to cook the bacon to perfect crispness and forget that night had ever happened. Chapter 14 Ricky, 1943 He had been the buffoon. He had gotten tanked and passed out on a Navy captain. Betsy had told him the whole story, and Ricky could only wonder if a Marine colonel would have done the same. A captain in the Navy and a colonel in the Marine Corps were technically the same rank, but in Ricky's experience, and he would admit that he had limited experience in this area, a Navy captain and a Marine colonel were indeed two very different animals. When Betsy described what the captain had said and what he'd done, a couple tendrils of despair within Lovejoy let go of their hold, at least for the moment. And despite his pounding headache and his roiling stomach, it was the most enjoyable meal he had had in, well, he couldn't remember. Betsy talked about her family, about all her big brothers. He could tell by the way she spoke how much she loved them. But even though she was the only girl, she felt like she was one of them. Perhaps it was because she was the only girl, or the baby of the family, or both. I was an only child, said Ricky, so I never had a brother or sister to deal with. Well, they didn't take it easy on me. If it was me against them, I had to put up my fists and deal with it. Not that they beat the hell out of me or anything like that. They sure knocked me around a bit. Sure, it was playful, but if anybody outside the family picked on me, well, let's just say there are two boys, men now, walking around with crooked noses because of untoward advances. We went to Coney Island once. I was seventeen and proud to show off my body in a bathing suit. I lay down in the sun, luxuriating in summer. Well, what I didn't know was that while the others went off into the surf, my two oldest brothers, Joe and Ronnie, drew a circle in the sand around my towel as I lay there. I opened my eyes at one point and saw each one standing on either side, arms crossed, looking like two of Al Capone's henchmen. Then I noticed the circle. It was obvious then. If anyone looked at me, there would be trouble. If anyone crossed that line in the sand, watch out, brother. Ricky laughed. I probably would have done the same if I had a little sister. Oh, I was mortified. But that's an Italian family for you. She told him about her father, about the stores, about his effect on her, and that when she demanded to enlist, he'd done everything he could to put up roadblocks, but she found a way around him. Ricky found himself appreciating her tenacity. But you must be bored of this place already. I mean, you've got a fainting Marine sergeant in your care. Betsy smiled at that. Whenever she smiled, he noticed, she lowered her head slightly, as if embarrassed. And having noticed this, he became aware that he was staring at her. Hold your horses there, Marine, he told himself. This is just breakfast, and this is just her job. And you're a lowly Marine sergeant with zero prospects. And what about you? Betsy asked. You said no brothers or sisters, but... Mom and Dad? She asked it cautiously, like it might break him to answer. My dad died when I was little. I don't remember him much, except for maybe some yelling or bitter words my mom said about him. That left me and my mom. She tried real hard. She said her dream was to see me go to college. No love joy had ever been to college. And on those nights that she would drink those cheap gin martinis, She'd call me Professor Lovejoy or Dr. Lovejoy, the Honorable Mr. Lovejoy, and so on. What happened? Did you go to college? Ricky shook his head. We didn't have any money. I started doing odd jobs at ten. Had to chip in for my mom because, to put it bluntly, she was a drunk. This was prohibition, remember? Those thirteen years created more drunks than any other time in history. Anyway, she couldn't hold down a job. Like I said, she tried hard, and I really don't blame her. Some nights, 
she'd come into my bedroom and hold me and cry. I'm sure the head shrinkers would probably tell you that has something to do with who I am today, taking care of Ma at such a young age. But I didn't mind, you know. It was only me and her, and I didn't know any different. I met lots of guys in the Marines that had the same, whether it was only a mom or only a dad. But my mom always made sure I went to school. I was pretty good in sports, so I had plenty of friends. Then this Marine recruiter shows up one day at my high school and walks right onto the football field. He's in his dress blues, you know. Real killer diller. I'd never seen a Marine in real life before. I'd only seen them in the movies. Remember The Marines Are Coming with William Haynes? I thought that one was a hoot. Boy, I tell you, this recruiter was a smooth talker. And he looked like Haynes in that movie. Chiseled face and straight back. And he probably could have started on our offensive line. He asked for volunteers. And this was before Pearl Harbor. So a buddy of mine and I signed up right there, right on the football field. Seemed like a big adventure then. That recruiter even whispered in my ear when I was signing the papers. Hey, kid, he said, once you have a uniform like this, the ladies will be jumping all over you. Well, it was going to be a long time before I got a uniform like that. So right after high school, I think I had a day, maybe two, they shipped me off to Paris Island. It was kind of funny. At least I had some discipline from sports. I could keep my things together. But some of those other recruits, you'd think saying yes, sir, was reciting the encyclopedia. He went on to tell her about Paris Island and his first duty station out in California, a place called Camp Pendleton. Betsy had read about Camp Pendleton and knew that it was right by the beach. She'd seen pictures. It looked like everyone was on holiday. So I'm not on the West Coast for a week and I get called into the first sergeant's office. I had kept my nose clean so I wasn't worried. The first sergeant usually called you in if you forgot to fill out a form or your pay got screwed up. But when I went in the first sergeant's office, it wasn't only the first sergeant. It was the first sergeant, the gunny, and the company commander. Even my platoon commander walked in behind me. It was my company commander who gave me the news. He was a crusty old guy and had done his first hitch a long time before. The old man lays it out for me, right out straight. PFC Lovejoy, he says. I'm sorry to inform you that your mother passed away this morning. My goodness, said Betsy, putting a hand to her mouth. I don't remember the rest. They told me that I could take leave, that I could see to my mom's belongings, her estate and all that. Only, she didn't really have any belongings. She didn't have an estate. Just a cache of old whiskey bottles with peeled labels and a few jugs of bootlegged hooch, all dry. Lovejoy stabbed at the last bit of egg on his plate. I knew she wouldn't have wanted me to make a big fuss. I could see she was dying when I left for Paris Island. She was too sick to come to my graduation. So I told the old man that I was staying, that I had a cousin that could see to my mom's things. They let me make a long-distance phone call, and I did the only thing I could think of to honor my mother's memory. He laughed dryly. I went to town with a couple other PFCs and got good and drunk. Got in not one fight, but two, and got thrown into the brig for the night. Don't worry, my first sergeant came and got me. He didn't even need to explain to the MPs why. That's kind of how it is in the Corps. A gunny or a first sergeant tells you something, you do it. I don't care what your rank is. You could be the goddamn commandant of the Marine Corps, and you'd better listen. But the first sergeant gave me a good talking to you. You better believe that. But he was never mean. He told me how he had lost his mother, too. But then he warned me that if I ever did the same thing again, he wouldn't come down to the brig and get me. He'd let me sit and rot. And that was if he was in a bad mood. If he was in a good mood, he'd press further charges and get me sent to Portsmouth. Portsmouth Naval Prison in Kittery, Maine, was not where you want to go. The guards there are notorious, sadistic. So I kept my nose clean. Then Pearl Harbor happened, and I guess, as they say, the rest is history. Betsy nodded. He could tell she wanted to ask all sorts of questions. That's just who she was. But she didn't. She held her tongue, and he very much appreciated that. So, that's me in a nutshell.
No family. Drunk as a skunk on a bunk. But at least I got a stupid medal that I can hang on the wall. He spit those words out more callously than he had intended. I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound... Betsy raised a hand. You don't need to apologize to me, okay? Lovejoy nodded. How about we start over? Betsy asked. She stuck out her hand. Betsy Karamati. Lovejoy grinned and extended his as well. Ricky Lovejoy. Good to meet you, Ricky. Or would you like me to call you Sergeant Lovejoy? Ricky would be just fine. And may I call you Betsy? Unless we are having a fine dinner here in this more than fine establishment. He laughed. Yes, Betsy's just fine. They shook hands and finished their breakfast. The cook's voice called out from the front of the building. Uh, Miss Camarati, there's a visitor here for you. Oh, I wasn't expecting anyone. Why don't you finish your breakfast? Eat some more if you like. I'll see who it is. Lovejoy finished his last bite, gathered the dishes, and put them in the sink. The cook liked to do the dishes for some reason. Betsy had offered on his first day there, but no dice. Then he went to the front door. It was still open, and Betsy was standing there, looking down at something. He stepped to where he could get a better view. She was squinting down at a telegram. I can't read it, she said, handing it to him. The Secretary of War directs me to express his deep regret that your brother, Private Joseph Karamati, was killed in action in defense of his country on 16th June in Pacific area. Letter follows. His stomach dropped. Betsy burst into tears, and before she could fall to her knees, Ricky Lovejoy grabbed her and held her close. And as her pain coursed and roiled, he cursed this war, the enemy, even God himself. What kind of world could do this to such a wonderful, beautiful creature? Psst! If you're enjoying this book and want more free audiobooks, Please click subscribe. Chapter 15 Sadie, Present Day She had spent the rest of the day wondering why she had even suggested dinner. A sit-down dinner was the last thing she wanted. There was too much to do, horses to take care of, business to find, and a new home to make ready. But her mouth had run away with her, and at 7 p.m. on the dot, she was waiting on the front porch of a quaint restaurant on the river. It had been suggested by Google, something casual, clean, no romance, with good food and less than 15 minutes from home. Jack arrived right on time. Sadie was impressed to see that he'd cleaned up well. He was wearing jeans and a simple sport coat that looked like it had plenty of wear. His eyes shined. Forgive my appearance, he said. I didn't think I'd be here for very long and didn't bring many options. Sadie motioned to her own attire. I can't say I'm much better. He let out an awkward laugh and said, Well, at least it's not a date. She felt herself flush, and before her mouth could run away with her again, she went inside with him on her heels. The host appraised them up and down slowly. Would you two like something cozy? We're just friends. Sadie blurted out. The host's eyes went wide for a second, but he recovered nicely. Why don't you follow me, please? They got a table overlooking the Gallatin River, where they could see a man and a woman fishing side by side. Probably husband and wife, she thought. Her parents had probably never gone fishing together. What luxury it must be to have someone with whom you can share silence. The host pulled out her chair. Your waiter will be with you shortly, he said. Jack fiddled with the fork on the table while Sadie busied herself watching the couple on the river. She stole a glance at Jack, who, if she was on the market, would be quite the attractive catch. She knew she was at least his match, though she had never flaunted her beauty, maybe once or twice in college, but those were the sorority days. She was far from a sorority girl now, baked in mud for most of the day. If her sisters could see her now, they'd laugh. She wouldn't care. 
she was in heaven, and as long as she could make it through this dinner, she could get back to her life. Why had she suggested dinner? Politeness or stupidity? You do much fly fishing? Jack asked. Uh, what? Fly fishing. He pointed at the river. You look like you were going to go down there and show that couple how it's done. I've never been fly fishing, she said, taking the question seriously. I'd love to learn, though. I'm more of a bass guy myself, Jack said, and with a wink added, I catch very little flies. Anyway, some deep sea fishing comes with the territory, you know? The Florida panhandle. Ever been? When I was a girl, I remember the lovely white sand beaches. Well, the panhandle is deep fishing country. I think if you gave me a fly rod, I'd probably chuck it halfway down the river before I figured out how to use it. The server arrived. Anything to drink? Jack squinted at the wine list. I see here a bottle of Malbec, and if I'm not mistaken, it looks as though it might have our names on it. He pointed to the name. The waiter nodded and disappeared to fill the order. That's a 2017, said Sadie. I'm impressed. Wine connoisseur? Not really. I choose them at random and get lucky once in a blue moon. So, let me ask you. Are you in the business of saving city boys from grizzly bears? The first grizzly I've ever seen, she said. Really? He shook his head. Well, I kind of hope it's the last grizzly I ever see. Serves me right for wandering around without any bear spray. Yeah. On that subject, what were you doing out there? Jack shrugged. Just clearing my head, I guess. The server reappeared with wine glasses and a bottle. When the wine was poured, Jack raised his glass. To you, for saving my bacon. Sadie raised her own glass. And thank you for making this an interesting first week in Montana. They smiled at one another, and while she didn't necessarily feel any kind of flutter, she was pulled in by his smile. Plus, there was the fact that he seemed to have no motive. In her history with men, she found they always had a motive, and that was to get her into the bedroom or to get a ring on her finger. She had no time for either. All righty, Jack said, putting his glass down. First week in Montana. Tell me what it is that you do here, other than rescuing potential human lunch from a grizzly's gullet. Well, it was my goal to offer up horseback tours, but what I really wanted to do, and don't laugh, is help orphans and terminally ill children learn how to ride. Now, why the hell would I laugh at that? Because it sounds cheesy. I want to help orphans and sick children? Sounds like a Miss America answer. Why don't I go ahead and cure cancer and establish peace in the Middle East while I'm at it? In all seriousness, I see nothing wrong with getting kids with no hope immersed in nature, showing them the beauty of the outdoors, how to appreciate a fine, strong animal. Sadie felt herself getting swept up in the dream as she elaborated. Jack leaned in closer as he listened and sipped his wine. I'm boring you, she said, not really knowing why she said it. Jack shook his head. No, I love it. I really, I do. If I'm going to be here for any time, maybe I'll come and take a lesson, pay you a prime rate. Their waiter arrived then with perfect timing, menus in hand. He rattled off the chef's specials for the night. They both ordered, which gave them enough time to reset the conversation. And what about you, Jack? Sadie said, when the waiter had disappeared. What are you here to accomplish on this little blue marble? Jack sat back in his chair and shrugged. Build some things? Try to stay out of trouble? A noble ambition, but that can't be all, she said playfully. Come on, give me something. I did save your life, after all. He laughed. Okay, I own a small general contracting company down in Florida. I'm a fair handyman, but I'm better at the strategic side of things. I can look at a piece of land and buildings show themselves to me. But that level of work takes a lot of money and big clients. He stared off at the river like he only half believed it. But I'll get there one day. Is that why you're here? she asked. For your work, I mean. Jack nodded. I'm not sure I'm qualified to do what they want me to do, but it pays well. We'll see how long it lasts. To be honest, 
I planned on leaving today. Well, it's a good thing you didn't, or else I wouldn't have earned my life-saving merit badge. A small basket of bread was presented by one of the busboys. What about family? Sadie asked. Brothers? Sisters? Jack shook his head. Only child. Mother? Father? Jack's hand froze over the bread. He tore off a piece, put it on his plate, and left it there. My mom died a while ago, before high school. Dad, a little more recent. Sadie could see she had inadvertently struck a nerve. She tried to steer the conversation back to where it had been a moment before she opened her stupid mouth as Jack stared at the bread on his plate. In her considered opinion, the entire dinner would have been better if they had kept silent. Chapter 16 Jack They said their goodbyes, she thanked him for dinner, and she drove away without looking back. He tried to nudge himself forward, trying to be polite, when he clammed up before dinner had even been served. He could feel the walls building. He had been an idiot, and hoped that Sadie hadn't noticed. A nice girl, really pretty. She seemed to have so much going for her. But Jack had his own mess to mend. Being saved in what he now referred to as the Bear's Glade, Jack had returned to Lone Peak Ranch, taken out a sheet of paper, and written down all the reasons he was going to lay out for Olivia Northcutt as to why he shouldn't stay. Front and back, he had written, only Olivia had never arrived but it seemed hasty to say goodbye to Montana before saying thank you to the woman who had saved him. And then that question came. Why hadn't it hurt when she asked about his mother, but hadn't hurt when she asked about Dad? All the guilt he felt bubbled up, constricted his throat, and pointed an accusing finger at his soul. Par for the course, he thought, to ruin what could have been a nice dinner. Well, at least Sadie knew she didn't need to waste time with him. It wasn't worth her time or energy. At least now, he could get back to Lone Peak and give his notice. Maybe Olivia was back. He drove, once again ticking off all the reasons in his head. Work to do at home, under qualification, yada yada. A pang of anxiety hit when he considered what was waiting for him at home. Collectors would be pounding on his door. He would have to face them. There'd probably be an email waiting for him from his lawyer. He'd taken to checking his email only once every three days. Any email that wasn't an offer for 30% off boxer shorts was no doubt going to be a nag for another $250 he couldn't afford. Some life. Scared of emails and phone calls. Other than Pedro, he really had no responsibilities. He could take off and never come back. Was all life merely responsibility to others? If so, then why am I even alive? The car ahead of him swerved and Jack slammed on the brakes, regaining his equilibrium. After his heart slowed, he resumed his maudlin thoughts. But the encounter had awakened something in him, something nervous and clawing from the inside. His thoughts kept wandering back to his father. What would his father say? What would his father think? By the time he arrived at Lone Peak, his mind was made up, his decision etched in stone. It was 9 p.m., but when Jack walked down the hall, he saw the light was on in Olivia's office. Here we go, Jackie boy. Time to turn tail and run. The only thing you've ever been good at in your life. Chapter 17 Betsy 1943. My brother is dead. She said it slow. She said it fast. She said it again and again, sometimes in her head, sometimes whispered out loud. She didn't understand and couldn't fathom the words. Joseph Karamati, Joe, her oldest brother, her hero, the heir to the Karamati name, wiped away like dry dirt. She had lost an aunt when she was young. Something about a flu outbreak. She didn't know the details. She remembered bits and pieces of going to the funeral. 
a body and a casket that looked more like an imperfect doll. And of course, she had heard the stories of neighborhood kids getting hit by streetcars. But this, this was something new and terrible, and it was tearing out her insides. She kept imagining Joe, her strong, loving oldest brother, how she used to run and jump into his arms, and how he'd swing her around until she squealed for him to stop. Joe, gone. She remembered the barest details of Sergeant Lovejoy holding her. After she'd gotten the telegram, she'd been too numb to feel the human contact. She had not said thank you and didn't think she ever would. Why would she? The only feelings she had now were sadness and regret. She hadn't told her oldest brother often enough that she loved him. Why had she spent that weekend off with friends instead of with her family? Regret and sadness tumbled inside her, swam in her blood. She tried to pray or beg. She wanted to scream, but she didn't. That allowed her a phone call. She'd called her parents, and even though her father had tried to sound stoic, Betsy could tell that his heart was breaking too. Despite his tough upbringing and the times, the old man had been close to every one of his children. He'd been there for every game, every birthday. He'd dressed up as Santa Claus on Christmas. How Betsy wished she could be with him now. They could console one another. They could remember Joe in the way they should, the way he deserved to be remembered. When her mother had gotten on the line, the family conversation went from bad to worse. While her father was stoic, her mother was frantic. She kept babbling on about calling the war department, getting her other boys to come home. And you'll be home on the first train, won't you? She said with a tone of obvious expectation. I can't, Mom, she said softly. You know that. We need you here, Betsy. There are so many things to do. You know, Joe's favorite food. We'll have to make it for the service. And Father Patron will want you to help him prepare the mass, like you did when you were younger. She went on and on like this. Betsy realized it was her mother's way of grieving. There were no sobs from her mother, no screams of denial. Only, first we do this and then we do that. Like they were preparing for a family reunion, a Sunday dinner, or a confirmation mass. I can't come home, Betsy said. Nonsense, her mother said. We've already bought you a ticket. I'm sure the government will reimburse us. You're not listening, Mother. I'm not coming home, not yet. She heard talking in the background, her mother telling her father what to say. And then her father came back on the line. Your mother wants you to come home, he said. And what do you want? Betsy asked, quietly, so only he could hear. I want Joe back, he said, his voice cracking. And then she heard a single sob, and the line went dead. She thought it was a poor connection, and she looked at the operator, who'd been listening to the entire thing. He solemnly shook his head. How much do I owe you, she asked. No charge, the operator said, taking the receiver back. She went back to Lone Peak, back to her sadness, back to her regret. And here she sat, staring out the window, numb to the world. On the radio, the Andrews sisters' version of Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree was ending, and a new tune by Glenn Miller, one she didn't catch the name of, had begun. It sounded so longing, and yet so full of promise, like whatever mournful pleas those saxophones were crooning would eventually be answered to their satisfaction. There was a knock on the door, and Sergeant Lovejoy entered. He took off his cover and gave a short nod of his head. I was just checking in. Wanted to see if you needed anything. I'm fine, thank you, Betsy said, and turned back to the window. It's a beautiful day. I was thinking about maybe going for a walk. Would you like to join me? It had been two days since that terrible telegram, and no, she didn't want to go for a walk. What she wanted to do was sit here, close her eyes, and hope that when she woke up, when she opened her eyes next, everything would be back to where it was. 
Back to how it had been when life had been so full of possibilities, when her brother had been alive. Maybe we could take a couple of the horses, Lovejoy said. Looking up at him, she offered a weak smile. I'm not really in the mood, but thank you. She tried to sound polite and wasn't sure if the words had come out correctly. She wasn't sure of anything. Have you eaten today? Betsy shook her head. I can have the cook make you something. Eggs, maybe? Some bacon? I'm not hungry, but thank you. He finally took the hint. But before leaving, he set a hand on her shoulder and said, Let me know if you need anything. I can help. And he left. And Betsy sat staring out the window, looking at nothing, thinking of Joe, and wondering what this was all for and her mind went back to sadness and regret and a circle traced in hot sand. Chapter 18 Ricky, 1943 As he walked out into the open air, he caught the scent of pine on a whisper of wind. He sat down on the porch and took it in, breath by breath, as if it were a prescribed dosage. The sun had moved over into its waning hours and was now casting a soft light on everything, dripping through the tops of trees, transforming the world around him. Everything here was in its place, and it was in this moment that he realized that all things connected to suffering and loss were contained in the human heart and soul. He had never before seen the dividing line between those two worlds. What Betsy was going through now, however, he saw clearly, as he'd seen it so many times before. She was another type of casualty altogether, and here she hadn't seen a lick of combat, not even a hint of it, and yet she was a casualty. He'd seen fellow Marines go from hard chargers to catatonic wrecks, and in the end, it didn't matter much if it was mortar fire that made them that way or seeing the empty spot in the trench where their brother used to be that did it to them. If war didn't batter the body, it battered the mind. The lucky ones were the ones who escaped unscathed. He got up and took a few steps toward the woods. The trees loomed. Majesty reigned in the world, and human squabbles shut it out. He wanted to weep for this kind of loss. He didn't know a thing about Betsy's brother. He didn't have one himself, so he couldn't fathom the loss on a blood level. He kicked himself for his thoughts and his inner musings on nature and man's relationship to it. They were so beneath where she was right now. He wanted to tell her that his Marines had been his brothers, maybe not by blood, but they were his brothers just the same, damn it. And he understood why it had happened. The country was at war and good men died. But why was he so incompetent with her when it came to something he knew so much about? He remembered that first day at Paris Island, the sadistic drill instructor asking, Are you ready to die for your country? And like a good Marine, Ricky had barked back, Yes, sir. And he had been ready, because he was young and full of bravado. He believed, as Hollywood told him he should, that when the trumpets of battle sounded, he would run fearlessly into the maelstrom. But he had yet to meet a single brave hero who'd lie to him about the nature of fear. Everyone was afraid, and he knew that every time he'd waded into battle, he'd been terrified himself. But he'd kept going. He knew intuitively from the very beginning that it had been training that had made him move first, one foot in front of the other, eyes forward. Then what kept him moving was his fellow Marines marching along next to him. If they were moving out, he was moving out with them. And then it became his duty, the right thing to do. Here they all were, scuttling around in herds. He often wondered if war was just some strange game of cosmic badminton, where souls were batted back and forth. And in the end, Sergeant Lovejoy had taken the pain inward, and let it grip him so tightly that it sent him straight to the bottle. 
It wasn't so long ago that he was in muck up to his hips, his clothes soaked and reeking for a week, seventy-plus pounds of gear on him, his skin chafed raw, murdered by mosquitoes. Now he sat here, home-cooked food for every meal. He hesitated at the edge of the woods, opting instead to walk along the perimeter. Something about the deep woods frightened him now. Perhaps it was the aloneness. His heart was seized with an ache he had never felt before, not even in the aftermath of combat. The grand majesty of these trees revealed the truth. Ricky Lovejoy was alone, and he needed help, and no one had taught him how to ask for it. Up till now, he thought that was solely a marine problem. Now he realized that Betsy had been suffering from it as well. Something changed in him. A tide had turned, and it had everything to do with her pain. When he had reached out to her and held her, that very action had snapped at the iron cord that tethered Ricky Lovejoy to his anger. There was more to be done on that front. A kind word and a listening ear could do wonders for the soul, but Betsy needed to eat to keep going. She was battling the disease of pain and loss, and that was her battle to wage. She'd wage it in time, but right now, her body needed fuel for the fight. He'd buy some food and make a couple of meals worth of a picnic. Then they would walk together. He'd give her the luxury of choosing between silence and conversation. And then maybe they could throw saddles on a couple of horses and make a real journey out of it, an adventure even. Bodily sustenance and meandering in the great solitude of Lone Peak it was a prescription that made him smile. He turned away from the woods and headed toward the side of the lodge. There was an old, beat-up truck that Betsy said he was welcome to use. He figured he didn't need to ask, so he got in the truck. The keys were in it. Nobody was coming way out here to steal it. He put the thing in gear and headed toward town. He ticked off the things he would need in his head as he followed the signs. Maybe he could surprise her with a trail that she'd never been on. That would be the cat's pajamas. These were all the thoughts going through Ricky Lovejoy's mind when a pair of teenagers who enjoyed a morning in their father's liquor cabinet came peeling around the corner, their eyes anywhere but on the road, and slammed headfirst into Sergeant Richard Lovejoy. Chapter 19 Jack, present day. Olivia's desk was scattered with papers, what looked like invoices and permits, things that Jack had often seen scattered on his own father's desk growing up. I was wondering if you had a minute to talk. How was dinner? she asked. How? she smiled. Lucky guess. I'm good like that sometimes. Dinner was good. I'm glad. Have a seat. I'm not interrupting. She sighed. It would give me no greater pleasure than to leave these permits behind for a few minutes. Please, have a seat. Jack took a seat and noticed that one of his legs was shaking. He clamped a hand over his thigh. Miss Northcutt. Olivia. Right, Olivia. Sorry. Not only were his words fumbling, but his brain was fumbling, too. Everything he had prepared on the drive over was flittering out his ears. Eventually... He let out a huff and said, Look, I'm not sure I'm the best qualified man for this job, but I appreciate the offer. And it's not that I don't appreciate the money, but I'm sure there are more than a dozen other guys in this town who could do what you need. Olivia nodded. Is this only a matter of qualification, or is it something else? Again, the fumbling in his brain. I'm strictly concerned about your operation, about Lone Peak Ranch. This is something on a scale that, from what our benefactor has told me, she said, her voice rising to cut him off. You were involved in much bigger developments than this with your father, were you not? Again, the information that they had on him was damn near uncanny. He'd worked on huge developments with his father in Florida, huge office buildings, cities far from seaside. Sure, of course, he said. But this will take a special hand. I'm not sure I'm... Qualified? she finished for him with a smile. You said that. 
He tamped down his flare of annoyance, but it took him a second to realize that it wasn't annoyance. It was the insecure little him inside. Olivia, he said, talking slowly now. The mission, the land, all of it. I'm not sure I can handle it right now. Olivia nodded thoughtfully. Jack, I'm curious. Does this have anything to do with your time in the Marine Corps? That froze him cold. If Olivia and their mysterious benefactor knew all about his past, about his experience with his father, about his upbringing, of course they would have found out about his military service. But those two words, Marine Corps, swept away his last speck of congeniality. I'm sure you dug up every ounce of dirt I have ever put on this world. My time in the Marine Corps, that's private. And yeah, if I'm being honest, me quitting this job does have to do with that time. I'm trying to put it behind me. I'd like to get past it. Every minute that I stay here, the memories, the mistakes that I've made, it all keeps staring me in the face, and I don't know how long. Well, let's just say I'm starting to question my sanity. Olivia didn't reply for a long, awkward minute. Jack figured that the way the words had come out of his mouth, she would be giving him a final check, maybe a pat on the back, maybe a, good luck, buddy, have a nice life. She did none of those things. What she did do was worse. I wasn't going to bring this up until later. It's one of the clauses in my contract that, if needed, to keep you here, the benefactor has allowed me to unearth certain details about the relationship between you and him. You served together, Jack, and there was a kindness done that he'd like to repay. It's something he doesn't take lightly. Besides, he's not a man who likes to hear no. I'm sure you've met your fair share of those leaders in your experience. He had. Colonels with an iron will. Gunnery sergeants whose word was gospel. Generals who picked food out of their teeth with a K-bar. But this was too much. He was basically being held hostage. He searched his memory for anyone he served with that could be the mysterious man behind the curtain. I mean, what kind of person would do this? Was there an ulterior motive? What kind of person threw money around, especially on someone as ill-qualified as Jack Moses? There isn't much that I have left in this world, he said. But one thing that I do have is my dignity. And if you'll allow me, I'd like to keep it. I don't take handouts, and I always repay my debts. So if you'll get our benefactor on the phone, I'll personally lay things out for him. I'll tell him why I need to leave, and thank you for the offer, but I think I'll pass. Olivia didn't reach for the phone. Instead, she started shuffling papers around, stacking them on her desk. If you want to quit, Jack, just tell me. I'm authorized to give you a hefty bonus simply for showing up. She pulled a checkbook out of one of her drawers and placed it on the desk. But what I'd recommend is that you take the night to sleep on it. Maybe stick around here for a couple of days. There's someone I'd like for you to meet. If he can't convince you, then, well, you're free to go, with our benefactor's blessing, of course. But you'll have to understand that I have a job to do, Jack. That job right now is you. If there's something you'd like to tell me about your time in the Marine Corps... Something that's holding you back? I'm here to listen. Or I can have the best counselors or therapists flown here in half a day. But you don't seem like a broken man, Jack. There's something else, isn't there? An underlying fear, maybe, or guilt. Maybe we can call it regret. I know all about regret and guilt, Jack. All I can say is the sooner you let it go, the better your life will become. She raised her hands as if to say, That's my two cents and you can take it or leave it. And all Jack could think about were those two words, regret and guilt, and how much they had swallowed his life whole. Psst. If you want more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 20 Sadie She'd gotten her mind off the disastrous dinner with Jack Moses by getting back to work. There wasn't much else she could do outside at night, so she settled in for some paperwork. If she wanted to run a legitimate business, 
There were the authorities to deal with first. They were nice enough and helped her from a distance. In the next day or so, she'd go in and meet them. She always believed that face-to-face -face business was better than over the phone or through email. The paperwork was soon exhausted, but her mind was still whirling. No way she could get to sleep. She pulled out a piece of scrap paper and a pen and began jotting down prospective names for her fledgling horse business. Sadie's Horse and Tack, Sky Saddles, Trails and Rehabilitation. Nothing sounded right. She never thought she'd go into business for herself. A more traditional path to a more traditional job was what she had always assumed for herself. Her father had pushed her all along to become a lawyer, to follow in his footsteps and take over when he was done. Only she knew the truth. He would never be done. He would stand in front of a jury or a judge until the day he died. He loved it too much. Sadie stood up, leaving the piece of paper and pen on her cushy chair, and started walking circles around the tiny living room. Sadie's place, she said out loud. The horse and the hound. At this, she let out a little laugh. It was a joke from one of her favorite movies. That idea started to take hold, and it made her think that maybe she needed a dog living out here all alone. While she could take care of herself without a dog, her father had insisted on firearms training from a young age, she needed some form of companionship. The horses couldn't live inside. Right then and there, Sadie made the decision that she would find a dog, maybe two. That decision felt so good that she completely forgot about Jack Moses and briefly forgot about getting her business up and running. She did a couple more things around the house, including a final check on the horses, and then decided to go to bed. She'd wake up early again the next day and go for that long, beautiful ride. The thought of it filled her with such joy that she could almost see her mother smiling down at her. She was doing this for them both. Her mother had always supported her dreams, and that, besides their friendship as mother and daughter, she missed so much. She missed having somebody reassuring her that it was okay to dream. It was her mother who had taught her that it was all right to do what was considered outside the norm. I miss you, Mom, Sadie said. She pushed away the sadness and clenched her jaw in determination. She could only hope, and maybe even pretend, that her guardian angel was with her on this exciting journey. She was sliding under the covers when there was a knock at the front door. It was after 10 p.m. Who could that be? Just to be safe, she grabbed the shotgun from its wall mount. Who is it? Sadie, it's me. The sound of the familiar voice turned her cold. She steeled herself. Then, turning the gun toward the floor, she reluctantly undid the locks and opened the door. Standing there in one of his expensive suits was none other than Raymond Crawford III, her father. Chapter 21 Sadie So, this is where you've been hiding, her father said. I haven't been hiding, Dad. You knew exactly where I was. Her father sniffed as if he'd detected some foul odor and then pushed past her. Oh, very nice. A kitchen, a dining room, and a bedroom, all in the same room. Do you have a bathroom? On a normal day with a normal person, Sadie would have known exactly what to say back. But with her father, the words choked themselves to death before reaching her mouth. It was like he had some sort of prosecuting attorney power over her. It's my home, Dad, she said. Wow, did that sound lame. Eleven years old and a millisecond. He wiped a finger along the dusty windowsill, played with the dust between his fingers, and then turned to face her. Your home is in Los Angeles, Sadie Crawford. She hated it when he used her full name. It was another power play, an intonation designed to reveal herself to herself. I always hated it there, and you know it. She was trying to push him to frustration. His face never changed, him and his professional training. What about your friends? Do you miss them? 
They weren't real friends, Dad. I've changed. I need you to respect that. Let's talk about respect then, since you brought it up. Respect is a two-way street. Respect is something that's built through years of hard work and toil. Respect was something I thought we had. Trust was something I thought we had. He looked all around the one-room home. But instead of keeping your word, you've chosen this place and this far-off nowhere. He always knew exactly which words to choose to make them sting in the right way. Sadie was powerless to stop them, and she knew that he knew that. Will you just go, please? She was on the verge of tears. The last thing she wanted to do was cry in front of her father and give him the satisfaction of knowing he was right. In truth, she was struggling. What he didn't understand was that she'd much rather be struggling than succeeding under his wing. We had plans, Sadie, he said evenly. You were going to finish law school, take the bar, and then come to work with me. Had he forgotten that she had been to law school, or was he being coy? She had been studying for the bar exam, and it had bestowed an epiphany. Her father's life was so far from what she wanted that it would bring her closer to her real goal in life if she upped and ran from it as fast as possible. It was only when her things were packed that she told her father, and that was on a phone call. She couldn't bear the idea of his scolding face before her. She loathed the idea of this very moment. You have a responsibility, Sadie. Responsibility to me, to yourself, and to what we've built. Interesting that you put yourself first, she said defiantly. Anyway, it's not what we've built, Dad. It's what you've built. And I don't want it. How can you say that to me after everything that I've given you? All the trips, all the horses, all the training. Stanford wasn't cheap, you know. Neither was Harvard Law. Do you want me to pay you back? Is that what this is all about? You know it isn't. Oh, no? I'll pay you back penny by penny if that's what it takes. But you're not going to hold this over my head. It's my decision and my life, not yours. Her heart was racing, and the sight of that familiar placid expression on his face made it race even more. She felt like grabbing him by the lapel and throwing him out the door. I don't care about the money, Sadie, he said, cool as a robot. It's the principle. Do you think you can go through life refusing to honor your word, flirting from place to place on a whim? Honestly, what kind of life is that? What will they say? Raymond Crawford and his vagabond daughter. Where is she now, Raymond? Did she join a cult yet? The tiny smile on his face as he spoke those last words tipped her. Tears came now and she hugged herself. Go, just, please go, Dad. The fight was out of her. For a brief second, she thought she saw him soften. But he reverted to his stoic self once more in the blink of a tear-blurred eye. Come home with me, Sadie, he said. I don't care about the horses you have out there. You need to come home. And then he said something that gave her a glimmer of hope. I need you to come home. Need. Sadie knew the truth. Raymond Crawford III had never had a son, an heir. He tried in vain to mold her into his likeness, never realizing that she was flesh and bone and not clay. She had her own will, her own life, and she meant to live it. She pointed at the door. Please, don't come back, she said, with as much emphasis as she could muster. This isn't over, Sadie, he said, staring with eyes that were flat and stony. He was gone, and Sadie fell to her knees, feeling as though someone had pulled a plug and drained her out onto the floor. Chapter 22 Jack he spent the next couple of days forgetting about his past the way he always did, by getting to work. There were site plans to finalize, commissioners to meet, and surveys to conduct to make sure that all was right. There was to be the lodge, of course, which was where he was staying. It was to be the center point of Lone Peak Ranch. Veterans and their families could come and stay, and there would be stables, barns, a shooting range, a theater, 
and the activity building, and that was only the beginning. Olivia had told him to use his imagination, to cast himself back into the role of Marine leader and ask what his Marines would need. He didn't want to go there. His thoughts were anchored by practicality, drawing lines and measuring feet. Minutia kept him from thinking about the real mission of the place. Before long, he knew that this was hampering his progress. His father had told him long ago that if you didn't step back and look at the mission of a place, whether that be a doctor's office or a training facility, then you couldn't build a home for that business. Big Jack treated real estate like a spiritual endeavor. He put his soul into a project, which had accounted for his success and the familiarity of his name from coast to coast. It was why billionaires flew him to the Bahamas for consultation and why kings flew him to Oman. And Big Jack had done it the right way, by being a good man and a loyal friend. And that was the problem. Jack saw all the things in his father that he didn't have in himself. There wasn't a single person from his time in the military that he kept up with. Pedro, his only employee, was his only friend. Fitting. When he glanced at the picture of his life and compared it to his father's, he came up lacking sorely. He kept working, kept pushing, for no other reason than to be at the bottom of some trench that they had to dig. He'd find the answer, the excuse he needed to give Olivia to get out of this place. Every minute he spent here shined a light on the old skeletons and dragged them grinning from a closet he thought he had locked forever. And when he was walking from the lodge to the truck or the truck to the commissioner's office, images were all around him. Comrades, his father, mistakes he had made, all rendered in invisible paint on the canvas of his life. One destined for a forgotten trash heap after he had left the earth for good. He had just finished lunch in his room. He wanted to nap, but figured that a nap was not why he was getting paid, so he went back to work. There was a piece of land he wanted to look at today that would make a decent recreational swimming hole. He was stepping outside when Olivia called from behind him. Jack, do you have a minute? He had managed to avoid her since their last conversation when she somehow convinced him to stay, his mind racing toward another excuse. I was heading out to take a look at the pond. What would Big Jack think of him now? It'll only take a minute, I promise, she said, turning to walk back into the lodge. He followed her with his stomach twisting in knots. Every step down the hallway felt like three feet closer to the gallows. When he got to her office, Olivia was writing something on a yellow legal pad. She ripped the paper off and handed it to him. There's someone I'd like for you to meet. You would, or our benefactor, Jack said, trying to keep the sarcasm from his tone. He didn't want to take the paper. Her errand was not something Jack needed right now. Just take it, Jack, Olivia said. He was a Marine, too, and yes, he's a friend of our benefactor. I think he might be able to provide you with a little, hmm, let's call it inspiration. Jack nodded, laughing to himself, because he knew that the last time he had inspiration it was when he'd left to join the Marines. Fine, he said, looking down at the paper and reading the name. He looked up at her. And this guy is... I think you'll find him to be a wealth of knowledge on the topic. He's waiting for your call. Please don't keep him waiting. He thanked her, and without another word, left, his mind on the pond. But why had her calm authority given way to passive reverence in the amount of time it took to scribble a name on a piece of paper? Who the hell was this guy? He took out the paper and read it again. Daniel Briggs? Chapter 23 Ricky, 1943. Lovejoy came too like he'd been slapped. The first thing to hit him was the pain in his forehead. He reached up and found wetness and pulled away a hand coated in his blood. Then he smelled smoke. Right, the truck. He'd seen it at the last possible second. 
He'd swerved as best he could, and his reflexes had saved his life. His own wreckage came into focus now through his shattered windshield. The hood was crumpled like a can of beans, and it was his open window that was letting in the smoke. He found the source immediately, the other truck, a 33 Ford. He tried to open the door, but it wouldn't budge. Stuck shut. He climbed out the window and placed his feet on level earth, taking a deep breath to steady the swoon. Hey, are you all right? He called out. No answer. The other truck was still running, and smoke was pouring from the hood. When he looked inside the cab, he found two boys. They couldn't have been more than 17 years old. Faces smashed, arms twisted in grotesque angles. For a minute, he was back there, back in the middle of the blood and the gore and the violent back and forth. But he quickly snapped out of it. He had never been one to fixate on the devastation of war. He reached over and turned off the truck. The smoke still billowed. With a little effort, he got the driver's door open and pulled the kid out, dragging him safely to a shade of trees. The passenger door wasn't as easy to open, and it took every straining muscle to get it. His muscles ached, and his head throbbed as he pulled the second kid out of the truck and lay him down next to his friend. Somehow, they were both still alive, however, barely. He had no idea what to do. He was too far from town, but he wasn't far from Lone Peak, so he ran, ignoring the pain, ignoring the fact that at any moment the boys might die. He had to get help. He reached Lone Peak Ranch out of breath and burst into the main cabin. Betsy was still sitting at the window and almost jumped out of her chair. You need to help me. Is there another truck? My God, Ricky, you're bleeding. I got hit. Two kids. I don't think they saw me. I don't know, but they're both unconscious. Betsy took a second to respond. There's the first aid kit in the kitchen closet, the pantry. If the cook is still here, we can borrow his truck. Lovejoy went to get the first aid kit and waited for Betsy outside. He hadn't seen the cook's truck, and sure enough, when Betsy returned, she said, He's gone for the day. A concentrated look came across her face. The horses. He shook his head. I've never ridden a horse. I can show you. It'll be okay. Betsy was all machine now. She showed him how to set the saddle, place the bridle, and then get on the horse. Do you think you can watch me, see what I do, she said. I can try, Lovejoy said. Just remember to hold on with your thighs. You got that? Ricky nodded, and they took off. The ride was jarring, but Ricky found some semblance of rhythm by the time they'd gotten back to the scene of the crash. The truck was still smoking. The boys were where he'd left them. Okay, Betsy said. You help lift one of them into your saddle first. Then we'll get the other one up in mine. We'll take it easy and go as fast as we can. Don't you think this might hurt them more? Ricky asked. Do you have a better idea? Between trying to stay on his horse himself and holding a limp body in place, it took every ounce of strength he had to keep going. When they finally reached the small hospital, luck found them. There was a pair of old policemen out on the stoop smoking cigarettes. There's been an accident, Betsy called out. They both looked up, cigarettes dangling from the sides of their mouths. When they saw the unconscious forms, they sprang into action. One man came to the horses. The other one went inside the hospital. Officer, Betsy said, her eyes on the limp body being hefted onto a stretcher by two stout orderlies. I'd like to go in with them if I may. I can give you a statement for both of us, Ricky said. The lead officer put two fingers to the brim of his cap. Go on, miss. Thank you, Betsy said with a quick breath, and followed on the heels of the orderlies. Ricky stayed and recounted the events for the officer, who jotted down every word, pausing now and again to lick the tip of his pencil. And you say you don't know those two boys? The one cop asked. Never seen them in my life, Ricky answered. The cop pursed his lips and jotted something down in a small notebook. Well, if they are who we think they are, 
This isn't their first time joy riding on the back roads. He pointed his pencil at Ricky's head. Say, you should really get that looked at, you know? Ricky had completely forgotten about the head injury, and for some reason, the reminder made his head throb. All right, sure. I'll go inside now. If there are any other questions, where can we find you? The cop asked. Lone Peak Ranch. Were you a soldier? No, a Marine. Ricky pointed at the Eagle Globe and Anchor insignia on his now soiled uniform. Right, Marine. Well, good luck in there. Ricky walked inside and asked the nurse at the reception desk where Betsy had gone. Are you okay, sir? The nurse asked. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm going to get checked out, too. Well, good, because your color doesn't look quite right. Ricky didn't explain that he'd just been in a wreck, went for a quick sprint, and then ridden a horse for the first time. It would be unnatural if his color wasn't off. He marched down the hallway in search of Betsy. He found her talking to a pair of nurses who seemed genuinely interested in what she had to say. She looked up as he approached. Are they okay? he asked. They're being evaluated now. Good. We should get back for lunch. Betsy looked at him. But it's almost dinner time. Sure, sure. We should go have breakfast. Her eyes widened into wells. Why was she looking at him like that? He felt lightheaded and looked around for a chair. Probably dehydrated. Maybe some salt pills would help. That's what the docs gave him in the field. Sergeant, are you okay? One of the nurses asked. Why don't we have the... Then all her words turned into a strange drone, like she was talking from the bottom of a barrel, or was it the other end of a tunnel? He felt like he was slipping. He heard someone calling a name. Ricky? Who's Ricky? Lovejoy? Funny name, that. Chapter 24 Betsy, 1943 The nurses pounced like they'd been waiting since dawn for Ricky to arrive. How long ago did he hit his head? One of them asked Betsy. I'm not sure. An hour, hour and a half? Two orderlies arrived and lifted Sergeant Lovejoy's body onto a gurney. The doctor appeared on their heels. What's going on? The nurse gave him a quick rundown as Betsy followed and Lovejoy was wheeled away. The doctor started examining, looking in Sergeant Lovejoy's eyes, checking his head. Probably a concussion. Are you his wife? No. I work at Lone Peak Ranch, Betsy said. The rehab place? That's the one. He asked no further questions, and when the entourage went through the next set of doors, Betsy was told to stay there. So she did, and she waited. Sergeant Lovejoy had been fine. Maybe it was the adrenaline rush. She had heard of such things. But what was it when the adrenaline was gone and the body petered out? She was no medical expert, but in her training at Yellowstone, they had talked about head trauma and how the brain could be shaken up from a grenade blast or a blow to the head. In the worst case, there could be internal bleeding, and that's the way her mind ran. Some time later, one of the nurses reappeared. I probably shouldn't tell you this because they haven't been able to find the parents yet, but one of the boys is dead. Oh, my, Betsy said. The nurse raised her hand like she knew what was coming. There's nothing you could have done. That's what the doctor said. Internal bleeding. The steering wheel crushed his ribs. It was only a matter of time. And the other boy? We won't know until he comes out of surgery. Betsy could see in the nurse's eyes that the prognosis was not good. And Sergeant Lovejoy? The doctor thinks that it's definitely a concussion. He'll need some stitches on that cut, and he'll probably need to stay here for a night or two to make sure he's stable. What if there's bleeding in his brain? We've managed to rule that out. When can I see him? Let me go check and make sure that he's decent. We had to cut his uniform off. It's standard procedure in a car wreck like this. The doctor wanted to make sure there weren't any other injuries that we could see. The nurse left, and Betsy clasped her hands before her, hoping. 
He was still unconscious, his head wrapped in a bandage, and the eye beneath the cut looked more swollen than the other. He got real lucky, you know, the nurse said. Seeing those boys and what you said about the trucks, well, I'd say it's a miracle. Betsy nodded. After a moment, the nurse cocked her head. Did I hear you say you work out at Lone Peak Ranch? I do, Betsy said. That's over by Lone Mountain, right? The base of it? It is. I'm new around here, and, well, I've heard some of the locals say there's a kind of magic over there. I've never been there myself, seen it plenty of times. Is there any truth to that? Betsy shook her head. Old Indian legend, maybe? The nurse shrugged. We had a patient in here some time ago going on and on about spirits and burning bushes. He must have been very sick. He was. He died later that night, but he kept going on about Lone Mountain, Lone Peak. First I've heard of it. Well, I was curious, was all. I guess it does sound pretty crazy. I'll leave you to it. Just poke your head out the door if you need anything. Betsy nodded, and the nurse left, leaving her alone with Sergeant Lovejoy. She had always seen him as so much older than what his file said, a man before his time. But now, lying in the bed, he looked like a young man barely out of high school. She brushed strands of his hair off the bandage. I'm sorry this happened to you, she said. There was no reply. She took his hand in hers and was grateful for the warmth in it. She could feel the heartbeat on his wrist. It had taken an extraordinary amount of strength for Lovejoy to run back to Lone Peak, get her, ride a horse, then ride a horse with a wounded man. It made her wonder what other gifts this brave man had. And as she sat on the edge of the bed, watching his chest rise and fall, she wondered if this was what her brother had endured, or if he quickly died. And when she thought of her brother, a strange calm came down on her, like hands settling on her shoulders. And she heard the words, I'm okay. She looked down at Sergeant Lovejoy's lips. They weren't moving. Then she looked at the open door. Nobody there. She thought of her brother, sweet, brave Joe, and she heard it again. I'm okay. The voice had come from the corner of the room, up near the ceiling, and she felt a light there, a shape she couldn't really describe, a force, a presence, a warmth that felt like love. Joe, she said in a plaintive voice. She thought that the light shifted and had become somehow warmer in its glow. It was a color she couldn't place. Then another set of words came to her. Take care of him. And the light faded, and she knew without a doubt in her soul that it had been Joe. She looked down at Sergeant Lovejoy. A tear fell from her eye onto his bandage. She vowed she would do everything she could to honor her brother's words. You're going to be okay, she said to him. And then she looked back up at the ceiling, tears streaming down her face. Thank you, Joe. I love you so much. Chapter 25 Jack, Present Day Mr. Peterson from the bank came and locked at the office. Hang on, Pedro. What are you talking about? His sole employee had been throwing a torrent of words in his direction and lapsing into Spanish for half of it. He locked it, Pedro said. The office? See, si, yes. Jack let the phone drop to his side as his shoulder succumbed to gravity and he closed his eyes and turned his head to the sky. His tiny office had once belonged to Big Jack when the old man was starting out. Now the furniture was old and yellowed pictures dotted the walls but it was a home for Jack's business, and he kept it as clean as he could manage with a small amount of pride. He lifted the phone back to his ear. Pedro was still rambling in and out of his native tongue. All right, Pedro. Pedro, hang on for a second. You there? I'm here. Okay, listen. He's got a right to do it. 
We owe and we can't pay, and he's got a right. What do you want me to do? You have your things? I do. Good. Rest easy and I'll take care of it. For the time being, I'm going to send you some money to make sure you're okay. Sound good? I can help. I can work more. Pedro already worked more than Jack paid him for, and it was always on the sly. An extra half hour slipped in here, an extra job done there. Jack knew, and much to his embarrassment, now understood that it was his own self-absorption that allowed Pedro to get away with not being paid his worth. He was going to do the right thing now, even if that meant giving every last dime, every last possession to his loyal employee. No, just hang tight. I'll call the bank today and get this figured out, okay? Okay. He ended the call and stood outside with the sun beating down on him. The fact that he couldn't enjoy it made his breath come sharp through his nose. Money. It was always about money. It's what made the world go round, but it was also what made emperors flare, rains come crashing down, ripping lives apart. What was it about money that had such power over man, woman, and child? He doubted he would ever have the answer. He looked at his watch. It was too late to call the bank. There was nothing he could do now, nothing, that is, except to get back to work. At some point in the afternoon, he got the tingling sense that he was being watched. Could be an animal, could be a person. You never knew out here in the wilderness. Sure enough, an hour later, a man strode into the clearing. Jack had been walking, measuring as he went. The man had blonde hair tied back in a ponytail and walked as if he was one with the landscape. If Jack didn't know any better, he would have thought the man emerged out of his surroundings like a mist. He barely made a sound as he moved. Hello, Jack. The way he looked at Jack, the way his eyes saw through him, was uncanny. I'm Jack Moses, he said uneasy at his own awkwardness. The man came close and stuck out a hand. Daniel Briggs, it's good to meet you, Jack. I've heard a lot about you. It was getting close to dark. The sun did its quiet descent in the west, a brilliant orange smudge draped over the horizon. The man called Daniel Briggs seemed to shimmer in the late afternoon light, like a shadow cast by a candle. That couldn't be right. Jack's eyes had to be playing tricks. Hello, yes, I've been, uh, expecting you. The man looked around and smiled. Nice place you've got here. I think it is. Briggs turned his smiling face to him. Well? Well what? Any questions? There was a hint of a chuckle in his voice. I'm sure you have them. Jack couldn't help but feel at peace with the man, the way one does with strangers in dreams. Well, what is it exactly that you do, Mr. Briggs? How about we start with you calling me Daniel, the man said, his voice a balm. To answer your question, I do this and that. But I think we have a lot in common. Such as? Briggs took another look around. We both like fresh air. Jack couldn't help but feel stunted, having stifled the suggestion that they go back to the lodge. I've got dinner cooking, Briggs said with a gesture. Why don't you join me? With this, he turned and began walking back toward the direction from which he'd come. Jack's own stubbornness dictated that he ought to refuse the offer. Why did he feel so compelled to follow this stranger, who suddenly seemed as though he wasn't a stranger at all? He followed Daniel Briggs as they meandered around a pond, through trees, over hills, and finally onto a ridge. The final rays of sunlight showed them the way. Just ahead, there was a fire crackling. A couple of camps were situated on opposite sides. I hope you like chili, Daniel said. Jack nodded, at a loss for words. Everything was so still, the only sound being the crackling fire and an occasional thump from the pot sitting directly on the logs, chili bubbling inside it. Have a seat, Daniel said. 
and then he used a stick to pull a thing wrapped in aluminum foil out of the edge of the fire. Daniel opened it gingerly, revealing grilled cornbread. He handed a piece to Jack. It's my friend's recipe. Master Sergeant Willie Trent. Best chef I've ever met. The cornbread was hot, so Jack gave it a minute, moving it from hand to hand until it was cooled, then took a bite. He was right. It was good. As good as any cornbread he'd had in the South. Then Daniel produced a bottle of water for each, two bowls, and began ladling chili into them. He handed Jack a bowl and a spoon, and they ate in silence. Jack knew that he would not soon forget this memory, eating cornbread with a bottle of water in the shadow of Lone Mountain. Were they the last two men on earth? They both had extra helpings in continued silence. Jack realized that Daniel Briggs was one of those people who you could spend time with, never say a word, yet feel as comfortable as a summer weekend with your grandparents. Like the hand of the universe had reached down, touched Jack on the shoulder, and told him to be still. And he was. He ate and he smelled every smell and heard every twitch of the wild around him. He recalled those first words from Buster. This place was magic. That was it, exactly how this felt. Like magic. A bit of the magic slipped when Daniel asked, Tell me why you're here, Jack. Jack's natural inclination would have been to respond with a bit of sarcasm. Why, it seems I took a wrong turn at Albuquerque. But he sensed that Daniel wanted to know the real answer why he was here. Not sitting by this campfire. Not even why he was here in Montana. Why he was here on Earth at this exact moment in time. I don't know, he answered after a moment. Daniel nodded and took a sip of water. And you're the only one that's left, correct, in your family? I am. Me too, Daniel said. Olivia says you've had some hesitation, that you probably have some questions about what's going on here. Jack perked up at that. Maybe this Daniel Briggs was the mysterious benefactor. With his outdoor gear and the nonchalant way that he seemed to walk through life, he didn't look like a billionaire. Maybe it was the confidence that Daniel had. I've got questions, Jack said. And then the thing that had been bothering him since stepping foot in Montana came out unbidden. I think they got the wrong man for the job. I don't think I'm qualified to do this, to be here. I'm, well, I'm not good enough. You wouldn't be here if you weren't, Jack. No offense, Daniel but you don't really know me. And you think that if I knew you better, I'd tell Olivia you weren't qualified to be here? Jack shrugged. I understand, Daniel said. I understand. Two words that so many people said throughout the course of a lifetime, times that Jack heard it since his father had died, since his hero had passed and left him all alone. I understand. And only now, it sounded different coming out of Daniel's mouth. And Jack knew that he did understand. This man staring at him with such raw compassion knew what real pain was. Jack could not say how he knew this to be so. All he could say for sure was that this notion came to him. Just as smoke came off the flames in the campfire, so pure empathy came off Daniel Briggs. How do you understand, Jack said desperate to know. Daniel smiled and said, Let me tell you a little bit about my story, Jack, and maybe you'll see that you are not alone. Psst. If you want more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 26 Jack The ponytailed man stared at the fire for a moment as if picturing his tail there within the flickering flames. He had a look of peace on his face. Then he looked at Jack and began. I was what you might call a lost soul. I spent years wandering, getting into trouble, doing the right thing occasionally, simply focusing on putting one foot in front of the other. I can't tell you how many places I went 
or how many people I met. I won't bore you with all the details because they don't matter. What I can say is, I finally hit my rock bottom, the place where I was so empty and so devoid of any connection to this world that there was no place else to go but up or die. He paused to let that sink in. I'm not here to preach to you, Jack. Hopefully we'll get to know each other, and you'll soon find that that's not my style. The point is, it's okay to be a little clueless, even a lot clueless. We knucklehead marines need to get it through our skulls that it's okay to ask for help. To go to your brother and say, I'm not okay. They educate us well in the Corps, don't they? Teach us to be tough. Teach us how to kill. They even teach us to be compassionate. Let me ask you something. Did they ever teach you that even the hardest warrior can be broken? Or that it takes more than self-will to get better? It's on us to learn that it takes the love of a family, wherever you can find it, to get better. Why they leave that little bit of learning up to us may be the biggest mystery of all. But I have a hunch that it's the nature of the beast not to allow a Marine to realize that being human can wreck you in battle. You have to be something beyond human. You have to turn off that part of you that weeps for humanity. Daniel paused. A church-like silence was thick in the air around them. Even the spitting of the campfire seemed to heed the solemnity of the moment. Jack, if I can have you walk away with one thing, it's that once you open your heart to another, life will change. And yes, it can happen overnight. Open up to another soul or to a higher power. Life will change, Jack. Jack nodded thoughtfully at the flames, marveling at the fact that Briggs had descended into the darkness and somehow come out of it glowing. You're probably thinking that nobody will understand your situation, Daniel continued. That circumstances that swirl around your life affect only you. When I cuddled up with my bottle of whiskey, I used to tell myself that it wasn't hurting anyone else but me. I had to learn that this life of ours is interconnected in ways we will never understand. Every good thing you've ever done, Jack, ripples out into the world. It's okay to relish those moments when we put pure good out into the world, because once we do that, recognize it, and understand that that's why we're here, we do it more. Hopefully we keep doing it, and never forget that lesson. Daniel chuckled then. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe you'll walk away from this conversation thinking that this pony-tailed nut must have fallen off the wagon and rolled down the hill, hitting every rock along the way. Jack shook his head. I don't doubt anything that you said, but it feels like the universe threw me under a big wet blanket, and I can't seem to throw it off or see through it. It keeps weighing me down. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Daniel said. For me, it was like somebody had strapped me into the heaviest chainmail armor in the world. All I could do was step forward an inch at a time. Most days, it felt like I made no forward progress at all. All I really wanted to do was lie down. Jack knew that exact feeling. In fact, most days, he felt like he was moving backward. Collectors closing in guilt from the past, hooking his neck and pulling it deep into some dark ocean. All I'm asking you to do, Jack, is have a little faith. That doesn't have to be a faith in God. Maybe simply faith in yourself or in this beautiful place. And while you're at it, maybe you can put a little of that faith in your fellow man. Or a loved one dead and gone, Jack said, one who gave you everything that you will ever need. He didn't know where this insight had come from. It felt given to him. He felt as though Briggs had offered it to him on a line directly connected to his heart. But that was impossible, wasn't it? Use that peace, Daniel said. That surety that everything is going to be okay. How do I get it? Daniel smiled. Jack, I can't tell you how full my life is because of the people I've helped and the friends I've made. That all happened because I opened myself to the possibility that I'm not perfect. 
I need help from my friends as much as they need help from me. You can't go it alone, Jack. Life just plain sucks if you go it alone. Daniel rose and began gathering his things. Olivia knows how to contact me. If you ever need anything, don't hesitate to call. So many questions that Jack wanted to ask, but his thoughts wouldn't coalesce into anything coherent. Thanks, he said. It was sufficient. The fire extinguished. The two men shook hands and departed. Jack walked along the solemn trail, enveloped by night, feeling that for a moment he had come into contact with someone that had been touched by a divine hand. If Daniel Briggs had gone down the dark path that he said he had, then maybe there was hope for Jack Moses. There had to be. Hope was what he so desperately needed. Chapter 27 Betsy, 1943 The doctor released Sergeant Lovejoy to Betsy's care, and they returned to Lone Peak Ranch to settle into their new routine. Lovejoy was stoic to a fault, never complaining. But Betsy saw him wince again and again, so she was careful to suggest little things here and there and not be too overt about it, lest his pride be damaged. The first day back, they spent sitting in matching rockers on the porch, sipping lemonade, and for once, really talking. Betsy told Sergeant Lovejoy about growing up in New York City, how she loved going to the movies, cartoons, a newsreel, a double feature, and a raffle, all for a quarter, and how one time she and her brothers had been kicked out for having a popcorn fight. You should have seen the look on my father's face, she said. He made us go back and personally apologize to the owner and the entire staff. After that, it was almost a year before we went back there. Lovejoy, in turn, told her about Paris Island and all the screaming and silly games, but that all of it had a purpose. We complain about it when we're going through it. I know I did. Even if it wasn't out loud, I was saying it in my head. Even when we get to the fleet, we're still complaining about our drill instructors. But that automatic compliance saved more Marines than we'll probably ever know. Can you explain that to me? I guess I don't really understand, Betsy said. Lovejoy nodded and took a second to find the words. They tell us from day one, from the moment we step onto the recruit depot, that the enemy wants to kill us. They do anything they can to shock and scare us. You say, yes, sir, and you move along and nod your head. But all the while, you're a kid full of piss and vinegar, and you think you could take on a battalion of Nazis all by yourself. Hell, while we were on the ships on our way across the Pacific, we were talking about those bucktooth bastards that we were going to kill. We thought it would be an easy win. I remember the lieutenant trying to tell us that the Japanese were fierce warriors, that their ancient code made them fight to the death. But that sounded like nonsense to us. So we got into that first fight, and we were well trained, mind you. But no amount of training prepares you for the noise and the thunderclap shock that comes with battle. When you're scared out of your mind, the habits those sadistic drill instructors have drilled into you really start to work. Somebody yells for you to hold the line, you hold the line. Somebody yells for you to move forward, you move forward. Somebody says they're out of ammunition, you find some or you keep firing or both. It's habit. I think I understand now. Thank you for explaining, Betsy said. Sergeant Lovejoy laughed. I felt like I was rambling there for a second. I never put it into words before. It's hard to describe. You did just fine, Betsy said. And he had. She wondered if many professors and high muckety-mucks could describe it as simply as Sergeant Lovejoy had. She reached across the space between them and placed her hand on top of his. She felt him wince, but she was pretty sure it wasn't a wince. It was, well, she felt it too, a little shock. She ignored it or at least tried to. Will you teach me, she said, you know, the things they taught you at Paris Island and when you got to your unit? Sure, I guess. Why would you want me to do that? Betsy looked at him gravely, for she understood now what she'd been missing. They're going to send more soon, I know it, she said. 
and I'd like to know where you're coming from. They wouldn't let me enlist, so it's not like I can get hands-on experience. I'd appreciate it, I really would, if you could show me. This he mulled over. She kept her hand on top of his. Then he nodded and said, If you think it would help. It would, it really would, she was quick to say. Then she released his hand. She was pretty sure before she turned away that his face flushed like hers. They started the next morning. He asked the chef for some pots and pans, but when Betsy asked what they were for, he merely raised a finger as if to say it would be revealed in due time. And he taught her how to stand at attention, how to right face, left face, and about face, and then in an even cadence he marched her from one building to the barracks. Once inside, he had her halt and put her at ease. Then he explained how a bed, or a rack as he called it, was supposed to be made, corners tucked in military precision. They always told us this should be so tight that a quarter could bounce off of it. Well, I never tried that, but there. Now you try it. When she was finished, Lovejoy nodded. Excellent. Now, you ready? Uh, ready for what? Lovejoy picked up the pots and pans and started banging them together, yelling like a banshee. It shocked her at first, but then she smiled and had to bite her lip from laughing. What are you laughing at, Karamati? Lovejoy bellowed. But she could see that he was having fun with it, too. He made her march back and forth down the barrack center. Then he stripped the rack that she'd made and made her redo it, all the while making all the noise, stomping all around. And inside... She was giggling the whole time, though she wanted to do it because she wanted to learn, and she was coming to realize she wanted to do it for him. There, he said. Now you know how to make a rack. He was back to his calm self, his voice slightly hoarse. Phew, I don't know how those drill instructors do it. I couldn't, not for weeks at a time. What else? Betsy asked. Well, they used to make us march around naked in the shower, but... She gasped and put a hand to her mouth. He stopped, his mouth hanging open, his face red. And for some reason, the thought of him racing her through the showers naked stirred something. But she laughed out loud to make him regain his composure, and they both laughed. I guess that would be inappropriate, he said. They decided, without saying so, that they'd move past the subject. Next. They sat on opposing beds, and he explained how meals were eaten in the chow hall, how they were given a limited amount of time, and if you didn't figure out how to eat fast, you didn't get to eat. There were more stories. The close order drill they would do anywhere and everywhere. The weapons training. The physical fitness. I probably shouldn't say this, he said, but I think it might help. War is not the only place that you lose people. We had one kid lose his grip on the rope and fall straight down onto his head. I'm pretty sure he died before he even knew what had happened. Then there was this other guy. I think he was from Chicago or maybe Cincinnati. He decided he had had enough, so he tried to swim his way off the island. I don't think they ever heard from him again. At the time, it didn't seem real, you know? Almost like they faked it so that they could see how we'd react but I've seen enough death now to know that the kid that fell off the rope was dead, alive and kicking one minute, ragdoll dead the next. There I go again, wandering down the trail you don't want me to go. No, really, I do. I was serious when I said I wanted you to tell me everything. He shrugged and they continued. And the rest of the morning he showed her how to low crawl, how to zig and zag across the battlefield to elude enemy fire. By the time lunch rolled around, they were both sweaty and starving. While they once again ate cold-cut sandwiches on the porch rocking chairs, Lovejoy said, Okay, now it's your turn. My turn? Sure. I showed you what I went through. How about we spend the afternoon doing all the things that you've been trying to get me to do since I got here? You know, riding horses, taking walks, enjoying nature? Oh, right. And that's how they spent the afternoon, an hour-long walk, where Betsy pointed out flora and fauna that she'd discovered. She showed him her favorite sitting spot, 
overlooking a gurgling creek, the sounds of birds all around them. Then they moved on to the horses. Your last ride was rather impromptu, Betsy said. So let me walk you through step by step. Step by step they went, Lovejoy listening the entire time. He would sometimes ask something like, What does this thing do? if Betsy hadn't pointed it out. He would grunt, and she could see that he would digest it, stash it away, knowing he would not forget. And then they spent the rest of the afternoon on one of, if not the most enjoyable rides Betsy had ever had. She thought that coming out alone was the bee's knees. But even though occasionally she would point something out, or Lovejoy would ask something, mostly they rode in silence. It felt like this place was theirs, this world was theirs, and Betsy found herself wishing that it would never end, that they could stay here in this place forever. And that was pretty much the routine for the next couple of days. Either Lovejoy would have a lesson to give, or Betsy would have a question about how the Marines were trained, or what it was like to be on a ship. I couldn't stand being below decks, he would say. Too many smelly feet. And the afternoons were always the same. Each day, they would get quieter and quieter. The magic of Lone Mountain had them fully entranced now. And as the days went on, they left earlier and earlier, both eager to be back with nature. It was on the fifth day of their new adventures, as Lovejoy was saddling up the horses, that a military jeep came down the drive. There'd been no word, so Betsy assumed it was a random visit and felt lucky she'd just cleaned up the place. She assumed that it was Mr. Miles, but it wasn't. A sailor was driving, and another sailor was in the passenger seat. When the jeep came to a stop in front of the barracks, the passenger hopped out, grabbed the sea bag from the back, and tipped his head to the driver. The sailor was well over six feet, with a face like granite and a smirk that seemed permanently plastered there. He flashed a smile at Betsy. Seaman Cosgrove for reporting as ordered, ma'am. She walked down the steps and extended her hand. Welcome to Lone Peak Ranch, she said. Their eyes met, and it was everything Betsy could do not to look away. They were still holding hands, but this didn't feel like a quiet moment with Sergeant Lovejoy. Even though Seaman Cosgrove was handsome and looked every bit the movie star he probably could be, something about the way he appraised her made her shiver. She let go of his hand. Follow me, and I'll show you where you can put your things. With this, she led the way. She couldn't shake the feeling that he had never stopped ogling her, and she could not know that her peace, already tenuous, would soon be shattered. Chapter 28 Ricky, 1943 Lovejoy wasn't selfish enough to think that he would have Lone Peak Ranch to himself forever, but he had gotten to the point where he felt comfortable here, where thoughts of running back to his unit weren't the first thing on his mind. He'd come to love the feel of a horse under him, the perfect beauty and balance, the strength that was almost incomprehensible to a mere human. So when Cosgrove arrived, Sergeant Lovejoy tried to be nice. What do you say, Sarge? Cosgrove had said by way of greeting. They call me Cosgrove, or Cause for short. You take your pick. The man looked like he could wield a Browning automatic rifle with one hand. Good to meet you, Cosgrove. Why don't you let me show you around the place? To be honest, I'd rather have that sweet little dish out there show me around, but you'll do fine, Sarge. But I don't kiss on the first date. They went on their quick tour. Say, Sarge... What is the story with that little tomato anyway? Not sure, Ricky said. Think she'll date me? Kitchen's through this door. Cook's not here now. Well now, what do you say we go in and find ourselves a belt? There was no need for Lovejoy to tell Cosgrove of his own drinking incident, so he went with... They frown on drinking around here. No kidding. Well, it's a good thing I brought some of my own. When Cosgrove unpacked the sea bag, Lovejoy could see nearly every article of clothing had a bottle of some sort wrapped in it. I promised my friends that I would drink a few for them, you know, 
in their memory. As you can see, I got a hell of a lot of friends. Which ship did you say you were stationed on? Lovejoy asked. It's one you've probably never heard of, Cosgrove said. East Coast or West Coast? Both. And right then and there, Lovejoy knew he would have to keep an eye on Seaman Cosgrove. They ate dinner together, he, Betsy, and Cosgrove, their newest addition, who added a splash of his liquor stash to each glass of iced tea that he poured. By the time dinner was finished, Cosgrove was laughing through tales from high school, how he'd taken them to two straight state titles. And that's in Texas, you know, he said. We've got some big boys down there, but look at me. I'm bigger than most. Tougher, too. He flexed his bicep as if the demonstration was needed. Lovejoy kept peeking over at Betsy to see what her reactions would be. It seemed like none of it was phasing her. Not a single sign that she was being taken in by this fraud. Indeed, he knew it to be true. Cosgrove was a total and complete fraud. How he'd gotten here was a puzzle for a greater mind, but Ricky was sure that Cosgrove had gotten here by lying, cheating, stealing, or all of the above. By the time Lovejoy closed his eyes that night, he'd made a decision to get rid of the guy. But when he had the conversation with Betsy the next morning as they brushed down the horses and told her about the discrepancies in Cosgrove's story, she did not go along with his plan. They wouldn't send him here unless he needed to be here. You don't understand, Betsy. He wouldn't even tell me what ship he was stationed on. I think we should give him the benefit of the doubt. He tried to explain it to her another way, but she brushed him off again. It's my job to make sure he's taken care of, Betsy said. Can't you understand that? It wasn't the words. It was the way she said it to him, like he was only another patient in a crazy person's ward. It got worse. That afternoon, when he tried to invite her out for a ride, she declined, saying that she needed to spend time with Seaman Cosgrove, too. That was about enough. Lovejoy's already fragile state turned to anger and resentment. He took off on his own and rode for the entire afternoon, thinking that maybe Lone Mountain would calm his rage. It didn't. The distance from Lone Peak Ranch only seemed to heighten the concern, deepen his doubts. At least by the time he got back, his body was exhausted enough that he knew he could sleep. What he needed was a good meal, a shower, and then he'd close his eyes. When he arrived back at the ranch and went to check in with Betsy and the cook, he found Cosgrove and Betsy on the porch. They were speaking quietly, and they were close. Too close for Ricky's comfort. She's not yours, you fool. And she wasn't. So what the hell was he thinking? He skipped dinner, took a shower, and went to bed. Pleasant sleep did not come. The dreams that swirled around him that night were of Seaman Cosgrove with his arms wrapped around a naked Betsy. And they were both smiling as if they'd found their meaning of life and that he, Sergeant Ricky Lovejoy, was no longer needed. And for the second time in as many months, Lovejoy counted himself among the refuse of the universe. Psst! Give this author some love by clicking subscribe. Chapter 29 Sadie, Present Day She tried to forget about her father's visit by staying busy. She mucked stalls, fed the horses, rode them, brushed them. Sadie went to every contact that she could think of to try to drum up business, but no one was biting. There was a couple that had somehow found her, but they didn't even give her a tip after the tour. She had to get a website up and running to help with advertising. Apparently, all the planning she'd done had been woefully inadequate. Reserves were dwindling and would be gone in a couple of months, not a full year like she'd planned. But she got up every morning and took one of the horses for a ride to see the sunrise. Even when it was raining and she couldn't see the sun, she could feel it out there. That was her gift. That was her joy for the day. There was mail from her father that she ignored. 
she deleted voicemails without answering. And then one morning, the worst possible thing happened. She had a bowl full of carrots for the horses and was eager to see which one would behave the best, and that's the one she would take for the ride. Only when she got to the paddock, she found it was open. The horses were gone. Frantic, Sadie jumped in her truck and drove all around the surrounding area. Nothing. The horses were gone. She did something that her mother had taught her to do in times of mental stress. She parked the truck, closed her eyes and breathed, willing away the anxiety. And even though it didn't entirely work, it at least slowed her heartbeat enough that she could start thinking. Someone had come and taken the horses. But wouldn't she have heard them? She then did something she was keen to do in moments of uncertainty. She put herself in her father's shoes. Even though she had come to despise him, he was an expert at details. She had often heard from detectives that Raymond Crawford could have been a detective himself. She pretended to be like her father, eschewing emotions, and examined the scene of the crime. She found wide treads, a truck not her own. Looking further, she saw that the truck had been pulling a trailer and surmised the exact spot where the horses had been loaded. Someone had come. Someone had taken them right out from under her nose. Stupid. She really believed that this was a safe place, a haven. A neighbor would never steal from a neighbor. She needed to be strong. Who could she call? She didn't know anyone except for maybe the checkout lady at the grocery store or the owner of the tiny restaurant where she liked to get burgers. She'd have to go back. She'd have to get a job. She'd have to tell her father what a failure she'd been. No, she couldn't do that. The breathing exercise wouldn't work this time. A panic attack was coming. She had had one as a teenager and then put her on medication. That was after the divorce. She had hated the feeling. She vowed never to go back to that. And here she was on the verge of freaking out, heart racing, palms sweaty, going light. Then she thought of it. She did know someone. She needed to call Jack. Chapter 30 Jack he could feel the sizzle of panic in her when he arrived. They took all three horses. I don't know what I'm going to do. All my money is tied up in this place. What am I going to do, Jack? The composed woman that he had met and taken to dinner was gone. Hold on, he said. Walk me through it step by step. He talked slowly so that maybe she might do the same. She took a deep breath and proceeded to tell him everything she'd done the night before and how she hadn't heard a thing. I woke up, I came outside, and they were gone. They were just gone, Jack. What am I going to do? What Jack wanted to ask her was, Why did you call me? He was no private eye, no Sherlock Holmes in work boots and a flannel shirt. Did you call the police? he asked. It was a stupid question. Of course she must have called the police. No, I called you first. Why? Well, what if it's a local? What if police are on this crook's payroll? Jack bit his tongue before he could laugh. Sadie, listen. This isn't Podunk, Alabama, trust me. I've been through Podunk, Alabama plenty of times. This is Big Sky, Montana. From everything I've seen, minus that creep at the bar, this is a good town with good people. I highly doubt that the police condone thievery, especially of horses. They take that pretty seriously around here. Jack didn't know why, but it felt like something was missing, like she wasn't telling him the entire story. He took a breath and scoured the area, eyes open for any sort of clue. His trained eye noticed plenty of work that needed to be done. The fencing was close to falling apart, and there were more than a few shingles on the roof that needed to be fixed. Even one of the windows was cracked. Better fix that before winter, he thought, as he took it all in with a discerning eye, 
trying to figure out what he was going to say to Sadie. He heard a growl from the end of the drive and then a sound of breaking glass. Jack was barely able to make out a truck speeding away, right past the truck he had parked at the end of the drive. They both ran to the truck, Jack careful to keep Sadie behind him. He was afraid of no man, but it would have been nice to have some kind of weapon on him. The speeding truck never returned. All they found was a shattered back window of the Lone Peak truck and a brick inside the cab wrapped with a piece of paper. On it was barely legible handwriting. Get out of here. We don't want your kind. I don't understand, Sadie said. Who would do this? This couldn't be the whole picture. There was a piece missing, and Jack knew it. He wasn't really concerned about the window of the truck. It could be fixed. Sadie and her livelihood, well, that was a different story. Jack felt more than a compulsion to help her. He felt like it was his responsibility, his duty. But there was something that Sadie wasn't telling him. Something that she was trying to hide on her panicked face. Sadie, he said at last. What really happened before the horses were taken? Chapter 31 Sadie Why was he pressing? Jack, I swear I don't know. I don't know anybody here. I don't know why they would take my things, why they would break your windshield. I'll pay for that, by the way. I want to make sure that whoever did this to you is caught. Jack had taken the piece of paper back and was holding it up in the air. That's when Sadie saw it, scribbled in the bottom right-hand corner. She snatched the piece of paper and read, Tonight at seven, and there's an address. Recognize it? No clue. What do you think this means? I don't know. She could tell he was going to press her. He had to believe her. Thankfully, he didn't press. Here, he said. Give me your hand. What? Why? You're shaking. She held her hand up. It was shaking. In fact, her whole body was in tremors. Come on, he said. We need to get you inside. You need to sit down, take a deep breath. I'll get you a glass of water. I don't want water, Jack. I want my horses. His face was calm. Come on. I'll help you take care of this, I promise. The note, she said. What about the note? What are we going to do about it? And that's when the heat that was in his eyes grew a fire she hadn't seen before. Don't worry about the note, he said. I'll take care of that. And for some unfathomable reason, she believed him. She followed as he led her inside. And he told her what he had planned. Chapter 32 Ricky, 1943 So I was wondering, he said, catching her in the midst of darning a rather large hole in her nylons. Oh, I am so sorry. He spun on his heel away from her. She let out a giggle. Silly, they're just nylons. Well, he said sheepishly, it's improper nonetheless. He heard her fidgeting for a moment, likely tucking them away in her sewing box. You can turn around now, she said. I've disposed of the nasty things. He turned to face her. I'm sorry. It's just that I was raised... Rising to return the sewing box to its rightful place atop the dressing room bureau, she held up her hand. I know, in Victorian England. This is 1943, Sergeant Lovejoy. You're allowed to set eyes on nylons. Yes, well, I was wondering uh, if we could maybe talk a bit, maybe on a short walk. Talk about what? His mouth had suddenly gone dry, and he licked his lips. Uh, just about things. We haven't talked in a while. She cocked her head and smiled a mouthful of feigned sympathy. I'm a little busy, Ricky. Maybe some other time? Sure, he said quickly, not wanting to press it. 
Cosgrove entered, brushing past Ricky like a crop duster. Hey, dollface. How's the weather down there? Her face brightened at his entrance. Hello yourself. Say, dollface, I need a favor. What's a guy got to do around here to get a letter mailed? Her mouth crooked into a devious smile. You pay the piper. Shifting his weight to one leg, Cosgrove folded his arms. What's the piper's going rate? You have to say please and thank you. Come on, dollface. You have to have higher standards than that. Them's the rules for now, sailor. Well then, would you be so kind as to direct me to the post office, milady, please? With pleasure, she said. Anything to get you from my sight. Ricky chewed his cheek for a moment. How long had this been going on? It's her job, he told himself, to little consolation. He felt like an idiot. It was to be a solo walk today. That was just fine. He started down the winding path so often traversed by Betsy and him. It was at a certain moment, perhaps a quarter of a mile in, where everything around him came alive. He felt suddenly tethered to the world and to every heartbeat of every animal and every trickle of the nearby stream. He became aware of every sprout of grass and every blade of the pines. It was not unlike the feeling he'd felt in the middle of battle that he had described to Betsy. So strange, so connected to it all. The slightest noise that no one else heard, he heard. That feeling of imminent danger. On the lower paths of Lone Mountain, the peak seemed to pierce the air with that tingling sense, and he stopped in the middle of the trail, and there, ambling toward him, was a great grizzly. It stopped and stared at him, chuffing and sniffing at the air. It had gashes long since scarred over on its face and hindquarters. This one was a fighter. You're like me, Ricky said to the hulking animal. Its ears perked, and even though the beast outweighed him by untold pounds, Ricky Lovejoy was not afraid. And for some reason he said, Go in peace, brother. The bear gave him one last sniff and walked away. How strange that feeling. But then he thought of Betsy and Cosgrove, and the wonder washed from his senses, and the anger returned. Now he sprinted until his lungs felt like they would burst, and he stopped at the top of the rise, hands to his knees, breathing heavily. The man has changed places with the bear. Why am I here? he asked the world, hearing his own voice become absorbed into the stones. There was no answer. After catching his breath, he walked on, determined to put Betsy and Cosgrove out of his mind. She didn't belong to him, so what was the problem? The problem was, he had felt that peace, that connection, that belonging in those days when it had been her and him. But instead of mulling over the after-effects of disconnection, he walked on until he was sure that if he didn't turn back, darkness would swallow him, and he'd be left out in the wild. Serves me right, he said to himself. He walked back to Lone Peak Ranch with not one problem solved. When he entered the barracks, Cosgrove was sitting on his bunk bare-chested, drinking straight from a bottle of whiskey. Hello, Sarge. What do you say, Cosgrove? Just enjoying a session with my good friend, the head shrinker here, he said with a waggle of the bottle. Good for you. Care for a swig? No, thank you. Doesn't cost nothing. I said I'm good with it. And then to the bathroom, taking his time, hoping by the time he came out, Cosgrove would be gone. But he wasn't. Hey, Sarge, how about you and I hit the town? I hear there's a little place that might have some pretty ladies. What do you say? I think I'm going to get some dinner and hit the rack. Suit yourself, Father Flanagan. There was no malice whatsoever in Cosgrove's tone and Lovejoy could even see how the man possessed a kind of superficial charm that would have passed well in a corner bar with dim lighting. But even still, Lovejoy found himself wanting to shatter several ounces of nose cartilage. When dinner time came around, 
Lovejoy was relieved to find that Cosgrove had hitched a ride into town with the cook. It was now the two of them. How was your day? Betsy asked. Fine. I saw you went for a walk. It was a beautiful day for it. Uh-huh, he said, cramming a huge piece of steak in his mouth. It was a calculated move. Maybe if she saw that he was too busy eating, she would stop talking. He found it very hard to make eye contact. Is everything okay? she said, her fork still against her plate. Never better, he said through his chewed meat. Because we haven't really talked. He shrugged and stabbed a potato with his fork. She let him be, and they finished dinner in silence. She said she'd do the dishes, and he didn't offer to help, not this time. What he wanted was to go to sleep and forget everything. Maybe he'd sleep until his orders came through, when he could leave and be free of her. But when he did go to bed, he tossed and turned. And when Cosgrove came stomping in, Lovejoy glanced at his watch and saw that it was close to three in the morning. Sorry, didn't mean to wake you, Sarge, Cosgrove said, slurring and teetering a bit to the right. It's okay, I couldn't sleep anyway, Lovejoy said. How was town? Removing his uniform blouse, Cosgrove shook his head sloppily. Ah, uh, it's a ghost town out there. Pure tumbleweed. Maybe it'll be better tomorrow. Say, you're welcome to join me. Yeah, sure, that might be nice. Listen, I'm going to go to the kitchen and see if they've got any milk. Can I get you anything? Hey, that'd be great. How about bringing me some leftovers from dinner? I'm starving. Cosgrove was a prolific eater. With his size, it was no wonder. Sure, no problem. Ricky fetched his own milk. He thought once about warming it up, never having tried it before, but skipped the task altogether. He didn't understand the purpose of it anyway. He put a heaping helping of steak and potatoes on a plate and brought it back to the barracks. When he returned, Cosgrove was sprawled on his back, already snoring. Lovejoy chuckled and set the plate of food on the bunk next to Cosgrove. The sailor did not move a muscle. Lovejoy looked at the sleeping form and shook his head. He was a big lunkhead with a lot of bravado, but there was a heart under there somewhere, one that ached for companionship as much as anyone. When Ricky rose the next morning, he was in better spirits. He put some of his anger behind him and even joked with Cosgrove when he finally woke up. Cosgrove wasn't such a bad guy after all. And that morning after breakfast, Ricky went for a ride. And though he wished that Betsy would have come with him, she had been absent for breakfast, he still enjoyed it. Something about that magic again, the connectedness to the place. It was lunch by the time he got back, and he took care of the horse hastily because he was starving. He was walking around the building when he saw them. Cosgrove's hands were wrapped around Betsy's backside, their faces plastered together. And before he knew what he was doing, Ricky Lovejoy turned around and walked the opposite way. The walk became a run. Chapter 33 Betsy, 1943 She finally pushed away from Cosgrove and slapped him in the face. Whoa, hey, he said. Don't you touch me, she said, jabbing a finger at him. He raised his hands in the air. Hey, dollface, I thought, and don't call me dollface, sailor. Don't call me sailor, civilian. Listen, I thought you wanted it. I didn't mean... Never mind, Betsy said, shaking her head and waving a dismissive hand. I have to get to work. She returned to her busy work catching a side glimpse of Cosgrove throwing his hands up in defeat and sauntering away. She tried to fall into her work, but busy work only affords one more time to think, not less. Her mind kept running through possibilities. Had she opened that door for Cosgrove? What had she done? She tried to entertain the idea that it might have been a horny sailor coming on to her. That idea didn't stick. She thought it was her fault, because it was her nature to take responsibility. That was something that her father had ingrained in her at an early age. Even though she could be mischievous sometimes, 
She always stood up to the punishment and always admitted when she had done something wrong. But this one, she couldn't let go. No, it hadn't been her fault. She had not come on to Seaman Cosgrove. But what to do now? She could ignore it and pretend it never happened. She could write an official report to Mr. Miles. But then, what would Miles think? That he should have hired a man instead of her? No, that wasn't good enough for Betsy. She could do this job and she could do it well. She would not let one man get in the way of that. When dinner came around, she pretended like nothing had happened. And so did Cosgrove. Besides, he was too worried about filling up his next drink. And that was fine with Betsy. Maybe he would have plenty and go straight to bed. But that wasn't the case. He hung around and went on and on once again. The same stories about high school, his triumphs on the football field, how even though he was not voted most likely to succeed, that he vowed to do so. And Betsy began to hear it. She led with her heart in the beginning, giving him a fair chance. But now she understood that there was something underneath Cosgrove's words, untruth, little lies sprinkled like sawdust. He was a boy in man's clothing. Hey, why don't you let me give you a hand with that, Cosgrove said, trying to grab a stack of dishes out of her hands. She tried to turn away, and instead dropped the entire heap onto the floor. They crashed and cracked and splattered everywhere. Well, that was a stupid thing to do, Cosgrove said, his voice obviously fighting a chuckle. I'll clean it up, she said. Why don't you go back to your bottle? What did you say to me? Her back was turned, but she felt the tingle of fear run down her back. Nothing, she said. She grabbed a broom and began sweeping up the remnants of the plates. Cosgrove grabbed her arm from behind and swirled her around to face him. It hurt, and she winced. His eyes were black dots of cold. Say, you know what you need? A little softening up around the edges. How about you and me take a ride? I'll bring the bottle along so you can see that I don't mind sharing. I'm not going anywhere with you, Betsy said. The slap came so fast that she barely had time to turn her head. When he hit her, he hit her in the ear and knocked her to the side. She narrowed her eyes at him. That was unwise. Say, I didn't mean it, he said. I, it's the drink, you understand? It does things to me. Betsy took slow steps backward. Cosgrove followed. Betsy, please understand. I didn't mean nothing, I promise. She bumped into the kitchen counter, reached down behind her, and grabbed the knife. I'm going to write that off as become stupid when drunk as a skunk. But I swear to you, Cosgrove, if you ever touch me again. Cracking a smile as thick as oil, he raised both hands, showing his palms. Hey, look, I didn't mean any harm. It was an accident, okay? You looked like you were going to fall, so I went and grabbed you. And Betsy knew that would go in the official report if he was ever asked. This man was a liar, and obviously used to it. A real professional. It finally clicked in her mind why Lovejoy hadn't been around the barracks. He had probably seen it from the start. The embrace. And perhaps there had been other signals that she was oblivious to, one that men tended to recognize in other men. Had he tried to warn her? Betsy thought so. Cosgrove left, and Betsy quickly locked the door behind him. She did not fall to the ground in sobs. She did not tear her hair out in fear. No, she set about methodically cleaning up the place, one piece of broken plate at a time all the while thinking how she could deal with Seaman Cosgrove and get back into the good graces of Sergeant Lovejoy, because Betsy was now sure that she had done something to earn his ire. She went back through the preceding days, through the unwanted kiss, the snatches of conversation, the brief glances. She had to make time to get Lovejoy alone, to ask him what he thought, and maybe they could come up with a plan together. Yes, that's what she would do. She would wait till the morning. Then at least Cosgrove would be sober, and they could discuss it like adults. That was her plan, at least.
Chapter 34 Jack, Present Day The GPS deposited him at a small parking lot in front of a ranger shack. No lights on inside. Definitely empty. Jack was armed, but he thought that he probably wouldn't need it. He got out of the truck and leaned against the side, waiting for whoever was going to show. Five minutes past the appointed time, the truck pulled into the parking lot. Three men emerged from the cab. They were wearing balaclavas. None of them appeared armed. Where's the girl? one of them asked. Jack's insides expanded, like that first step into the fire. She's in the truck, Jack lied. I need to talk to the girl, the guy said, before you talk to me. The second man spoke up. We ain't got no business with you, mister. Jack was pretty sure the guy was trying to sound tough. He sure as hell didn't look it. In fact, none of this felt like a real shakedown. What do you want? Money? The third man looked at the others and muttered something that Jack couldn't hear. We need to talk to the girl, the first man said. Why don't you tell me what you need to tell her, and I'll relay the information. Jack was starting to enjoy this bit of drama. He almost wanted to laugh. These guys were obviously amateurs and were in over their heads. Maybe within the hour he'd have Sadie's horses back. You've got ten seconds to tell me what's going on, he said. Ten. Nine. Thug number two, the chubby one, interrupted. W wait, hold on. This is our eight. Seven. Guy's crazy. What if he's a cop? Six. Five. Listen, mister, we don't have any trouble with you, said number one. Jack stopped the countdown, the old feel coming forth, the confidence, the steel rage measured and even. You made a trouble for me when you made a trouble for my friend. Now, why don't you tell me where the horses are? We'll take a drive down there, take them off your hands, and we can go our separate ways. There was a brief discussion between the three. Jack started counting again. Four, three, wait, 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 hold on, number three said, obviously agitated. Look, boys, I don't have all night. We're not getting paid enough for this, said number two, squirming. What had Sadie gotten herself into? With no further conversation coming from the titillating trio, Jack resumed his countdown. Two, one. That's when Buster emerged from the tree line, shotgun pointed at the three. Numbers two and three raised their hands. Number one scooted back toward the trunk. Look, he said, we don't want any trouble. I said I'd make this easy for you, Jack said. Tell me what this is all about. Give us the horses back, and we'll be on our way. We don't have the horses, okay, number one said. He paid us to take them, and then paid us to be here. Jack pulled the pistol that he'd borrowed from Buster out of his waistband. Two against three. Seems a pretty fair trade. I told you we shouldn't have done this, number two said, before all three of them filed back in the truck and peeled away. Jack put the pistol back in his waistband. Buster relaxed. Did you get what you need, Jack? Buster asked. A little, but it looks like I need to do more digging. Recognize any of those three? Or the truck? Buster shook his head. Lots of trucks like that out here. What about the cops? Pretty good? Buster nodded. I've got some friends on the force. I can make an introduction if you'd like. Let's see what I can find out first. But thanks for coming, Buster. I really do appreciate it. Anytime, Jack. The cowboy disappeared back into the woods. Ghost gone. Jack got back in the truck and headed toward Sadie's place to a conversation they needed to have. His adrenaline still ran red. Chapter 35 Sadie Jack returned with all the machismo of General Custer. Sadie was pretty sure that if he'd been surrounded by a thousand Lakota, he would have stood stock still despite the danger. She couldn't help but feel anger, and it wasn't anger at the situation. No, that had calmed. But the entire time Jack had been gone, 
She thought about Jack jumping in to save the day, and that's not what Sadie needed. She needed to take care of the situation herself. It was her life, not his. And when he opened his mouth, she beat him to the punch. I'm done, Jack. I don't know what happened, and I don't really care. I want to get on with my life. She was happy to see him deflate at the sound of her words. Maybe he'd leave. Then she could sit down and think about how she was going to pay rent. She had decided she was going to stay in this beautiful place, but first, he had to leave. Hey, I went out there for you. I thought I was helping, he said. Listen, I need to figure this out on my own. She didn't like the way his face softened. She wanted him to be angry, too. She wanted to fight and kick and scream. She would have made a hell of a trial attorney. She was already laying out every little bit of ammunition to use against Jack to get him to pick up and haul out. I think we both need to sit down, he said, and to her utter frustration went to grab a chair. She pointed at him and said, That's my chair. Do not sit on it. He remained standing, one hand resting on the wood, the other hand shifting from his pocket to his waist. You're a lot tougher than you look, you know that? Poor thing. He had no idea how tough she could be. I'm not a good person, Jack, she said. You best leave. Forget you even met me. There was a sadness in his eyes now, and a flicker of something else. What was it? Recognition? Well, at least we've got that in common, he said, moving his hand from the chair to his other pocket. He was struggling with his words now, and for some reason that intrigued her. She wanted to hear what he had to say. Then she'd kick him out. There's a lot I regret, Sadie. A lot of things I'm not proud of. As a matter of fact, if it were up to me, I'd erase everything up until this point. Start over. The world keeps kicking me in the teeth and I keep taking it. I'm done with it. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I mean, look at me. I'm not married. I don't have any kids. I barely have any responsibilities. But I feel like the weight of the world is hanging around my neck, waiting until I bend over enough for the axe to come and chop off my head. He let out a great sigh. You try to do the right thing. You try to be a good person. But still things go sideways. The devil licks his lips and takes a bite out of your calf. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Then he laughed. I told you I wasn't any good with girls. She couldn't help but giggle. Damn him. She quickly went back to Sirius. But his smile was contagious. Soon, she was smiling again, too. You say you're not good with girls, and then you do that. He looked behind himself. I'm sorry, did someone else enter the room? She felt her face flush, feeling very much that timid first grader who had gone into the first day of class with a stutter. I'm sorry, Jack, she finally said. I really didn't mean to be mean. I guess I'm lost, too. He nodded. Two lost souls wandering through Big Sky Wilderness. Let them make a movie about us one day. They'll call it From No Hope to Hopeless. She knew he was kidding. The anger between them had subsided. And now she did want to know what had brought Jack to this place. She often felt like her own wounds were open and bare to the world. Anyone who took a glance at her saw the insecure teenager within the cellophane successful woman she'd become. Tell me what happened, she said. And he did. About the three men in masks, about what they said. He mentioned someone named Buster who worked at Lone Peak Ranch, and even though there'd been guns involved, Jack described it as if it was something that he did every day. Sadie could see that he was experienced in such maneuvers. What had he been in his previous life, a cop? He sure would have been one of the biggest cops Sadie had ever met. Jack finished the story and shrugged. There you have it. I guess it's up to you, Sadie. I'm here to help if you want it, but I don't want to be an annoyance. And in that moment, she realized that she did need help after all. She could not do this on her own, and she needed those horses back. I don't want you to go, Jack. 
You seem to know what you're doing, and I could use a man of your experience. He spread his arms. Superman to the rescue. In that cheesy joke, she saw him as an awkward teenager, not so good with the girls after all. He had been a late bloomer. Maybe they would have been friends. Maybe they would have been more. Well, Superman, she said, I know you've got questions. Tell me where your detective's hat has taken you. He went professional again. Okay. You said that you had no idea who the person or people might be. But if you think hard enough, there's someone, maybe someone who sold you the horses, the person who rented you this place. Maybe that guy at the bar. I don't know. But there's got to be someone who... I know who it is, she said softly. It's my dad. It has to be him. I should have known it. Her denial gone, the weight of reality crushed her. Was this his revenge for not going back with him? Because she wouldn't take over the damn law office? For not wanting to become a multimillionaire and end up like him? Jack was nodding in deep thought. What do we do, Jack? He grunted finally. Decision made. I've got a plan, but you're not going to like it. Psst. If you're enjoying this story and want to support more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 36 Ricky, 1943 The slamming of the barracks door jarred him awake. He had spent the rest of the day running in the wild, and by the time he got back to the barracks, it was dark, and he was exhausted, thankfully. The other good thing was he didn't see Betsy or Cosgrove the rest of the day until now. Lovejoy knew before he even saw Cosgrove that the man was drunk. Lovejoy had an uncle who was a drunk, a mean one. He remembered sleepovers with his cousin, when after a night of fooling around and telling dirty jokes, came the sudden slamming of doors, a thumping of boots, and yelling. Lovejoy used to put his hands to his ears to block out the sound. He never talked about it with his cousins, even when he'd get up the next morning and see his aunt making pancakes with matching black eyes. The louse had died taking a sharp turn off a high bridge. It was a blessing, really. Sure, his aunt was left to support four children, but without the weight of her husband hanging over her, she did well, worked hard, and was in the process of sending each of her children to college. Lovejoy opened his eyes and watched Cosgrove weave from one side of the barracks to the other, holding on to the railing on each of the bunks for support. He didn't only smell like booze. Puke and piss also comprised his cologne. He kept a wary eye on the drunken sailor, who went to the bathroom, clanging around the entire time, and somehow made it back. He looked over at Lovejoy, his stupor turning into a sneer. Well, how do you do, Sarge? Sarge. Lovejoy was in no mood to talk, but he was in no mood to fight either. Did you get some water? Can I get you something for the headache? I don't have no damn headache, Cosgrove said. What I got is this, and he lewdly grabbed his crotch. Lovejoy rolled his eyes. You're drunk. Get some sleep. Cosgrove walked over and poked a finger in Lovejoy's chest. I'll go to bed when I'm good and ready. You're not in my chain of command. Lovejoy tried to stay calm. You do whatever you want. Cosgrove stood up again, teetering a bit. That's right. I'll do anything I want. He sloshed backward a few steps. Including that pretty little thing, Miss Bessie. Miss Bessie. Lovejoy tried to block it out. He tried to close his eyes and tell himself to go back to sleep, that this was none of his business. But it was the way Cosgrove said it, the way he seemed to be throwing off belligerence like skunk stink, that made Lovejoy's feet hit the deck before either man knew what was happening. Cosgrove turned his head, then looked Lovejoy up and down. Hey, get me some leftovers, will you? Get them yourself. Now Cosgrove turned fully around to face him. He seemed taller somehow. Hey now, congratulations, Sarge. Sounds like you're starting to grow a spine. 
You keep your hands off, Betsy. An oily smile formed on Cosgrove's lips. Oh, you got a little crush on Miss Betsy? Well, I have it on good authority that she likes a real man. He thumped his chest with a fist. Not little piss-ants like you. Why, I could crush your skull with one... Lovejoy ran at full tilt and dove with his elbow first. There was a loud woof as he hit Cosgrove square in the gut. Lovejoy fully expected the bigger man to fall, but he didn't. Instead, two large hands clamped down on the Marine's shoulders. You shouldn't have done that. And then, to Lovejoy's complete and utter surprise, Cosgrove lifted him off the ground like a string bean, and with a roar, threw him against the adjacent bunks. Metal bruised Lovejoy's entire left side, and when he hit the deck, he was pretty sure that something in his arm was broken. With rage and shock numbing the pain, Lovejoy slid to the ground and took out the larger man's legs. Cosgrove snapped forward, his head slamming to the ground. That had to be it, Lovejoy thought, panting. But Cosgrove got to his feet again, in pain for sure, but still moving. His eyes were slits of anger, and from a back pocket he produced a knife, its blade four to five inches in length. Lovejoy quickly looked around for something, anything, to hold off the next attack, because he knew that look on Cosgrove's face. Bloodlust. He'd seen Marines go berserk, even attacking their fellows when they tried to pull them back. Cosgrove was lost in the blood, and now he stalked cautiously, the blade swishing through the air like a fishtail. Perhaps he, Lovejoy, could make a run for it. Not a chance. He was too far from the door, and Cosgrove was gaining his senses quickly. The first lunge was tentative and easily dodged. The second one was more straightforward, and it nicked Lovejoy's forearm. Blood ran in a thin line down his wrist. I hate you jarheads, Cosgrove said. I always have. You and your high and mighty attitudes. Another swipe and another dodge. Killed me a Marine in San Diego once. Bled like a popped pig. Another stab. And when Lovejoy blocked it, his arm rattled in pain. Now I'm going to kill me another jarhead and bury you out here in this fucking wild. Lovejoy did not doubt it. They were close now, so close, that one final lunge was all it would take. There was nowhere else to go. But it wasn't a stab or a swipe that got him. Cosgrove used his size and bull rushed, putting his arms around him, and Lovejoy felt the blade on his back. Oh, God, this is it, he thought. Going for broke, he slammed his forehead again and again into Cosgrove's face, which let up the hug a bit. But then the hug tightened once more, and the blade returned. Cosgrove growled, and then something strange happened. A calm fell over Lovejoy. He knew that he was protected, maybe not from death, but protected all the same. He surrendered to the calm. And as the darkness came, there was an earth-shattering boom. Chapter 37 Betsy, 1943 She stared down the length of the rifle. One shot was all it had taken. She'd been careful, and she'd been lucky. She'd heard Cosgrove's return, and she'd already had the rifle in hand. She had been lying in bed with it just in case. And for some reason, call it a premonition, call it an overabundance of caution, she slipped out of her own room outside and watched Cosgrove go into the barracks. She waited, listening with the ears of a feline. And for a time, she thought it was simply another night, that Cosgrove would pass out, only to wake up the next morning having forgotten everything. She was about to go back to sleep when she heard the voices. She couldn't hear exactly what they were saying. Lovejoy, then Cosgrove, back and forth. But it was a crash that made her run the short distance and burst through the door. And when she did, neither of them even noticed she was even there. It was dark inside, 
and she could only see vague outlines of them. Cosgrove's hulking form was easy to distinguish. She looked down at the rifle, and then back up at the men. Lovejoy was putting up an earnest fight, and though she was good with the rifle, she didn't want to shoot anyone. And besides, she might shoot somebody she didn't want to shoot. But it was obvious who was the aggressor. And even though Lovejoy took down the bigger man, the unmistakable glint of the knife in Cosgrove's hand froze Betsy in place. She knew instinctively that this was one of those moments when her actions would reverberate not only through her own life, but in others. She raised the weapon, took aim, and waited. Waited too long. Cosgrove had wrapped his arms around Lovejoy, and she heard the tight scream of pain come from the Marine's mouth. She was stalking forward on shaky legs, but her hands were perfectly calm. She saw Lovejoy's head slump to the side, enough so she thought she could make a clean shot. The rifle discharged with a deafening roar, and both men fell. She ran now, flicked on the light switch, and saw that the front of Cosgrove's head had exploded outward. There were bits of brain and splashes of blood everywhere, and lying there next to him was Sergeant Ricky Lovejoy, blood streaming from his back. Her heart racing like a stallion, she was pretty sure Cosgrove was dead, but she checked for a pulse. Nothing. She quickly moved, grabbing a sheet and pressing it against Lovejoy's back. There were two wounds there. One looked deep, and the other superficial by comparison. Lovejoy's face had turned an unnatural pale. Ricky, wake up. Oh, please, wake up. She secured the sheet as best as she could. She had to get him to the truck and to help. But how the hell was she going to do that this time of night? She used one sheet tied around him to catch the blood, and another to drag him out. After what seemed like an hour of dragging, her muscles screaming, tears streaming down her face as she strained to pull the dead weight, she got him outside. Despair weighed down on her head. They would never make it in time at this rate. The man who had been so kind to her was going to die because she'd been too stupid to see the devil that was inside of Seaman Cosgrove. Then she remembered the first aid kit. Oh, God, how could she forget? She was running inside when loud sirens cut through the night. She prayed desperately that they were coming here, but why would they? Then the lights came and the sirens blazed around them, and she knew her prayers had been answered. Two police trucks appeared, and two cops jumped out, guns drawn. Don't move, one of them screamed. It was only then that Betsy realized she was covered in blood. Raising her shaking hands, she got back to her feet. Officers, this is Sergeant Richard Lovejoy. I didn't shoot him. Whose blood is that? I shot the other man, the one who was attacking him. The two cops exchanged a glance. Where's the other one? Betsy motioned with her chin toward the barracks. In there. Big guy? Sailor's uniform? The cop asked. How could they know? Yes, his name is Cosgrove, Betsy said. And he attacked Sergeant Lovejoy, so I... The cops holstered their weapons. Is he dead? The first cop said, while the other one went to check on Sergeant Lovejoy. He is, Betsy answered. The cop lifted the rifle off the ground. How many shots? he asked, almost conversationally. One. You mind if I take this with me? Betsy shook her head, and the cop disappeared into the barracks. The police officer attending to Lovejoy looked up. There's a first aid kit in the back of my truck. Grab it, will you, miss? Betsy rushed to comply, and when she came back with the small canvas case, the other cop had returned from the barracks. Dead as roadkill, he said. Betsy fully expected to be thrown into handcuffs and taken to jail. She even started putting her hands out, but the cop gave her the rifle instead, then addressed his partner. He going to live? It's deep, but I've seen worse. Lovejoy stirred. Oh, where's Cosgrove? he asked weakly. Ricky, thank God, Betsy said, kneeling at his side. 
You don't need to worry about him anymore. Lovejoy looked at the rifle in her hands and then back up into her eyes. Then he smiled. I shouldn't have doubted you. I should have known. Betsy didn't know what he meant. Shh, don't say anything. They'll take care of you. Lovejoy winced when the cop behind him did something to the wound. Sorry about that, but that should hold until we get to the hospital. Lovejoy gritted his teeth and nodded. He took a breath and said, Could she come with us? I don't see why not. Lovejoy relaxed, and one of the officers asked Betsy if she could fetch a mattress from the barracks. She did so, and the two cops hoisted it into the back of the truck. And there they laid Sergeant Lovejoy. Betsy tried not to think about the crumpled body at the end of the barracks as she climbed into the back of the truck. The taller cop closed the tailgate behind her. Officer, she said, as he began to walk around to the front. Why did you come? I'm sorry? I mean, why are you here tonight? The cop wiped his brow and took a breath. Cosgrove beat up a couple of girls down the road and then took off. One of them had been smart enough to catch his name. We looked him up. You got lucky, miss, and so did your friend there. There was no more explanation, and Betsy didn't think on it further. She knew the truth. This had been more than coincidence. This was not the first time, nor the last, that some other power would have a hand in her life. She realized that with all the certainty she had of her own existence. She sat next to Ricky Lovejoy and held his hand. She felt its warmth and was glad for it. Once more, she knew that everything she had gone through up until this point had brought her here to this moment, this now, this everything. Chapter 38 Jack, Present Day Jack left his jumbled emotions in the truck and marched into the police department. The level of activity inside wasn't surprising. It didn't seem like there was a cop who wasn't engaged, and it took a couple of minutes to find the officer Buster had told him to find. Officer Wallen arrived, looking every bit the supporting actor in a John Wayne western. He had the weathered face that had seen a thousand sunsets on the trail. You Jack Moses? the officer asked. Yes, sir. The cop looked Jack up and down. Why don't we go to the back where it's quiet? Jack followed through the small maze of desks and became more than a little squeamish when he realized that the maze led to an interrogation room. Of all things Jack was scared of, prison had to top the list. He'd been close once, a stupid prank gone wrong back in college. He'd gotten off in the end because the cop had never come to court but they'd gotten a stern lecture from the judge. That was the first cop station Jack had ever been in. Now, to go in the interrogation room put him on edge. Officer Wallen took a seat in one of the metal chairs and instantly leaned back, kicking his boots up on the desk. Jack took a seat. So, how do you know Buster? Wallen said. Don't know him, really. I'm doing some work over at Lone Peak Ranch. Wallen nodded. You seen the magic yet? Sorry, I don't know what you mean. Wallen grunted like he suspected as much. You'll see. Anyhow, Buster called me and told me to give you any help I could. He and I go way back. The first war in the Middle East. Jack tried not to cringe. He was going to revisit one of his least favorite topics, war talk. Wallen waded in, knowing that these were shark-infested waters for Jack. Buster says you were a Marine and a pretty good one. How the hell did Buster know that? He'd barely said twenty words to Jack since arriving in Big Sky. I did my four years and then punched, Jack said, wanting to move along the conversation. Once again, Wallen wrangled that bear and threw it back in the center of the ring. I can see it in you, Mr. Moses. You try to hide it, but I see it. Jack's stomach turned. Officer Wall and I understand that you're probably pretty busy. Wallen shrugged, as if having a two-foot-high stack of paperwork didn't matter. Jack continued. But I've got a friend, 
She's new here. He paused, wondering if this was a good idea, then pressed on. Her father has been giving her a hard time in town. I would like to find out where he is, have a little man-to-man -man talk. Wallen's nod was slow, measured, and every bit the good cop. When you say man-to-man, -man, Mr. Moses, do you mean face-to-face -face or a real tete-a-tete? -tete? The latter, Jack said. I've got his phone number. I was hoping you might be able to trace it. Wallen put his chair down on all fours and tinted his hands on top of the table. I'm not sure I like the sound of this, Mr. Moses. I appreciate your contribution to our fair country. I'm not sure a familial squabble is something our department wants on its hands. Jack nodded. At least he had tried. He pushed out his chair and stood up. Thank you for your time. Sit down, Mr. Moses, Wallen chuckled. Just messing with you. You're as stiff as Buster. I'll help. What the hell else do you think I've got to do today? Facing down teens stealing Milky Ways from the Mini Mart? Jack took a seat again. A lot of candy bar thieves here in Big Sky? It's an epidemic, Mr. Moses. Now, why don't you give me that number and I'll go get it traced? Jack recited the number and Wallen wrote it down from the notebook he'd pulled from his pocket. Wallen stood up. Give me five minutes. You want anything to drink? I'm good. Be right back. Jack waited as patiently as he could, hoping Buster's friend was true to his word. The college kid in him continued to squirm, wanting out of this room and out of this police station. He knew deep down that it was a stupid fear. He had only once ever broken the law, and even then it was something minor. This was pretty much what he was asking this police officer to do. Oh, there were shortcuts, and then there were shortcuts. They should have taken a different route. Sadie hadn't been too pleased with the idea of him coming here. She relented when Jack explained that it would be impossible to find her father. But the solution was simple. Find her father, and they would find her horses. Jack could feel what was really coming. Confrontation. Possibly the final confrontation between father and daughter. And while Jack didn't know the whole story, he knew enough to understand that Sadie, while wanting to be free of her father, at the same time needed ties to family wherever she could find it. Jack thought of his own father, and whether Big Jack had ever had a run-in with the law. Probably not. Big Jack was an honorable man, who believed that community service was his duty. He believed that a neighbor in need was his responsibility. And he believed the love between a father and son was unbreakable. And it had been. Jack was at once thankful for that. And though his father had died, and even though the damned Marine Corps made their mistake, it still parted the hero and his sidekick. That's what Big Jack had been to his son, a hero a larger-than-life demigod who could take over the world if he wanted. I miss you, Dad. What he wouldn't give for five more minutes to say those very words. The Big Sky police were nothing if not efficient. Officer Wallen came back in less than five minutes. He had a folded piece of paper in his hand. It looks like he's staying in a hotel around the corner, not three minutes from here. I took the liberty of calling the hotel. One of my nephews works the front counter. This here's the address of the hotel and the room number. You sure this isn't something you want me to handle for you, Mr. Moses? Jack took the piece of paper. I promise. If this situation gets even the least bit out of hand, you'll be the first man I call. In response, Wallen produced a business card and handed it to Jack. My cell phone number. Call me day or night. I sleep like crap anyway. You'll be a welcome break from the infomercials. Officer Wallen escorted Jack back through the maze, and they said their goodbyes. Jack once again promised to call if he needed assistance. He truly hoped he wouldn't, but with an angry daughter and a devious father about to go head to head, Jack fully expected a fair share of fireworks. Chapter 39 Sadie she wasn't happy that Jack had involved the police, 
but he seemed to be sure that whomever he talked to wouldn't make a stink. He also seemed to be pretty sure that unless they confronted her father, this would keep happening. Maybe he's gone, he said as they drove to the hotel. Maybe he got the hint. Jack, do you really believe that? It was not an accusation. It was sad reality. And she shook her head. Her father was like a wolf with an elk shin bone in its jaws. He'd never let it go until he devoured the entire thing. But what Sadie really didn't like was the way she felt. A cowering little girl again, a preteen who never thought she had measured up to her daddy. Those awkward years when the clothes never fit right. He'd always give her a one, two, three, up and down. He never said it. He didn't have to. She knew she didn't stack up. It was as if she was never Crawford material to begin with. They arrived at the hotel sooner than Sadie would have liked. Jack led the way through a side entrance, bypassing the front desk. I thought you said they were expecting us, Sadie said. Figure it's better to get this done and over with, don't you? Sadie nodded, but she felt far from the confidence that Jack possessed, especially since she'd made a promise long ago not to rely on a man. Thank you, Daddy, for that one. She felt herself inching closer to Jack, wanting the, what was it, help? No. What she needed was a friend. Maybe that's what Jack was. She let herself hope that this would be the end of it. Jack would fix everything. That plain fact didn't sit well in Sadie's stomach. It was her business, her problem. She had dragged him into it. She'd make it up to him somehow. She didn't know how, but she would. Room 501 was far from the elevator and the emergency stairwell. Sadie wondered if this middle-of-the-line hotel was up to her father's standards. Of course it wasn't. Nothing was. Jack knocked on the door. The sound was deep and angry. Did he really thunder on the door, or were Sadie's senses on overdrive? She wiped her palms on her jeans. Who is it? Hotel management, Mr. Crawford, Jack said, his thumb covering the peephole. There have been complaints of loud noises, sir. I need to have a word and we'll get it figured out. They had not rehearsed this part. Jack threw her a wink that failed to boost Sadie's confidence. The door cracked open to the width its chain would allow. Jack didn't hesitate before throwing his heel into the door. The chain snapped clean. He grabbed Sadie's wrist and pulled her inside. Her father was wide-eyed as he backpedaled into the room. Who the hell are you? Then his eyes fell on Sadie. How did you find me? That's not important, Dad. She didn't like the way her voice quivered. She saw the indignation rise in her father like mercury in a thermometer. I'll have you thrown in prison for this, he said directing his wrath at Jack. I think I've got more friends in this town than you do, Mr. Crawford. Jack's voice was even, obvious that he would be unmoved. She tried to feed off that, grab some of that confidence, but instead felt herself shrinking under her father's gaze. Jack must have sensed it, too, because he stepped in. The police have sworn statements from the three thugs you hired to take Sadie's horses, break my window, and meet with Sadie to scare her off. What thugs? What is this? Jack crossed his arms over his broad chest. The game's over, Mr. Crawford. All Sadie wants is to have her horses back and for you to leave her alone. Isn't that right, Sadie? It took every ounce of her depleted energy to nod her head. What she really wanted to do was scream, yell, maybe even take a punch. She was frozen. Little Sadie again. Poor little Sadie, whose mom had left and was made fun of by the kids at school. The one who went home to whatever gourmet meal was prepared by their private chef. The one who sat at the long table across from her father, with him telling her about his latest case and about how one day she would be with him and work hand in hand to build a dynasty. One year, her father said. I'll give you one year. That snapped Sadie back to reality and into her big girl shoes. 
You don't need to placate me, Dad. This is my life. When are you going to understand that? I'm not coming back to California, and I'm not working with you. This is ridiculous, Sadie. Do you really want to throw everything away? Sadie knew what was coming next. You're exactly like your mother. It all came back then. The tearful goodbye. Mom waving from the taxi. Her father yanking her back inside the house. How weak and pathetic her mother looked. Rage welled up. Sadie marched across the room and slapped him across the face. I should have done that a long time ago. For the first time in her life, she saw fear in her father's eyes. There was never a shred of fear there before. Even with a gun pointed at his head, Sadie doubted that he ever felt fear. Raymond Crawford III wasn't wired that way. Maybe he had been desensitized through the years, but there it was. The shock was tangible and something she held on to, so she kept going. You're going to tell me where my horses are. Then when I get them back, you're going to leave and we're going to be finished. Do you understand that? Her father had regained a measure of composure, tugging once on his collar. You're making a big mistake. My mistake to make, Dad. Well, then, you said we were finished. That will be, Sadie, if that's what you want. You're cut off. Forever. He waited for a response. None came. He put his hands in the air like it was all out of his control. He walked to the bedside table, scribbled down something, and handed the note to Sadie. Here's where the horses are. Call ahead. Take them and have a nice life. That was it. No tearful goodbye. No wishes of hope for the future. Just a final transaction. On their way back to the elevator, Jack patted her back. Told you you'd figure it out. She nodded and looked at the piece of paper in her hand. Vid one. Why then did she feel as though she'd just lost everything? Chapter 40 Jack He had helped Sadie retrieve the horses, all of whom were healthy, at exactly where her father had promised. He figured that everything would be put right, that Sadie would be happy, that he would be happy, that the pride of doing a job well done would coat their sadness like a salve. Sadie withdrew immediately, saying she needed to tend to the horses. When Jack called her the next day, there was no answer. The same day after that. He had been riding the high that had come from persuading Sadie's father to do the right thing. That was all gone now, replaced by rejection. He had a choice, cast himself back down into sadness or throw himself back into work. He chose work. Utility lines and lot lines. Plot lines, grid lines, and power lines. Right angles, obtuse angles, skewed angles, the wrong angles. He'd worked on autopilot, tuning out the whispers of his dead father. Take your time, Jack. When you're on a deadline, inspiration will come, and everything will be set right. Past Jack had the patience. Current Jack wanted to be done. On the third day, he couldn't take it anymore. Instead of calling, he drove out to Sadie's place. Sadie and the three horses were gone, and the sign on her front door had been flipped to, I'll be back this afternoon. He scribbled a quick note asking her to give him a call. Just wanted to make sure you're okay, was how he finished it. He thought about crumpling the piece of paper and throwing it in the trash, but instead slid it under the door, cursing himself for not being able to find the right words. He took his time driving back to Lone Peak Ranch, consumed with the cliff face that seemed to be blinking in and out on the horizon. Upon his return to work, he found Buster just as the cowboy was about to climb into his SUV. I'm going on a little hike and was wondering if you could spare a couple of things. What do you need? Well, Jack said, checking a metal list. Say, a backpack, some water, maybe some power bars if you got them. Oh, and bear spray. Buster looked at him. Just a couple of things. 
Jack shrugged. I pack light, what can I tell you? Wait here. Within two minutes, Buster was back with what he needed. Hey, thanks, Jack said. Sorry to be a bother on your way out. No worries at all. It's a good thing you caught me. I'm leaving for a couple of days. Oh, yeah? Where to? Buster pursed his lips for a moment, then said, Nowhere special. Same old Buster. Chatty Cathy. Which way you headed, Jack? Nowhere special, Jack said with a smile. Buster stared at him. Jack cleared his throat. I thought I'd check out Lone Peak, he said, pointing up Lone Mountain at its impressive stretch. Buster looked up and nodded. Good day for it. Another man would have warned him away from the plan, admonishing him to wait till the morning when he could have a full day, or to take along a companion. Not Buster. So what if the cowboy was not the best at communication? He let Jack be, and that was fine with Jack. He set off on his hike, and he found that within an hour he was beginning to relax. Every tense muscle in his body was loose and moving. He started to see the beauty all around. The way the terrain undulated just so. The way game paths crisscrossed across his own. A pair of bald eagles called from overhead, and falcons seemed to be doing an aerial ballet the entire time. He seemed to be making good time, despite not having consulted a map or even the GPS on his phone. He had always been good at land navigation, and found that terrain association, the art and science of comparing a map to the actual lay of the land, came naturally. It must have been his upbringing, the way his father had taught him all about acreage and plotting lot lines when he was six years old. Something about terrain was intuitive to Jack Moses. It was that intuitiveness, that connectedness, which unclasped enough of his worry to open his heart. He had just seen a mother moose in the distance meandering along with her baby, when he noticed up ahead was a man. It was the first person he'd seen. Jack figured he should be near a stopping point, at least for a snack and some water. He hurried to catch up with the person, to ask them how much farther certain landmarks might be. He'd only done a rough sketch in his head, so he wasn't sure. As he got closer... The outline of the man, it was a man for sure, looked familiar. The way the man walked, the way he held himself, the way he planted his hiking sticks on the edge of the path, marking a steady rhythm on the trail. So familiar, Jack thought. Jack caught a near enough glimpse of his face. No, it can't be. Jack sped up, his boots mashing their way up the hill. No matter how fast Jack seemed to go, the man remained the same distance ahead of him. Jack started running. Still, the distance between them remained the same. I'm going crazy. I'm definitely going crazy, he said to the air. He stopped in the middle of the path, heart thumping. Dad? he called out. The man stopped, turned, and sure enough, it was his father's face. He looked at Jack, eyes brilliant, smile coming slow. Dad? No way, it couldn't be. Jack couldn't move. The ghost that was his father gave him a wink, then turned and kept hiking. Jack ran after the illusion, which stayed up ahead, until there was a turn and a drop into a small forest of peeling silver birch bark. Jack was desperate now, his lungs heaving. He ran straight without looking, without thinking. He saw the edge of the fall at the last possible second. Everything seemed to move slowly. His right foot still touching the ground, his left in midair already going over the ledge. The image of his father nowhere in sight, nowhere below. Only a place where maybe an avalanche had cleaved the earth. Some celestial being had carved a line right down the mountain. Jack would have seen it if he hadn't been going full tilt at the apparition. But now, there was nothing to be done. Fear gripped him head to toe as he fell. Terror that he hadn't felt since losing his father at the carnival when he was a kid gripped him now. 
an impossible fear that grabbed his throat and shook him and tossed him down to the ground. And then the fear was gone, snuffed out like a flame. And for some reason, Jack closed his eyes. There was light that held him, and he accepted the warm embrace with the fall. A voice told him, I've got you, Jack. Psst! If you're enjoying this book and want more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 41 Ricky, 1943 A few stitches and some blazing wound cleaning put him on the mat. The hospital staff was kind and offered to keep him at no expense, offering as a reason their contribution to the war effort. But Ricky declined. What he wanted was to feel every jolt and bump of the ride back to Lone Peak Ranch. He saw it was his due for what had happened, because sitting there next to him driving the truck was Betsy. She hadn't left his side. What he wanted to do was tell her to pull the truck over and wrap her in his arms and kiss her like he'd never kissed anyone before. But that wouldn't be right. They drove on in silence. Ricky wondered where he was going to sleep, what with the body of Cosgrove lying in the barracks. When they arrived, they found to their surprise that the body was gone, and every inch of the place was scrubbed clean. Betsy fussed with one corner of a perfectly made bunk. I had the cook make you a bed on the sofa in the other building. I hope that's okay. Sure, I can do that, Ricky said, though he didn't trust his voice. The adrenaline was long gone, and the pain meds they had given him were beginning to wear off. His body was exhausted. But he didn't want to sleep. He wanted to be with her. How about we go for a walk, he suggested. She tilted her head. You're kidding, right? I'm not. I hate to break this to you, but you just got out of the hospital. What's your point? She blinked slowly. You need rest. He smiled at her. I need to walk a bit. My mind's a jumble. Now, I could go by myself, but you know, what if something were to happen to me? She put her hands on her hips. You got a lot of moxie, chum. I promise I'll take it slow, he said, raising three fingers into the air. Scout's honor. You were a scout? No, but I once helped an old lady across the street. She laughed a little at that. You win, Sergeant. I could use a walk myself. The walk wasn't long. He had to finally admit to her that he was in a lot of pain. And when she said she shouldn't have pushed him, he promised her that it was his fault, not hers. They went back and had a light meal. They followed with conversation. That is, Betsy talked as Ricky drifted away on the sofa bed. And for some reason, as he fell into his dreams, he saw her standing in a light pink dress in the middle of the meadows, bright flowers, the wind sweeping her hair to one side. And he knew in that moment that this was his little slice of heaven. The days passed, and Ricky was pleased to see that he quickly got his strength back. He and Betsy would take a light snack along on a walk in the morning. And eventually that one walk turned into two, and they packed two meals for every trek. Betsy insisted on inspecting his wound every couple of hours, and over time she noted his speedy recovery. He must come from strong stock, she said. But Ricky knew the truth. It was this place. He had had that feeling before. This place, its earth and its greens and browns, was somehow touched by an otherworldly power. And he felt part of that power seeping into his own veins. And he was not in the least bit surprised when he found that the old memories had lost their edge and were no longer quite as painful to recall. And he was happy to soak in the joy that comprised the bulk of his days. And then came the day where they stood looking out over the beauty before them, the Gallatin River snaking its way toward Bozeman. 
clear snow-capped mountains in the distance. And their hands came together as if of their own accord, and they stood there for a long, long time, both at peace, neither wanting to say anything, lest it disturb the moment. It was a slice of time that had been made for the two of them. Finally, Ricky turned, and Betsy did too. He looked into her eyes and saw goodness and joy. And when the words left his mouth, there was no regret. There was no fear. It was only what it was. I think I'm falling in love with you, he said. She gave him that small smile that reminded him that she was still so young. They were both so young. Did they really have any right to be saying these things? And then she responded, I already know I'm in love with you, Ricky Lovejoy. And then she closed the distance between them, and they kissed for the first time, and life once more felt worth living. Chapter 42 Betsy, 1943 The investigation into Seaman Cosgrove's death was quick and, thankfully, painless. Mr. Miles came in from Yellowstone. There were three representatives from the United States Navy and an Army colonel who looked like he had been in service since the Civil War. It was Mr. Miles who'd given Betsy the final verdict. I don't know how he slipped through the cracks, he said. But Cosgrove had a long history. He had charges running against him, everything from impersonating an officer to probable murder. I'm so sorry we put you through that, Betsy. It's okay, she said. Are you sure? Because I could have someone come talk to you. Say the word and I'll have him here lickety-split. This was a strange transformation, she thought. Up till now, Mr. Miles had been merely a boss, enigmatic perhaps, but her boss nonetheless. There had never been a word from him that didn't stink of the clipboard. His apology to her was not on behalf of any large, unfeeling institution. It came directly from his eyes to hers. It was as if the veil had lifted to reveal a man who cared deeply and believed in doing the right thing no matter what. She could see that compassion in his eyes now. Mr. Miles, I promise, if I ever feel like I need help, I'll call. He patted her hand once and gave her a cool smile. There'll be more soon. Soldiers, Marines, sailors. He turned as he gripped the door handle. You were made for this place, Betsy, as God is my witness. And then he was gone, and the words echoed in her head. You were made for this place. She knew he was right, though perhaps maybe the words had been turned around. Perhaps this place was made for her, not she for it. She felt it in every morning wake up and in every deep good night. She was late for their walk. Ricky was waiting, pack filled with food for their daily trek. What did they say? he asked. He had been questioned, too. Cosgrove was who you thought he was, she said. They talked about this, about Ricky's initial misgivings, about that tingling feeling he felt about the man. But they agreed with a nod that Cosgrove would no longer be at the center of any of their conversations. The investigation was done. Mr. Miles put a stamp on it. Betsy and Ricky were free to do as they pleased. There was a chill out today, but they both knew that it would be warm. The sun was already toasting the backs of the necks, and they set out, falling into an easy conversation. They held hands sometimes, and they walked alone sometimes. And with their minds and hearts unburdened, they had what each considered to be one of the best days of their lives. They returned just before dinner, having each developed a growling appetite despite all the food they'd already eaten. Cook was stirring something in the kitchen in a big pot. A telegram came for you, he said to Ricky, one hand on the wooden spoon, the other waving the paper. There'd been telegrams before, two from his friends in the Pacific, another from the Department of the Navy, 
all congratulating Lovejoy on his accomplishments. Ricky's body language changed. Betsy had been dipping a piece of bread into the stew that the cook was making when she looked up. Ricky was frozen, eyes glued to the telegram. Her hunger disappeared, and she dropped the piece of bread into the stew. Hey now, the cook said, quick to scoop the bread out of the pot. What is it? Betsy asked. It's my orders, Ricky said. Orders. They hadn't really discussed it, though they both knew it was coming. How long do you have? Betsy asked, unsure of whether she meant to say we instead of you, for she thought of them as we now. She was deeply, madly, everlastingly in love, and now that love was smothered by thoughts of Ricky covered in mud and blood and fighting for his life on some godforsaken island. They come to get me in two days, he said flatly. And that was it. She tried to be cheery. She tried to perk up for his account. But they both felt it, the inevitable crashing down on them, and their walk the next day was strained. The clouds rained down their sorrow as well. Ricky spent the rest of the day packing his things. Betsy asked if she could help, but he said it wouldn't take long. He didn't come out for hours. And then the day came when he would be leaving. She hadn't slept and had thought on a dozen occasions that she should run to him and give herself to him now and forever. They could run away. They could find a place and never talk to another human being, just the two of them. But she knew deep down that Ricky's sense of duty was too deep and that her own was as well. It had been preordained, and now this was their reality. There was no getting around it, but nonetheless, the moment came too soon. And because neither wanted to get the other in trouble, there was no last kiss, no longing look into their loved one's eyes, simply a wave and a sad smile, and the feeling of crushing loneliness that suddenly enveloped the whole of her. As he drove away, she prayed with every ounce of faith that she'd ever had that the Lord Almighty would bring him back safe, bring him back home, bring him back, period. And for the rest of that day, she cried. And when she woke up the next morning, she got back to work. Because what else was there to do? Ricky's life was now in the hands of God. But where was hers? Chapter 43 Sadie, Present Day She tried to put the confrontation with her father out of her mind, but like a slow-acting poison, it spread through her body, hardened her, cut her off from the beauty and the hope she'd once had. Like Jack, she tried to stay busy. There was plenty to do, and yet, in between mucking stalls and repairing fences, she became more and more consumed with annoying her father. Maybe she'd go to D.C., take a position there, and become a politician or a lobbyist. Maybe she'd become an attorney ten times bigger than him. Then she'd show him. She'd crush him, take over his practice and burn it to the ground. That dream dripped into her subconscious, at once sating and teasing her. It all but willed her to make the decision. She didn't need Montana. It had been a hassle from the start. Sure, it had been a nice illusion, a distraction really. But how was she going to make it? Her father was right. She'd give him that. It was no place for her. One day, two days, three days, they blended together. She barely ate and drank only to combat the elevation. She returned one day to find a note slipped under her door. She quickly read it and realized Jack was a good man, but she needed to stay well away from him for his sake. Her father's contamination had once affected her mother. Now it was affecting her. The last thing she wanted to do was infect Jack and inject the Crawford curse into his caring nature. But the note did wake her up enough to plant the idea 
that maybe what she needed was a little respite to regain whatever she'd come here for in the first place. She packed a few things, including a sleeping bag and a tent, just in case. The tent would probably be unnecessary. A report said it might be cool at night, but Zadie had slept out in the open plenty of times. She saddled Peanut and set off down the trail. Almost immediately, she was hit not by the all-consuming calm she thought awaited her, but by a little calm, one dangling from a rope of hope. She began to see the little details again, the tussle of scrub, the gray fox running across a padded meadow, the soft-eyed deer dibbling on undergrowth. Here and there, she picked up these morsels, these small gifts, each one a separate reason for being. Bit by bit, her father fell behind while the mountain loomed up ahead of her. Maybe she'd go to the top. She didn't know how far she could go with the horse, but she'd try. She leaned forward and rubbed Peanut's neck. You'll keep me company, won't you? The horse kept plodding along as if to say, Do like me and just keep moving. That was one of the things Sadie had always loved about horses, the steady, quiet strength that allowed a respectful rider to harness that power and be one with it. Yes, out here in the wild, away from phones and internet, this is where she belonged. Big Sky might not have been remote enough for her liking, but it was a start. She thought of Jack. She'd seen a different side of him when they confronted her father. He seemed to be a confident leader. And while she didn't know his past, she guessed that he must have had some great responsibility and that he'd commanded it well. Perhaps he had a gift for it. She would never know. And that was okay with Sadie. Then, as they plodded along, she thought of her mother. Gone now but still at the forefront of so many memories. Mother had taught her compassion. She'd bestowed upon her daughter a love for nature and taught her to respect a disconnection from earthly cares. When she first visited Linda Crawford in Hawaii, she'd been shocked to see the woman living in what Sadie considered a shack. No air conditioning, no heating. Barely enough electricity to run the fridge. And yet... She had never seen her mother so happy, so free. That freedom was contagious. By the end of the three-week visit, Sadie didn't want to go back to her father's frantic pace in Los Angeles. But there were the horses, the responsibilities. She went back under mental protest. She remembered the sadness of her mother's eyes when she dropped her at the airport. Sadie held in her tears until she got to the airplane. She felt the eyes of the flight attendant on her. She knew they'd give her space. How often were they parties to tearful goodbyes? Sadie covered her face, trying desperately not to sob. The disconnection was like medicine. In the summers, she stretched her visits to a month. She and her mother would live sparsely, eating fresh fruit and sea catches. They would enjoy their time together, going for long walks late into the night. They became best friends. I miss you, Mom, Sadie whispered to the air of Big Sky. Then she said a prayer that maybe her mother was listening, that maybe she could give her some inspiration, a sign that told her she wasn't alone. All that answered was the flop of a horse's hooves and a light breeze on her ears. It was a stupid idea anyway, Sadie thought, but she went on, letting the horse guide. She closed her eyes, focusing on the deep inhale, the long exhale, and the slow mending of her broken heart. She was not one to wallow. Her strength came from a unique combination of her mother and father. Like all children, she'd picked up their gifts and foibles alike. And now she focused on the gifts things like an appreciation for hard work and determination that her father had instilled, the love and caring that her mother had fostered, and the life that she'd been given by the two of them. She dreamed of drifting souls flying in and out of sight, 
maybe her mother among them. When she opened her eyes, she was surprised to see that a light fog had fallen. Strange. It was the first fog that she'd seen here. As they moved farther up the path, the fog expanded, even billowed. She felt Peanut shudder beneath her. The horse let out a low whinny. It's okay, girl, she said. Goose flesh prickled her arms. Maybe she should turn back. No, it was only fog. Nothing to worry about, really. But then, without warning, Peanut reared. Sadie hung on. Oh, it's okay. Peanut's ears had flattened as she charged through the fog away from whatever had spooked her. And Sadie held on to the mountain horse, trying to verbally soothe her. Down a small drop and around the bend, they tore up the mountain. There were no overhanging branches, or Sadie was pretty sure that she would have been knocked off. She was a good rider and held on. Once she thought about maybe jumping off, but the fog was so thick now that she could barely see the ground. How did the horse know where to go? Perhaps Peanut had that extra intuition, some radar that humans didn't have. Easy, girl, easy, Sadie tried to say, but the words sounded like they were coming from deep in her belly. The noise of the world had been deadened by the fog. Danger up ahead. Sadie didn't see it, but she felt it. With all her might, she pulled back. Whoa, she said through gritted teeth. But Peanut fought through it. They fought, horse and rider, until finally the horse slowed and reared back. The horse reared once more and stopped. Sadie dismounted and gave her a tug, careful to move the horse back a few feet. Then she walked over and peered past the edge. The fog was shifting, and Sadie could see now that it was a long drop. She gulped. That was a close one. Peanut nickered as if to agree. When asked later, Sadie said that she didn't know why she kept looking into the drop. Curiosity? The swirling of the fog? Sadie saw something. A shape of some sort. There's someone down there, she said. Hello? No answer. Hello? She tried again. Still no answer. There was definitely someone there. She could see their outline now. It was a long drop, maybe fifty feet, and still no obvious way down. Maybe they were hurt. Maybe it wasn't really a person. Maybe her eyes were playing tricks on her. She wasn't in the greatest little spot right now. Hello? She called out again. Damn. She had left her phone back at the house. So much for disconnecting. The breeze picked up and took most of the fog with it, enough for Sadie to see that there was a roundabout path down to where the person lay. She couldn't take the horse. She tied Peanut to a bent scrub tree. Don't go anywhere, she said. She made her way down the path, fighting with the gravel beneath her feet, which twice made her slip. She found the gap to the bottom. She looked up and realized it had been a much farther drop than she'd previously thought. She hurried to where she remembered the person was lying. Sure enough, there were feet, legs, a body, a face, a familiar face. Oh, God, Jack! All that blood on the side of his head. She ran to him. Jack! He didn't respond. Jack! Jack! Still nothing. Sadie put her ear to his chest to detect whether the man with the gray face was still alive. Chapter 44 Jack The disconnection from his physical body was but a snap of the fingers, a pop in the ears, and a radiant glow the likes of which Jack had never known. At first, there was a shiver of cold, but it was brief, like passing through a cold streak in the ocean. Then, bit by bit, things came into focus. The first colors he recognized were gold and white, hued in an intensity that he had never seen before. He looked closer, 
and noticed the colors were the combination of millions of other streaks and shines that he could barely fathom. Something was waiting for him. A being. This being emanated the same glow. Jack realized what that glow was. Love. Full, unconditional, uncompromising love. The being was directing it at him. Where am I? Jack asked. Only the words didn't come from his mouth. It was more like the idea was sent out from him, from his core, and from his every fiber. You are here and not here, Jack, the being said. Again, no movement of the lips, no motion with hands that Jack could see. Just a thought, an idea imparted. It seemed now as natural to Jack as taking a single step with the left foot and following it with the right. Here and not here. A riddle laid out as fact. A riddle Jack didn't feel the need to unfold. A riddle that was now his life. He felt no pain, but instead felt full of life and light. That same love emanating from the being speaking to him, waiting for him. Then Jack looked back from where he'd come. His body, which was lying on the ground and growing cold. That's me, he thought. And then someone else came into view. He knew that person. What was her name? Sadie. She had her head to his chest. For the briefest moment, and in a way that Jack could only describe as being natural, he floated back down to his body and made sure his heart did beat. And then he was back next to the being, whom he realized would be his guide, a familiar face that he couldn't quite place. I know you, Jack said. Then he pointed back down at Sadie. She's coming, the being said. And then the vision of his body and Sadie disappeared. Jack followed his guide higher, farther, deeper into the unimaginable and imaginable. Another golden white spectrum laid out as far as the eye could see. Is this heaven? The being did not answer. It led him farther. That's when Jack first felt the sound and then heard it, like his senses were slowly awakening. The sound was like a gong vibrating for eternity, high and low at the same time. It threw itself around him. It rounded him and embraced him. As they moved along, the vibration never left. The sound never wavered. Who are you? Jack asked. Who do you think I am? The guide answered. Jack would have been annoyed, but in this place, he didn't see a reason to be. In fact, he found he couldn't remember the feeling. Knowing it was not a thing, only the love of understanding and light all around. There had never been and there would never be darkness in this place. Up ahead, there were more beings. And from a distance, Jack thought he recognized them. And yet, like the guide, he couldn't place them. He could feel them and feel their happiness at seeing him. Love radiated and enveloped him, made him feel like this was where he had always belonged. This place, this love, so happy. No, happiness was not an adequate word to use. Joy, grace, love, a multifaceted combination of the three. Unconditional and undying love. For some reason, that made him look back. Then the color parted, and there was Sadie again. Now she was wrestling with tent poles. Why was she so rushed? If only Jack could tell her that he would be okay, that he was fine. But he turned back at the beckoning of his guide, past the other beings. He did know them, though not yet by name. They seemed like friends or family members that he'd known for an eternity, ones he would soon come to know again. Those beings disappeared, though Jack could still feel their lingering love. They went up to a ledge. When Jack looked down, he saw a giant falcon floating there, ready and waiting. His guide bowed over the wing and settled in the middle of the bird's back. 
Jack followed as if it was the most natural thing, like mounting a horse. Off they flew, the wind blowing in his hair, surrounded by the flowing freedom of this place. Fields of every green imaginable splashed below. They shimmered gold, then orange. Bodies of water in blue hues Jack had never seen before, more brilliant, more all-encompassing, more godlike. Someone had ripped the veil of the universe and given Jack a peek inside. Forests of trees as tall and thick as skyscrapers appeared before them. The falcon flew effortlessly, weaving in and out of the maze of behemoths. Here and there, Jack saw more beings. They did not have what Jack would consider a traditional human form. They were more nebulous, and yet Jack knew they had once been living beings. They flitted like children among the trees, looking down at Jack and his guide. They sent their greetings, sent their love. When they cleared the trees, a vast beach spread out beneath. The waves, blue, green, and gold, and sand so brilliantly white that Jack thought it might be the sun. Why am I here? he asked. You'll see, his guide said. Indeed, he saw it all. Beauty, majesty, love all around and above and below. He felt the wonder of childhood, the unbridled curiosity of his youth reborn. He wanted to see everything, experience everything, touch everything. Not yet, Jack, his guide said. There's someone I want you to see. He's been waiting for you. How strange that none of this felt strange. Just be, he thought. Higher they flew now, through brilliant clouds, and down again. The majestic birds surfed on waves of wind. They soared down to the ocean, down through gold mists that sprayed all around them. Again, Jack felt the childlike wonder, a joy, a gift. Then he heard the call again. Jack! Jack! With only a thought, he was there looking down at Sadie, looking down at his form. They were snuggled together in a sleeping bag. Jack felt himself smile. Don't leave me, Jack, Sadie said. He wanted to say that he was there, that he'd been there the whole time. He couldn't. For one last time, he floated down to his body for Sadie, for love, to say goodbye. Psst! Give this author some love by clicking subscribe. Chapter 45 Sadie She rushed to get the tent up. It was a small thing, a one-man pup tent, but that would be fine. Jack's heartbeat was weak, but still there. Darkness was fully upon them now. No way she was going to make it back down the mountain. Besides, she didn't want to take the risk of making his injuries worse. Maybe she would get lucky and someone would pass by. Panic rose, but she worked through it. The tent up, she tossed the sleeping bag in and managed to drag Jack's heavy body inside it. He was cold, so cold. Stay with me, Jack, she said. She didn't know this man, and yet, second by second, she felt like she knew him more. Twenty levels of friendship were behind his trust and survival. Trust meant life. She had to have faith in her skills and her strength. She was not let down. It took hard work, but as she'd learned in some survival television show, she stripped Jack down to his briefs, then did the same. Melding her body heat with his, she warmed his chest, his arms, and his legs. Pure survival. She grabbed his hand. Jack, it's going to be okay. And the hand in hers moved squeezed, and went limp again. Good, that's good, she said. Stay with me, Jack, and I promise I'll get you out of here. And though she had no reason to make such a promise, no earthly idea how she was going to get this man down the mountain, she knew she would use every drop of strength she had left. Darkness fell further. 
in a tiny tent on the side of Lone Mountain, two souls held tight through the cold. Then, for some reason, a song came to Sadie's lips, one she'd half forgotten. It was a lullaby that her mother had sung to get her to sleep. Sadie had always pretended the song did, but when she closed her eyes, she continued listening to her mother's voice. While Linda Crawford could barely carry a tune, the words always went to the center of Sadie's heart, letting her know that everything would be okay. Morning would bring sunshine and happiness. The argument with her father or the test the next week would be a blip on the radar. She, Sadie Crawford, would survive. She thought of those moments now. Through the years, her mother's undying love. Sadie sang of that same love, that same compassion and hope. She couldn't be sure, but she thought she saw Jack's eyes move beneath his closed lids by the dim light of the solar lantern. She sang on, the song warming her on the inside, ending in her lungs, stretching her vocal cords in a way that she'd never felt. She imagined those words wrapping Jack in a veil of healing. Even when the solar lantern went out, Sadie kept singing, kept hoping, and the angels listened. Chapter 46 Jack. Jack! Jack! the voice cried. It was a child's voice, beckoning excitedly. The falcon swooped down, dumping Jack into the waves, and before he could truly get his bearings, he was standing, feet planted in white sands. Where are we? he asked the guide, who was standing calmly in the water by his side. Watch. Jack turned and saw a group of children, some playing in the sand building forts and crude castles. Then there were the athletic ones playing wiffle ball, and among them, young Jack Moses. How old was he? Eleven? Twelve? Still, he was taller than the others. Smile wide, pitching that wiffle ball like he was on the mound at Wrigley Field. With a whoosh and a whistle, the ball went in perfectly. The boy standing over the plate swung, nearly spinning all the way around. Jack's team let out a cheer. Strike three, Jack said. You're out. The teams switched sides. Young Jack picked up a bat and hefted it like it was made of solid maple. He remembered this day now. It was a field trip, even though he lived farther west. The school he had gone to had taken the trip down to Panama City for the beach was a mere two blocks away from his school. But Jack had some vague memory of still wanting to get away, go down to where MTV Spring Break broadcasted live, a siren song for college students from all around the country. Only this wasn't Spring Break, just kids playing in the sand. And yet, there was that question, why did he want to get away? Why are you showing me this? he asked. Watch, the guide said again. First pitch. The younger self whacked the thing hard. He watched it sail for a moment with a hesitant jog toward first. Then, home run. The crowd crowed and chanted his name. Jack! 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 Jack could feel their adoration for the boy. He could feel the happiness his younger self felt carefree and forgetting the rest of life. Here, there was no homework, no tests, no dead mother. Just a white sand beach, the only responsibility being completing a run around the bases. Yes, he did remember. Then, as if someone had placed their hands on his head and turned him, his vision went from the game to the water. There was a boy there, skinny with thick glasses. He was shin deep and looking all around. Jack couldn't see his face, but he knew who the kid was. The teacher hadn't seen the boy wade in knee deep, then waist deep, then up to his chest. One wave after another pounded him from all sides as the force of the water twisted his body. The boy was laughing, having a grand time, the only kid in the water. 
but the flags on the beach were red for a reason. The boy dove under a wave and came up fumbling for his glasses, just managing to snatch them before they went to the bottom, still laughing. Jack remembered his name now, Arnu. It had been a funny name then, a name from another land. It was a name that didn't sit well with the kids in Florida. They made fun of his glasses, poked him in the chest, told him to go back where he came from. Jack stood up for the boy when he could, but in general he kept his distance, lest the stigma of the shunned kid be bestowed upon his head. Arnu, for his turn, was always kind to Jack, bringing desserts from the lunch line when no one was looking. At that age, such transactions were never done in public, not to the pariah. The boy swam a little further before he realized his mistake. The current pulled him hard as another wave slammed him underwater. He tried to call out, but a lung full of water made it impossible. Jack looked around and still the teachers had not seen. The game came into focus again. He saw his younger self flicker toward the ocean. His friends called out, but Jack ignored them. His arms and legs pumping, he ran past the surprised teachers. Arnu's head bobbed to the surface. That's when some of the others pointed. One of them shouted, Riptide's got Frenchy! The teachers were all frozen in place. Some of them looked like they couldn't swim more than a few strokes. Jack could. He learned to swim soon after learning how to walk. He joined the swim team every season. Butterfly, freestyle, breaststroke, it didn't matter. Jack tore off his shirt and dove into the surf. Arnu was getting dragged farther out and under. The boy was engulfed by waves. And now, ethereal Jack was back in his younger body. He wasn't experiencing the thundering heartbeat and cording muscles. All he felt was the panic and drive of his younger self. Jack dove, keenly feeling the tide. It was one of the first lessons his father had ever taught. Don't swim against the tide. Go with it. Swim back slowly, parallel to the shore, and don't let it tire you out. Every time Jack came to the surface, Arno was fighting against the current. By his flails, it was obvious the boy didn't know how to swim well. Jack swam harder, getting closer and closer. Another four strokes and he'd reached the boy. He was close enough now to see the panic in Arno's eyes, the pleading. The boy reached out. Jack swam harder. Then the boy was gone. Jack dove in. He came to the surface for air before diving in again. He did this several times, each time hearing teachers yelling, children screaming, the lifeguards' whistles, and now a siren in the distance. Again and again he went down, pounded by the surf, until finally, impossibly, his hand touched flesh. He wrapped his arm around the skinny frame, and he kicked off the bottom, pulling Arnaud to the surface with him. Jack ignored the rules and swam straight toward shore with all his strength. It was one boy dragging another against the riptide. Nature versus human flesh. Inside his younger self, he felt sadness, reaping despair, and then a surge of adrenaline. He could hear his own thoughts, as surprisingly quiet as they were. Please, he kept saying to himself. Or was he praying? His strength was waning. The shore didn't feel much closer. He wasn't sure, but the body he was holding felt colder. Arnaud hadn't moved. The water was still too deep to stand in. If only he could plant his feet. Another wave crashed down, followed by three more in rapid succession. Jack came up sputtering, having almost let go of the boy. Please, he pleaded again. His eyes were slits of determination. And as if some line had been carved through the tide, the underwater force relented. Jack pushed on, swimming with one arm, kicking with both feet. The lifeguard got to him and lifted Arno in both arms, taking him to the beach. Young Jack watched it all, mouth to mouth, compressions. 
The ambulance arrived and took the graying form away. Jack knew the rest. Young Jack didn't. Young Jack was standing in shock. He'd tried his best, done everything that he could. No one else had, and still, that hadn't been good enough. The teachers came to him. Then Jack of present day floated out from his younger body and watched as the young students were ushered away, leaving the ethereal Jack alone on the beach. Not quite alone, for standing next to him was the boy, Arno, very much an entity like his guide and the other beings he'd seen. The boy had left his physical body. You died, Jack said plainly. I did, Arno replied. He was smiling, staring at Jack. Jack could feel the love radiating in a way that wrapped him in an embrace of otherworldly calm. I'm sorry you died, Jack said. It's okay, you tried, and that's all that matters. Courage springs from hope. But was it okay? If Jack had swum faster, if he had gotten there in time. I should answer the unasked question, Arno said. Yes, this is where I belong. This is where I've always belonged. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for trying. There was nothing Jack could say to the blast of love that came from Arno. Then the boy disappeared. And Jack Moses was back on the Falcon, next to his guide, wondering in awe where they would be going next. Chapter 47 Sadie. Somehow, impossibly, she slept. She slept through nightmares and a deep pain in her limbs that made her feel like she had the flu. Once she woke in the middle of a fit of tossing and turning, afraid that she had somehow hurt Jack. She was shivering, even though it was warm inside the sleeping bag. It's going to be okay, she said, addressing herself as much as the man lying comatose beside her. She stroked hair from his forehead and then planted a kiss on his bearded cheek. It's going to be okay, she said again. Only it wasn't. She felt that familiar sadness, the same overwhelming despair she had felt after the phone call informing her that her mother had died. And then there was the image of her father, looking smug as if to say he told her so. She ran away then, staying with a friend for two days. Her father had found her, dragged her back to the house, and grounded her for a month. He hadn't even let her go to the funeral. Another dent in their disturbed relationship. Resentment had truly set in then, and that resentment fueled her now. She rubbed Jack's arms and legs, trying to will the blood to warm him, and failing to ignore the sense of coming doom. He hadn't moved and was barely breathing. Three times she put her ear to his chest, each time fearing it would be the last time she would hear his heartbeat. She didn't know this man, not really. What she did know of him was that he was a good man. Despite the circumstance, she felt pulled to him. She sung all she could sing. Her prayers felt pitiful, worthless. She closed her eyes and tried again. Perhaps she could decant some of her soul into Jack, this good, strong man. I'm strong too, she said to herself. After all, she cared for him, put up the tent, kept him alive. Only now she felt that this wasn't enough. The time was coming where Jack would need real help. He needed doctors, nurses, a hospital, and the horrid IVs and needles that came along with that. She despised hospitals. Mother had died in a hospital, and thinking that it would bring her some peace, Sadie had visited that very spot, hoping beyond hope that she could come to sense her mother in some way. There'd been another patient in the room, hooked up to oxygen, too many IV tubes to count. Mom, I wish you were here now, she said without hearing that the words had come out spurred through chapped lips. She thought of her mother, those heavenly eyes, 
the way the freckles trickled from her shoulders down her arms, the way she liked to skip down the beach, dragging Sadie alongside her. Help me, Mom. Just then there was a flash of light from outside. Lightning? She remembered a storm was on its way, having checked the weather before leaving. Again, the flash of light, and this time there were voices. We're in here, Sadie said. There was the stomping of boots on gravel and stone. Someone unzipped the tent. A dark face peered inside. He needs help, Sadie said. We need to get him to the hospital. The face didn't say a word. He unzipped the tent all the way, and the figure appeared in full. Not wasting time, the man and female companion, who seemed familiar somehow, helped Sadie put Jack's clothes back on. They worked like they'd done this sort of thing before. In the moment, it didn't seem strange to Sadie that neither person said a word. She was too adrenalized to realize that this was not a normal occurrence. She fastened the headlight lamp to her forehead and led the way, holding Jack's ankles while the other two carried his torso. Down the mountain they went, skirting gullies and dodging rocks. Hang in there, Jack. Hang in there. They came to the first road, one that Sadie had been looking for. Then, the next miracle. There was a sheriff's Ford Explorer idling on the side of the road. She made straight to it. The sheriff's eyes went wide in the night. He's hurt, Sadie said. We need to get him to the hospital. Put him in the back, the sheriff said. He lifted Jack's legs from Sadie and motioned with his chin for her to get in the back. The two helpers nodded as they peeled away, the siren blaring overhead. The sheriff sped a good thirty or forty miles over the speed limit, well in control. I don't know how you found me, the sheriff said, but I was about to head back to the station. It was only later that Sadie would understand that it was too many coincidences to chalk up as luck. But in that moment, she was simply grateful. Maybe, just maybe, Jack would have a chance, and maybe, just maybe, all her efforts would not be in vain. Chapter 48 Jack Images and scenes moved faster now. To human eyes, they might have flown by in a blink, but in his current state, Jack saw and felt every moment, every touch. A sixteen-year-old Jack helping a pregnant mother out of a burning pickup truck. He remembered. It was on a thin stretch of road, somewhere between Seaside and Defuniac Springs. He was on his way to a party and took a shortcut. That shortcut, a road rarely used by normal traffic, was dirt and sand and hard to maneuver. He never made it to the party. Instead, he drove the pregnant woman to the hospital and called his father. Big Jack arrived in a rush. Both were in attendance when a nurse came out to tell them that the woman Jack helped had delivered a healthy baby boy. She'd named him Jack. More scenes in rapid succession, all of Jack helping, always helping, he remembered the moments, but it was like looking at them with new eyes, brighter eyes that could see colors previously missed. His teenage years melted into college, and there was Jack, talking to a friend who had confided in him that life no longer felt like living. They talked until the morning, and then when the college clinic opened, Jack took his friend there. They hugged, and the memory disappeared. More college vignettes. A girl too drunk to walk. A professor harassed by a local. A library janitor collapsing to the floor with a seizure. And the common thread throughout them all was Jack Moses. Why are you showing me this? Jack asked his guide, who felt more and more familiar the further they flew into memory. It's your life, Jack. Jack didn't feel confusion or anger, not in this place. Those two things didn't fit here. Instead, he let the memories fly on and tried to grasp the meaning of it all. 
Chapter 49 Sadie Miss Crawford? Sadie sat up straight, awake at once. The doctor's hand went from her arm to his deep pocket. Sadie's eyes went to Jack. Eyes still closed. Tubes doing the living for him. Did something happen? she asked, reaching out and grasping Jack's cold hand. Does Mr. Moses have any living relatives? I don't know, she answered, rubbing Jack's hand to get some circulation going. Miss Crawford, there are things to discuss. She looked up. That face, she'd seen it before. Pity and determined detachment. He's not going to die. I didn't say that, the doctor said. Then tell me what I can do. The doctor exhaled a sigh that he tried in vain to hide. He looked over at Jack, then at the machines. I'll give you some time with Mr. Moses. I'll be back after making my rounds. Sadie waited for him to leave, and when he did, her eyes misted over. What do you want me to do, Jack? The beeps answered for him. Come back to me, Jack. Please don't die. Chapter 50 Jack Jack heard Sadie's plea. Should I talk to her? Jack asked his escort. Not yet. She's sad. Yes, she is. For some reason, Jack understood that the escort wasn't disturbed by Sadie's sadness. And neither was he. In this place of pure love and understanding, sadness was something of that other place. Jack could barely remember what sadness felt like. I want to stay, Jack said. And he did. He was home finally. Chapter 51 Sadie. The nurse finished her careful examination and tucked in the sheets around Jack. Can I get you anything? she asked Sadie. I can have food delivered. There's a decent sushi place down the road. I'm not hungry, but thanks. The nurse smiled warmly. She'd seen this a thousand times. No lectures. I'll bring more water. Press the button if you change your mind. Thanks, Sadie said, her mind a jumble of thoughts and emotion. There was no one to call. How ironic that she and Jack had come together as the last living relics of their respective families. Her father didn't count. The knock at the door snatched her from her reverie. An older gentleman was standing in the doorway, a hat tucked under his arm. Hello, Sadie, the man said. Sorry, do I know you? The man didn't answer, but he walked to the opposite side of the bed and laid a hand on Jack's arm. He's a good man, but I'm sure you know that. He was facing her, and there was something in his eyes, something shining and exquisite. We just met, Sadie said, pulled in by the magnetism of the old man. Who are you? Again, he didn't answer her question, like he hadn't even heard it. Heroes have it the worst sometimes. They're so tough to the world, so hardened. But when it's time to connect, they don't have the words. I don't think they know how to show the right emotions. It's as if the gods are jealous of their courage and make their lives difficult that way. What is he talking about? How do you know Jack? I've known him for a long time. Are you family? You might say that. Sadie's heart leapt. Then you can help. The old man smiled. I came for you. Me? He nodded, still smiling. Do you love him? I just met him, she said, unnerved. Now one of the corners of his mouth quirked like he'd gotten the joke. What does that have to do with love? Within those words, she knew that he knew. 
that he had experienced the very thing to which he was alluding. Who are you? Sadie asked, wonder overwhelming her sadness. Just a friend. The old man patted Jack one more time, and it looked like he was speaking to the unconscious man in silence. He smiled at Sadie and said, Never forget that love above all things grounds us in life, brings what we need most, Sadie. Never forget. Then he left Sadie before she could recover her voice enough to ask him the slew of questions she no doubt had for him. But there was something else he'd left behind, and for the first time since bringing Jack to the hospital, she felt it. Hope. Psst! If you're enjoying this story and want to support more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 52 Jack Light filled his being, memories fed his love. It's time, Jack. Jack turned from the shimmering ocean scene and looked at his escort. More memories? No. And for the first time in this place, Jack felt something akin to sadness. You want me to go back? I thought I was here to stay. His escort's body pulsed with what Jack knew was pure love, and that light enveloped them both. There's time for here, Jack, but now is your time for there. There's still a job to do? The love light pulsed brighter. Many jobs to do. Will I see you again? The love light powered so high that Jack could barely make out his escort's form. We'll always be with you, Jack. All you have to do is ask. And then, to Jack's amazement, the love light went through him, and he knew that every soul in this place was touching him in their way. He felt them and loved them the same. There was no other way to explain it. The last words he heard were from his escort, resounding in his ears. Tell her I love her. And then, with a snap, Jack Moses was sucked away from it all. Chapter 53 Sadie She woke to someone stroking her hair. Her eyes fluttered open, and her head raised from the hospital bed, where she'd fallen asleep holding Jack's hand. Only his hand wasn't there anymore. Sadie jolted up. There was Jack, eyes open, looking at her, smiling. Her first instinct was to call the nurse to wake up something. She reached for the call button, but Jack held her hand first. Not yet he said, his voice low and hoarse. Jack! She was barely able to choke out the name. And then her arms were around him and his around her. It's okay, he whispered into her ear. It's going to be okay. And the joy that enveloped her coalesced into the sharpest point of gratitude she'd ever experienced. Chapter 54 Jack The doctor was amazed. When can we leave? Jack asked. Well, there are tests to confirm that this is... It's real, Doc. I promise. And it was. Though the time he had experienced was fading, he still remembered what it felt like. And he never wanted it to end, though he knew intuitively that eventually it would diminish. The nurse responded when the doctor stood mute. We'll get new scans, update your blood work, and then we'll see. Isn't that right, doctor? All the doctor could do was nod, and then he left the room, presumably to regain his composure. You'll have to excuse him. He's never seen a miracle. The nurse gave them a wink. I'll see what I can do to expedite the tests, okay? Jack nodded, turning to Sadie who was staring at him again. What? I can't believe you're here, she said, her eyes glistening. I was always here. I know, but you're okay, aren't you? 
You're asking if this is some sort of temporary healing? Maybe. It's just that... Jack grinned. You're not getting rid of me that easy, Sadie. Not now. I can't believe it. Wait until I tell you the rest of the story. But the story was interrupted by two familiar forms, Olivia Northcutt and Daniel Briggs. Olivia looked somewhat uncomfortable and on the verge of tears. Briggs, on the other hand, was smiling and at ease. I'm so happy that you're feeling better, Olivia said. And that's when it hit Jack. Those last words. He was your husband, wasn't he? Olivia looked surprised. What do you mean? You'll probably think I'm crazy, but I promise I'm not. There was a man, a good man. He helped me. He showed me, well, a lot of stuff. But his last words before I came back were to tell you that he loves you. Tears streamed down Olivia's face now. You saw him? No hints of incredulity in her tone. The pieces came together. That's when the final memory picture arose before him. Chapter 55 Marine Captain Jack Moses, Afghanistan, ten years earlier. He sipped water from his canteen, wishing it tasted more like fresh-squeezed Florida orange juice and less like fresh-squeezed dish sponge. I'll take over the radio, Skipper, the radio operator said from his sleeping bag. I'm awake, Captain Moses said. Go back to sleep. The Marine Corporal did not argue. You never argued when anyone in the chain of command told you to go back to sleep. It was his company's last week in country. They had the cake duty of keeping tabs on a rear supply depot. No action back here, and that suited Captain Moses fine. He had lost four Marines in the past six months, two to enemy fire and two to vehicle accidents. The first two he understood. The last two he'd questioned for years. The crisp night made him want to take a walk. He strapped on his trusty radio and hooked the receiver to the front of his web gear. Captain Moses checked in with his Marines, most of whom were sleeping. The others nodded to him as he passed. They'd been through fire together. Most times, words weren't needed. He'd missed them. It was one of the military's cruel jokes. You spent months and years training, sweating, and sometimes bleeding with your men, and then they were taken away, ripped from your hands. Captain Moses tried not to think on it. Not now. He cheered himself by thinking about going home. Back to Florida. Back to a beer on the beach with friends. Back to shrimp in a basket. And not a care in the world. A sound near the fence line caught his attention. Human form. Maybe another sentry from the supply depot. Jack walked that way wishing he had a cigarette. He'd picked up the habit on his last combat tour and reserved it for the field and for when he was in country. If he was going to be a respectable steward of his father's company, he'd have to give that up. Who goes there? Jack asked the form. The person didn't answer, just kept moving. Damn it. He figured it was either one of his Marines sneaking liquor or one of the supply guys making a midnight rendezvous with a local. Jack wanted no peace of either, but he was a Marine Company commander. No stone would be left unturned. Then, to his amazement, the figure disappeared. What the hell? He switched on a flashlight and swept it back and forth. On the third sweep, he saw it, a crack in the fence line. The colonel would have someone's ass about that. He crept closer and thought about radioing to the officer of the day. No, he knew the guy on duty. Not a bad guy, but a guy who'd have a hundred questions. Questions Captain Moses would not have answers for yet. Best to see what he could find and maybe deal with it without sending up the red flare. He pulled at the edge of the opening, surprised at how easily it came apart. This was a definite problem. Again, duty whispered, but Jack ignored it. Where was the Marine going? It didn't take long to find out. 
Not twenty feet outside the wire, Jack found him sitting cross-legged, facing what Jack now realized was the coming sunrise. What was this, some kind of prayer? Marine? Jack asked, stepping closer. You should go back inside, Captain. The voice was vaguely familiar. One of his Marines for sure, but probably one of the younger enlisted men. I'm not going back without you. Closer now. One hand on his sidearm. The Marine turned, and Jack could make out his face. Northcutt, Jack said, remembering the private first class. Smart, capable, but couldn't seem to stay out of trouble. No less than three trips to see the first sergeant. Please, Captain. Jack moved around and saw the pistol in Northcutt's lap. What are you doing, Marine? Sir, I've had enough. There were several courses of action Captain Jack Moses could take. One, demand the weapon and force Northcutt, at gunpoint if need be, back inside the fence line. Two, radio for backup. Three, get creative. Jack chose the last option. He sat down in front of Northcutt, noting the sadness in the younger man's eyes. Let's talk about it, he said. No offense, sir, but there's nothing to talk about. Is that so? Northcutt nodded. I'm done. But we're going home. Don't you want to go home, Northcutt? No, sir, I don't. Why not? Jack kept his eye on the pistol, his body tense enough should he have to tackle the Marine. Northcutt stabbed a finger into his temple. I can't get it right, sir. Nothing. I've tried. Tell me what you've tried. Everything. To connect. To be a good Marine. Everything you and the first sergeant told me to do. But it's like... It's like I'm not wired to do it. I can't explain it. You're doing just fine, Jack said, trying to find his own way to explain. What did you do before enlisting? I was into computers. Why did you become a Marine? I thought it was my duty. I'm glad you didn't say the recruiter lied to you, Jack said, trying in vain to add some levity to the situation. He didn't lie to me, sir. I scored high. I could have taken another MOS, but I figured that I should do real Marine stuff. Moses understood. Everyone assumed that because of his size, that he'd be infantry. In fact, Jack Moses held the highest scores of anyone in his basic school class and could have chosen any military occupational specialty he desired. Well, you did the hard stuff. We all did. Northcutt shook his head. I didn't do enough. I couldn't. I tried. He was gripping the pistol tight now. It shook in his hand. Give me the weapon, Jack said softly, but not without the polished steel tone of command in his voice. I can't. Yes, you can. Northcutt's body began to tremble. The Marine wept. I lost my dad, Jack said. Northcutt composed himself. I'm sorry, sir. You still have your dad? No, sir. Mom? The private shook his head. I figured, said Jack. I'm alone, too. He let that soak in. Do you miss them? Northcutt asked. Every day. I never knew my parents. Jack had come to find that the Marine Corps was a fine collection of orphans. I'll bet they loved you very much. Northcutt shrugged. I'm sorry about this, Captain. It's not your fault, Jack said, and he meant it. He knew with every atom in his body that what he said next would either kill or save this young man in his charge. The easy way out was to shackle him and send him to head shrinks. That was not Jack's way. It never had been. Taking a thoughtful breath, Jack stroked his chin. Northcutt, why do you think we're here? Not here in Afghanistan, but on Earth. No idea, sir. I can't say that I know all of it either, but my dad used to tell me that we're on this planet to help God's children. 
Do you believe that? Maybe, Northcutt answered. I thought it was religious mumbo-jumbo whenever my dad said it. I guess you could say I'm a natural-born skeptic. But life has a way of teaching you lessons that were already there to be learned. I was the same as you. I became a Marine to serve my country, to do the right thing. But the more I do this, the more I realize it's all about what my dad said, taking care of God's children. If I do the right thing, if I make sure my Marines have chow, have the best training, then I ensure that they have the best chance of survival. But you know where I think we fail? Where? I think we do a crappy job of sending Marines back out into the world. Sure, we say we give them benefits when needed, help when asked, but we should be doing more. Like what? I don't know. But maybe you could be the one to figure it out. You can figure out how to help Marines like you who are having the same problem. Because I can promise you that you are not the only one. I'm getting out of the Corps in six months, and I have no idea what in hell I'm going to do. Northcutt lifted his head. He seemed to be thinking, and that was good. How do you think I can help, Captain? Well, first, I'm going to help you. Whatever help you need, I'm going to get it for you. If you need someone to talk to, I'll be there. That's a promise. Second, once you get your stuff figured out, I want you to use that brain of yours to figure out how to help others. You think you can do that? Maybe. I'll need more than a maybe, Northcutt. This is a mission, a real purpose in life. Sure. I mean, yes, sir, I can do that. Good. And Northcutt? Sir? Don't forget that you're never alone. Ever. Chapter 56 Jack The memory blazed before him, a conversation long forgotten, with a name buried beneath a mothballed uniform and all the tonnage in its fibers. He never forgot that, Jack, said Olivia. You got him help. He got better. He ended up in Montana, and that's how we met. The magic of this place brought us together. I'm not ashamed to say it like that. That's the only way I can describe it. An overwhelming sense of gratitude filled Jack. Then it hit him. He died, didn't he? He did, but not before building a fortune. Can you guess the rest? Do you have a picture of him? He remembered the scene, but couldn't put a face to it. Private First Class Northcutt. Olivia nodded and pulled out her phone. She scrolled and then showed Jack the picture. This is Brendan. The man in the photo, an older version of Northcutt, was a figure familiar to Jack Moses. It was the man who had escorted him through the hereafter. Chapter 57 Sadie the hospital finished testing and gave Jack the approval to be discharged. Olivia was back at Lone Peak Ranch, but Daniel Briggs had been a near-constant companion to them both in the 24 hours it took to complete the poking and prodding. Once, when the head nurse had wheeled Jack to his last scan, Sadie asked Daniel why he had stayed. It's my business to be where the miracles are, he said. What was it about this strange and serene man that dissuaded questioning such an outlandish comment? Sadie didn't know. Jack was in the bathroom putting on a set of clothes Daniel had brought from the ranch. The nurse went over final instructions with Sadie when she remembered to ask her the one unanswered question that remained. There was an older gentleman who visited. Is it possible to find out who he was? I'd like to say thank you. Older gentleman? Sadie described the man right down to his smile. I'll check the visitor logs, but I'm pretty sure you, Mr. Briggs, and Mrs. Northcutt were the only visitors. That's impossible. Would you mind checking? She did, and she confirmed that no other visitors logged in at the nurse's station. Is there no way he could have sneaked in? The nurse cocked an eyebrow. These days? 
Sadie left it at that, hoping that the nurse who'd been so helpful didn't think she was crazy. Chapter 58 Jack The relief at seeing Lone Peak Ranch nearly overwhelmed him. Jack squeezed Sadie's hand as they sat in the back of the Escalade driven by Buster. Daniel Briggs was in the passenger seat. Olivia was waiting when they arrived. Buster and Daniel disappeared with Jack and Sadie's things. I know you're probably exhausted, Jack, but I was hoping you could spare me a few minutes. Actually, I'm pretty sure I feel the exact opposite of exhausted. Do you mind if Sadie comes? Not at all. They went to Olivia's office. It was pristine again. There was a leather folder sitting on the desk. They took seats. I'll get right to it, Jack. Brendan left me as temporary custodian of his estate. This document, she opened the leather folder, gives the entire foundation to you to run Lone Peak Ranch as you see fit. For some reason, the declaration did not in any way startle Jack. He'd experienced too much in the past few days to question the unexpected. What about you? I've got my own retirement plan, thanks to Brendan. No, I mean, will you still work here? Jack thought he saw a hint of hesitation in Olivia's eyes. That's up to you, Jack. I don't need a job, but I'd be honored to stay and help. A more important question came to mind. Could I ask how you and Brendan met? You mentioned the magic here. Olivia chuckled. Of course. I'd come to Big Sky with some girlfriends. I was on the high path, destined to slog my way up the corporate ladder. I didn't have time for myself, much less a boyfriend. I got so many emails one day that I left my computer and phone behind and started walking. Sunset was coming, so I found a place to sit and enjoy the view. My brain was working through how to respond to the emails, and I was absentmindedly throwing rocks down the slope in front of me. I'm deep in thought when I hear, Ow! I hadn't seen Brendan sitting down there, and one of my rocks hit him in the back. I apologized. He swept me off my feet, and the rest is history. Jack looked at Sadie. Doesn't sound so crazy now, does it? Sadie shook her head and kissed his hand. So, Jack said, What do you think? Should we do it? We? Sadie asked. Of course. I don't want to do this without you. Not a single day. She gave his hand a squeeze. Let's do it. The paperwork was signed and there were smiles all around the room. Olivia suggested next steps and Jack was already putting plans through his head. Pedro could, of course, run the business in Florida, or maybe with his new resources, Pedro and his entire family could come to Montana. That thought truly excited Jack. They were getting up from their seats when Buster and Daniel reappeared. Buster had a worn, encyclopedia-thick journal in his hands. Daniel was smiling like a man who knew the punchline before anyone else. They knew you were coming, Jack, Buster said. They told me all about you when I was a kid, but I didn't believe it. Not really. Not even when I met you. But when you got hurt, when you got better... Daniel put a reassuring hand on the older man's shoulder. I knew it was you. And this, he held out the journal. This is for you. Jack read the handwritten inscription on the cover. Ricky and Betsy Lovejoy. My parents, Buster said his eyes moist. That's their story, how they met, how they lived, the magic of it all. Jack brought the journal to his chest and extended his hand. Thank you, Buster. I can't wait to read it. Buster shook his hand and smiled. Sadie reached over and for some reason flipped to the last pages of the journal. There was a picture of the couple well into their retirement years and smiling like teenagers. Sadie's eyes went wide. That's him. That's the man that came to the hospital. Daniel looked at Sadie. See? Miracles. Then he winked and followed Buster out.
Jack flipped the journal to the beginning and saw a weathered picture of a Marine in a World War II-era uniform and a pretty young woman at his side. Both were smiling, obviously happy and in love. Did you know about this? Jack asked Olivia. I did not. Let me guess. It's the magic of the place? Olivia shrugged and gave an innocent smile, like maybe they should get used to such a thing. I forgot to mention, there's a catch, Jack. What's that? Brendan was very specific. He believed in the power of helping one man or woman at a time, that the energy expended, the love given, would be multiplied a millionfold after that. You're saying we can only help one person at a time, instead of opening Lone Peak up to the masses? Yes. Jack looked at Sadie. Interesting, no? I'd say so. And you're sure you want to help? Sadie kissed him on the lips this time, their first real kiss. I wouldn't miss it, Jack Moses. Wouldn't miss one bit. Sadie turned to Olivia. Where do we start? Olivia directed her answer to Jack. That's up to Jack. You were the first. Who will be the second? It was an important question. The thought of changing lives ignited something powerful inside him. There are so many who need help, he said, feeling a restless urge to come up with a name on the spot. I'll need time to think about it. Olivia's face brightened. Of course. He looked out the window. His gaze fell upon the trees and the dapples of sunlight raining down through them. He felt as though he'd seen it before. He turned back to Olivia. There's a lot of talk about magic here. I think I know what it's all about. She smiled as if anticipating what he was about to say. The difference between magic and a miracle is that no one ever hopes for magic. It's like the whipped cream on a Sunday. If you get it, you're grateful for it. But the Sunday itself is what you really wanted. I would say the magic of Lone Peak is in the ground itself, and it fed those trees, which then made it into the wood of this lodge. It's in the walls now. He paused to allow himself one more thought, and then continued. The magic is transformation itself. Epilogue Betsy and Ricky, 1945 They sat and waited, hand in hand, intertwined like life itself. When the sun splayed its evening glow around them, he turned his head and kissed her. What was that for? she asked, though she didn't move. Not an inch. You know. She sat up now and looked at him. Do I? Her eyes were sparkling, those eyes that he'd dreamed up while the devil himself threw all manner of evil at him and his brothers. Promise me something. Oh, now you want promises. But she was stroking his hand on top of the jagged scar that had been his final gift from the Japanese. I do. He pulled her close so that they were touching nose to nose. She twitched hers, and he twitched his back. They both laughed, but still sat touching. Okay, Staff Sergeant Lovejoy, what's this promise that took me from my comfortable nestle? He rehearsed the words a thousand times, and still his tongue felt like a beanbag. Be with me. I am with you. He shook his head. This is how it went, and he loved her for it. I mean, be with me forever. Betsy put a fingertip to her lips and turned toward the sunset. Now, let me see. When I imagined this moment, it was nothing like this. You, for example, had a ring. Ricky pulled a ring from his pocket. It was a simple thing, but the diamond sparkled. Betsy's eyes went moist. And in my dreams, you got down on one knee. He got down on one knee. You looked up at me. He helped her to her feet. And you told me how much you loved me. 
He looked up at her as the late sun haloed around her head. Betsy Karamati, I love you more than the whole world. More than every blessing I've ever been given. Because all of that led me here. To you. To us. That'll do, she said, trying to sound silly, but her words were faltering, and she was weeping openly now. And the next thing you said was, Will you marry me? This time there was no funny reply, just a nod. And he put the ring on her finger, and he stood with her as the sun shined pink and gold, and the world was all around them, inside and out. And time stopped and love was there. After a time, shadows lengthened, then disappeared, and there was a sweet scent on the air that came down from the rocks. He looked at her and smiled. I just had a thought. Do you know what the difference is between magic and a miracle? 